check this. And welcome to the live broadcast of the 44th Onok Annual General Assembly in Nandi, Fiji. The General Assembly brings together leaders from our member National Olympic Committees, associate members, partners and stakeholders. 
the Assembly continues to ensure that athletes remain at the heart of the Olympic movement in Oceania and that sport and physical activity are promoted in our continent. The week began with the Step Up Oceania Conference 2.0 and a one-day masterclass under ONOC's Home Games Advantage project for the Brisbane 2032 Games. The Paris 2024 Oceania Chefs de Mission Workshop revealing NOC plans towards the Paris Games in July. A power networking forum featuring program partners and vendors and meetings of various ONOC commissions. An Olympic Solidarity Workshop followed by an ONOC Finance Workshop for the NOC membership and a series of side meetings convened by other ONOC stakeholders. As with every assembly, this year's agenda will discuss the culmination of ONOC's work in the region across the 17 National Olympic Committees and its seven associate members. The assembly also sees the presentation of reports from the various ONOC commissions, ANOC commissions, and IOC members, as well as its stakeholders and partners, including an address by the President of the International Paralympic Committee, Mr. Andrew Parsons. The main feature of this year's ONOC Assembly is the attendance of the President of the International Olympic Committee, Mr. Thomas Bach. President Bach will also present a number of recognition and acknowledgement awards, including the ONOC Merit Awards for 2024. Vinaka, and thank you for joining our live broadcast. Bula Vinaka, and good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the annual General Assembly being held here in Nandi, and it's a pleasure for us to be together again, uh, and more so in the, in the presence of our IOC President, uh, Thomas Bach, and the IPC President, Andrew Parsons, uh, and can I also welcome all of the IOC staff from Lausanne, uh, as well as uh, James McLeod, the uh, head of uh, Olympic Solidarity. So James, if you haven't seen him before, he's the guy sitting next to John Coates. <laughs> so if you have any questions on solidarity or questioning why he hasn't sent your money, that's a guy. No. <laughs> uh, before proceeding with the agenda, I'll just pass the floor to, to Rick Blass for some announcements, and then we'll continue with the agenda. Uh, thank you, President Mitchell. Can we uh, start with uh, Melly and have our uh, opening with our morning prayer? Thank you, Rick. Can we please bow our head in prayer? Abba Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the six days that we went through Thank you for travel mercies. Thank you for solidarity and unity, Father. Thank you for all these values that come from you and you alone. We commit this time unto you. As always, we ask for your presence to begin the meeting with us, be in the midst of the discussions, and of course, to end the annual General Assembly with us. Pray for our chair who will be coordinating the meeting, Dr. Robin Mitchell. Pray for the various speakers, uh, who will be presenting on 2023, the year that was, and of course, um, plans for 2024, and uh, any other discussions, Father, that will continue to impact the people that the discussions will surround our athletes. Commit this time unto you, this meeting unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Um, at this time, um, I'd like to take this moment and, uh, in honor of a very close friend and also the first Pacific Islander to be awarded a recognition as an IOC member who about a week ago, no, two weeks ago, uh, left us. And that's Mr. Sayuli Woolwork from Samoa. And I would like, like to take this time um, to honor him 
and ask the, uh, all the members to please stand up in a moment of silence. And also my apologies and for those that also have uh, left us and as you saw they're listed. Um, I first met Sayuli back in 1989 as my first role as uh, SG for Guam and uh, it's been quite a, uh, a big influence in at least in my career with sports but more importantly uh, in a way that affected many of the sports leaders uh, role in who we are today. Um, and it was quite a, a gentle person and always uh, a good uh, individual to talk to and give advice and one of the best uh, weightlifters in Oceania. So uh, I did attempt to, on behalf of Onak to attend his services last week, but as you can still hear from my voice, I. Um, my health was not uh, that good to travel, so. Um, they did have the services, and we did send, uh, uh, ordered a, a wreath representing Onak, and uh, I have still yet to hear back from his son, Jerry, so thank you again. A um, few housekeeping, please. If you take to the mic, uh, we ask that you identify yourself, uh, your name, and be mindful that uh, the session is being recorded and also for the sake of the um, translators and, and uh, hands, uh, hand signs. And uh, also, we are live on, uh, um, on YouTube and uh, I believe the Olympic channel. So again, just be, speak slow name, identify yourself, and, uh, and please also take time to put your phone on silent mode. If you have to speak with your colleagues, I ask that you please take it outside. All right, um, that'll be it, President. Thanks very much, Rick. Before uh, going to agenda item four, I'd like to just recognize the various groups that are here attending the General Assembly. Uh, I mentioned earlier President Bach and the entourage from Lausanne that are here. Uh, IPC President Andrew Parsons and members of the IPC and OPC. Um, the Association of National Olympic Committee Secretary General Gunilla Lindbergh. The 17 NOCs and seven uh, three of the seven associate members uh, of ONOC that are here present. Um, recognizing Paul Bird, Paul Bird from the Oceania Paralympic Committee and his uh, members. Pacific Games Council, Vidya Lakan and Andrew Minogue. The Organization of Sports Federations of Oceania. Former President Kevin Gosper, who retired a couple of days ago. <coughs> and. Uh, his successor, Yvonne Mullins. The Commonwealth Games Federation uh, representatives, the Vice President and Chair of the CGF Pacific, Craig and Hugh Graham. The Australia, Oceania Australia Foundation, chaired by Kevin. Our step-up partners, uh, almost 170 of them uh, from the different uh, groups that have helped us since this was set up in Brisbane last year. Representatives from Paris 2024 who have been preparing our NOCs 
uh, for uh, Paris. Our colleagues from Devon Le Bel, the Pacific home in France in the lead up to the games. So welcome all of you. And it's my pleasure to hand the floor over to the president of the IOC to, to address you. The Olympic friends, uh, Bula, and uh, all protocol observed. Uh, this is what I like so much when being here. Uh, among uh, you, our great friends uh, from uh, Oceania, uh, showing once more uh, your great uh, commitment and your leadership uh, in the Olympic uh, uh, movement. So uh, this uh, makes uh, all my visits here and uh, there are quite a few, please don't tell the other continental associations how often I've been here, uh, because this would uh, put me in uh, some uh, trouble. But uh, it, it is uh, really indeed uh, always uh, a, a great, great uh, pleasure being in uh, your region and uh, being uh, with you and feeling your uh, dynamism and uh, feeling uh, your uh, joy of uh, sport and of life, what always uh, belongs uh, together. Thank you uh, to uh, my dear friend, uh, this uh, again a very emotional and uh, meaningful uh, welcome uh, uh, ceremony, uh, which uh, is always uh, reminding us of, uh, of uh, our roots, and uh, that uh, we are not uh, the first and only generations, but that there have been many, many uh, before us and whose uh, tradition and whose uh, culture, uh, on whose uh, uh, knowledge and experience uh, we can uh, count. You all know that uh, uh, Robin is a, is a very good friend, and uh, I also know that he is a very good uh, uh, president uh, uh, for you at ONOC, uh, but also in ANOC, uh, and playing uh, an extremely important role in the IOC uh, executive uh, uh, board. But you may not know uh, how protective uh, he is uh, of you, uh, because uh, you know uh, last night. Uh, uh, he uh, absolutely wanted to convince me to uh, drink uh, all the kava myself. And uh, the only reason was that he wanted to save you from my speech uh, this morning. Uh, but uh, sorry for you, uh, you can see uh, for once I managed to convince him of something. And uh, so uh, James uh, took uh, the kava this uh, will make James much more generous when you speak with him about <laughs> Olympic solidarity then. You can uh, be uh, extremely proud there of uh, the week you have behind us and all uh, what you have achieved in uh, uh, general. When I'm uh, uh, looking at uh, your program for the last uh, six days since uh, the 21st, uh, this is uh, a really a uh, a role model for uh, how a continental association can and, and should uh, work. And it's just the continuation uh, there of uh, your commitment to strengthen the role of uh, sport, to strengthen uh, the role of uh, the Olympic uh, uh, values in uh, your societies and in uh, uh, the region. And uh, there I would like to congratulate uh, all of you and each and everybody of uh, you for following uh, this uh, path which uh, has been uh, started uh, by uh, our uh, dear friend uh, uh, Kevin Gosper and uh, which also have uh, always been uh, supported by uh, the, the first uh, IOC vice president and another confirmation for the important role Oceania plays in the Olympic movement, uh, 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 John Coates. And I see Ian here, you know, 
uh, obviously following uh, in the same in the same path, and also after the uh, step up conference uh, you had there uh, this uh, week. By uh, promoting the role of uh, sport in uh, society, you can always uh, count uh, the IOC as being a partner uh, on your side. You know uh, this uh, uh, very well, because uh, this is, if you want to sum up uh, the reasons and uh, the, the raison d'etre, I may say, for uh, the Olympic agenda and for the Olympic agenda 2020 plus five, it is to strengthen the role of sport in society, to strengthen the relevance of uh, 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 sport in uh, uh, society. And uh, there, again, uh, with your uh, uh, forum on uh, Oceania sp sport and uh, the uh, SDGs, uh, you are uh, leading uh, by example. Because if you want to stay relevant in a society, we have uh, to make it clear so to society that we are contributing to society, that we are contributing to the goals of uh, society, and that we are not just benefiting uh, from uh, their interest in sport, that we are not just uh, uh, benefiting uh, uh, from uh, their need for entertainment, uh, for uh, physical uh, activity. Every success we have in life on every level, whether it's personal or in an organization or, or a professional. Every success brings also a responsibility with it. And this is our responsibility. We are enjoying a great, great support from society. And this is why we have to give back to uh, uh, society, why we have to be in partnership with uh, society, while we have to be aligned with the values of uh, society, with the goals of uh, society. And this is why at the same time we have to lead in our movement. We have to lead in and through uh, sports. We have uh, not just to, to, to copy what uh, society does and uh, what where they want to go. We have uh, to show that we in sport have uh, our own tools, have our own goals, have our own ways how we can contribute to the overall good of uh, society. And this is why we always have to be ahead of the curve. This is, you know, what uh, we mean when we are saying change or be changed. If we are not ahead of the curve, if we do not change uh, in time, then society will change us according to their interests. And this will not necessarily be always our interests and our goals and our ways. It may even be in a good intention to reach the same goal. But uh, it will not be the same way and it will not uh, be in the same intensity. It will not give to sport the relevance we uh, need to grow and not only to grow, to maintain the relevance uh, we are in, in enjoying. And uh, there, uh, the role of uh, sport as an important enabler of uh, the SDGs is a uh, key. I think we are the only area there which uh, is such an important enabler for so many of uh, the SDGs. There are other areas of, uh, of our society, whether it's business, whether it's uh, culture, whether, but sport is contributing to uh, almost all of uh, the uh, the, the SDGs. We start, uh, you know, with uh, the most, let's say, close one. When you think of health, you also think of of physical activity and sport. But it goes uh, over uh, 
uh, then uh, peace, uh, gender uh, equality, uh, better living, well-being, you, you, you name it. And there we can be uh, uh, very happy, you know, that in the meantime, this uh, role of uh, sport is widely recognized uh, by all the actors uh, who are promoting the, the SDGs and in particular uh, by the, the main actors. This does not uh, fall from heaven. I still remember the first uh, negotiations uh, we had uh, with the UN, uh, the two UN rapporteurs uh, who were uh, putting together the, the SDGs. And I mentioned this uh, because uh, one of the negotiations happened here in Fiji uh, when uh, Fiji uh, was uh, presiding over the group of 77 in the United Nations General Assembly. And we had before some uh, negotiations uh, with the Secretary General, with many others, and said, listen, sport must play a role. Sport is not a goal, they said. What, what, what can we do? And I spare you all the details, but it took about a year, uh, and then, you know, sport was recognized as uh, what it really is, the important enabler to achieve so many of uh, the, the SDGs, and now we're enjoying uh, partnerships with uh, all of uh, these uh, UN uh, agencies, which at the time were, you know, pretty reluctant to take us uh, seriously. This is about uh, UN Habitat, UN Women. Uh, this is about uh, UNHCR, the, uh, the refugee uh, agency. This is uh, with the World Health uh, uh, Organization. This is uh, with the UN Organization Against uh, Organized uh, uh, Crime and, uh, and uh, Drugs. And I could continue this list. Uh, with all of them, we have uh, MOUs, and all of them are in the meantime looking for uh, our uh, partnership uh, to help to realize these uh, SDGs. And there again, there uh, Onok and uh, all of you are playing an important and extremely important role. Uh, uh, for uh, promoting this, uh, for helping and for assisting. And I, I must admit, uh, always uh, also uh, giving us uh, arguments vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, these agencies, uh, because when we can say, look, uh, what is happening uh, in uh, Oceania? What is happening there against the climate change? How is uh, sport contributing uh, uh, to uh, this uh, fight? which we need uh, to, to fight together with uh, all of uh, uh, society. Look at uh, what is happening in Oceania when it comes to safe uh, sport, uh, for instance, uh, where uh, uh, you're uh, one of the role models uh, now, one of uh, the best uh, practices uh, for the uh, efforts of a world sport coordinated by uh, the IOC to establish uh, different uh, hubs of excellence for uh, uh, safe uh, sport, and there uh, you were uh, one of just uh, three uh, worldwide leading the way. And I would like uh, to uh, thank there uh, Robin Mitchell uh, and all the team at uh, ONOC again uh, for this uh, uh, great uh, leadership uh, in the, this uh, so important topic, uh, safe sport because I do not exaggerate when I say, you know, if we cannot make sport safe, sport will not survive. And organized sport will not survive. If we cannot uh, have the confidence of uh, the parents that they can send their kids uh, to, to, to sport, because sport is a safe environment and in sport, uh, they are getting familiar uh, with uh, so many of the social values they will need in, 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 in their lives. 
if we are losing this uh, confidence that the parents will not send them in. Uh, so uh, safe uh, sport is uh, uh, really key uh, for uh, the, the future of uh, uh, sport. And again, congratulations and uh, thank you uh, there uh, to, uh, uh, to, to all of you. But uh, if uh, we want to be credible in all these uh, uh, efforts, uh, then you know we must be uh, credible all across our activities. If we want to enjoy our autonomy, if we want to grow our relevance in society and not just being absorbed by society, uh, then we need to be credible. And this means uh, we have uh, as an essential factor, uh, we have to respect uh, good governance. And there again, ONOC is a leader among uh, the, the NOCs is an, and is a leader, or not to say the leader, among the, the continental uh, uh, associations. And the way uh, you're performing uh, uh, there with uh, regard uh, to uh, good governance and the, the latest, uh, uh, there are also efforts uh, adjusting uh, to uh, the latest and the highest standards of uh, IFRS. Uh, that's uh, the way to go. And uh, that uh, they're the chief accountant is, by the way, also a very excellent driver. So not only uh, saving your finances, but also saving uh, my health in, in the car is uh, really an impressive uh, experience. And this goes uh, uh, further. Uh, there are many examples uh, what uh, good governance uh, uh, means. You know, there are uh, gender equality is uh, an essential uh, factor and uh, many more. But uh, allow me just to, to highlight uh, two, uh, maybe, in this uh, respect. And uh, this is, uh, you know, that we cannot uh, only apply good governance in a continental association or uh, in an NOC. We have to apply it down to the roots. And this includes, uh, in particular, also uh, uh, your uh, uh, national uh, federations, where you have uh, to, to, to have an eye on it and where you have to follow up because uh, if uh, your uh, national uh, federations do not follow the same path, uh, one day, sooner or later, it will also affect you as uh, uh, the NOC, and uh, if it affects an NOC, it also affects uh, ONOC because we are always, we are always judged uh, about our weakest links. Nobody is taking care if everybody and uh, uh, paying attention if everything is going well. But if something is going wrong in one of our member uh, organizations, that affects us all and the general public does not make you know, this uh, a difference between a national member federation, between an organizing uh, a committee of any sport event and an NOC or a continental uh, association or other international federations or, uh, the, uh, or the IOC. The general public all puts you know, in the same box and uh, there you see these guys in sport. Huh? Uh, they are talking a lot uh, about uh, good governance, but uh, then they claim that the reality uh, would be a different one. And there we have one concrete example, and this is why I'm uh, uh, coming uh, here to, to this point today. Uh, this is about boxing, uh, where we have uh, an head to uh, withdraw the recognition for not to say expel 
uh, the international uh, federations uh, for a long, long list of uh, failures uh, over uh, so many years in, uh, their, uh, in their governance uh, that uh, uh, now uh, the sport of boxing, at least uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, Los Angeles and uh, then maybe also for Brisbane, is at risk. Uh, there to be very clear, you know, we want to have uh, boxing on the program because uh, boxing is one of the most uh, global sports. Uh, uh, boxing uh, is uh, contributing a lot to uh, the development in, you know, in uh, underprivileged uh, the, the people and, and societies in all countries. Wherever you go, whether it's a developed country or a country in, 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 in development, the boxers in, in most of the cases are uh, coming from uh, underprivileged areas of uh, society and uh, therefore are a great example for the values of uh, sport, for inclusion. And uh, therefore, we absolutely want to have uh, boxing. But we cannot organize the Olympic boxing tournament uh, uh, forever. We did it now twice because we love boxing, because we want to have it. We did it for Tokyo and we did it now again uh, for Paris. But the IOC is not an international uh, federation. And there to be very blunt, every uh, national boxing uh, federation and every NOC who wants uh, to see their uh, boxers uh, in the Olympic uh, tournament, who wants uh, to win a medal, will not be able to do so with uh, this uh, international uh, uh, federation of which we have withdrawn uh, their, uh, the, the recognition. If uh, we do not have in the near future uh, a reliable uh, and uh, representative international uh, federation at uh, our side, then it will not be possible to have boxing on the program in uh, LA. When speaking about uh, uh, good governance and uh, promoting uh, the relevance of uh, sport uh, there uh, in our societies, then uh, it's also about uh, respecting the different roles uh, of the actors in a society. And that is uh, in particular true uh, for uh, politics. We will hopefully always have issues with politics. Because if we don't have issues with politics anymore, it means we are not relevant anymore. Politicians are only interested in successful organizations. If we are not successful, if uh, they don't have the feeling uh, that we have access uh, to uh, uh, so many people in, in uh, society that we can contribute uh, something, they will not be interested. So I hope we will always have issues with, uh, with uh, politics. But what we need to do is that we can address uh, these uh, challenges in uh, the right way. And uh, that means uh, that uh, we have to deal uh, with the politics in mutual respect. It means for us, in the world of sport, we have to respect that the world is run by politicians and not by us, unfortunately. But we also have to make politics uh, understanding and politicians understanding that we can only contribute to society if they respect our autonomy. If they want to politicize us, if they want us to, to use as political tools, we cannot contribute anymore because then we are losing our values. Politics is always divisive. You always have different opinions. Uh, you also have uh, always have uh, a confrontation. Uh, you always have a, a clash of, uh, of uh, interests. 
Sport is unifying. Sport is the contrary of being decisive. Sport is the glue which holds our societies uh, uh, together. To mention only one uh, example uh, for, for the differences between uh, sport and uh, politics. So we have to defend by all means our autonomy. And I say it here, I don't know for how many times uh, I've said it already, but it needs uh, apparently to be repeated. That does not mean that we are apolitical, that we behave as if we would live on, a, on an island of the saints and uh, that uh, we would not uh, acknowledge that also our actions have a political impact and should have a political impact. Because otherwise, again, we would not be relevant. But, and that's the difference, we have to be politically neutral. That means for you as an NOC, whoever is in government, always realize that tomorrow they can be in opposition. And, all, and the ones who are in opposition can be in government uh, tomorrow. And that they have, by nature, different interests than we have and we must have in, uh, in uh, sport. So keep your neutrality work uh, closely uh, with them as long and as much they respect your autonomy. But draw the line when you feel they want to take you over and uh, they want to absorb you into uh, their uh, political fields. And what is true on a national level is also true on an international level. Uh, this is why the IOC Executive Board uh, just uh, last week, uh, together with uh, John Coates and uh, Robin Mitchell, uh, we passed a declaration against the politicization of uh, sport, which is about the international uh, level, uh, where uh, we, we can see uh, such a kind of uh, efforts uh, by one or the other uh, government. Uh, to uh, uh, trying to start organizing uh, purely politically motivated uh, games and uh, sports events uh, without any respect for uh, our values and uh, for uh, our uh, rules. And I guess uh, James uh, McLeod uh, will uh, there um, go a little bit uh, more in detail uh, uh, with you. And Promoting the relevance of uh, a sport in a society, as I said before, also means to be ahead of the curve. And uh, there I would like to encourage you to stay ahead of uh, the curve, in particular with regard to uh, the one topic that uh, will determine the future of our lives, of our personal lives, that will determine the future of our societies and which will also determine the future of sport. And this is digitalization. The ever accelerating development of uh, digitalization will, within a couple of years, change our world. And this is, uh, when it comes to sport, uh, true, in particular with regard to two work streams. The one is with uh, regard uh, to uh, e-sports and uh, uh, e-games, where we cannot ignore that about uh, three billion people on this uh, planet are familiar uh, with these uh, games and are not necessarily familiar anymore uh, in the young age uh, with uh, sport and uh, physical activity. 
and uh, therefore we have to look into uh, this uh, uh, area. We cannot ignore it, because if we just uh, ignore it, uh, we will uh, lose uh, what we have with hard work got back in the last uh, couple of years and what we can see from uh, the numbers and uh, figures in uh, followership uh, for uh, games and, and for sport, the young generation. We are, we are now, uh, that uh, the latest uh, figures uh, there are very clear, we are, we are very strong right now in the young uh, generation with a different uh, consumption of uh, sport and uh, but they are very much interested they are very close to us we have gained them back uh, but we will not uh, maintain it again if we do not uh, change if we do not address their areas of uh, society if we do not address their lifestyle, if we do not address uh, their interests, and their e-sports and e-games is uh, a very important uh, factor. This is why uh, you know, I've asked uh, there at uh, the latest uh, IOC session in uh, the Mumbai last November, uh, our e-sports uh, commission uh, to study the establishment of Olympic e-sports uh, games uh, where we want to make an effort in this respect while, of course, uh, always respecting uh, our values, our values of non-violence, of non-discrimination, of respect and uh, tolerance. Uh, th this uh, will not be uh, uh, given up. But we have to go and we have to approach this uh, community to win them over uh, uh, for us and to keep them interested uh, in us. And the other even uh, more overwhelming uh, development uh, is uh, artificial intelligence, which uh, has uh, the potential uh, to uh, start uh, to, to, to change uh, sports in every respect from the training of uh, the athletes uh, to uh, judging and refereeing uh, to the fight against uh, doping uh, to uh, the experience of uh, spectators, uh, be it live, where it will be more immersive, uh, be it on the screen where everybody can be their own director in the future and has not to rely on the directors of uh, the, the, the broadcasters and uh, so on. There is a, a huge potential related also with the uh, imminent risk, like every new technology has risks which have uh, to be uh, addressed. But there again, sport is different, not from all other areas of society, but from most of uh, other areas of society, because there they discuss whether AI will take over the area, whether AI will take over human beings, whether AI will replace human beings. And uh, uh, there, uh, uh, no, no, for not uh, the being alleged of something, uh, let's uh, take uh, our profession, uh, John, uh, you know, uh, uh, we still remember that once we have been lawyers, where many people are saying in 10 years you don't need lawyers anymore, maybe already in five years. This is different in sport. The 100 meters will always have to be run by an athlete. They will be run by a robot. It's not sport anymore. So in sports, this principle question is answered. There in sports, AI can help, can assist, can support, but cannot replace the athlete. And it can help all of us to organize sport in a more uh, efficient, in a more sustainable, in a, in a better way.
There you will see uh, next month, uh, already in a couple of weeks, uh, mid of uh, next month, an initiative of uh, the IOC where we will present uh, uh, such a, a project uh, which uh, brings together a, a vision of uh, uh, artificial, artificial intelligence uh, in sport. And I can only encourage uh, you, maybe at your uh, conference uh, preceding uh, your General Assembly next year, maybe to dedicate this uh, then uh, to uh, this uh, topic of, uh, uh, of AI in follow-up and implementation of uh, this uh, vision of uh, AI uh, in, uh, in, in sport because, again, this will be the main challenge and you know me, I'm not uh, so much uh, worried about challenges. I always uh, like uh, to look at the bright side of life, uh, to look at the opportunities AI is uh, uh, offering uh, for us and to do it at the right time again before others are taking us over in, in this uh, respect. If uh, we are continuing in this way, then uh, we can uh, look forward then uh, with uh, great uh, confidence, uh, not only to Paris, uh, but even more so to uh, uh, Brisbane. By then, uh, I hope uh, they will also have uh, settled down uh, one of the other discussion uh, they are having around uh, now in uh, Brisbane, but uh, which uh, I think are, are under control. And uh, sorry to tell you, the Aussies, uh, it's also not, uh, not new that uh, organizing committees, after having been awarded the games, are uh, starting again to speak about the venue master plan. So uh, we are pretty much relaxed uh, uh, about this, and uh, you will find uh, the right uh, solutions, and uh, then not only uh, the Aussies, uh, but uh, all the Pacific uh, can uh, enjoy uh, their uh, games uh, with a home advantage on which uh, you're already working now in an, Im again, impressive effort of uh, uh, solidarity so that uh, these uh, Olympic Games, uh, Brisbane uh, 2032, will not uh, just uh, the be uh, games uh, in Australia, not uh, only uh, games uh, in the uh, Pacific, but that there will be games for and with the uh, Pacific. In this uh, way, you know, we're showing the entire world uh, the power of uh, sport and uh, the power of uh, the values of uh, sport in uh, uh, your uh, region and uh, then being also transformative uh, for uh, uh, your region, not only when it comes uh, to athletics uh, performance, but uh, to, uh, again, uh, the overall relevance of uh, sport in society and in your region. On the short term, Paris, what uh, can I say? It will be great games. It will be great games uh, because uh, Paris from the very beginning, from the planning phase, has done what you are doing, you know, has embraced the message, and not only the message, but also the, the, the methods, the tools of uh, Olympic agenda. They have been planning from the very beginning in a, in a sustainable uh, way. They have been planning for the very, from the very beginning in an inclusive way. They have been planning from the very beginning in an urban way. And uh, then on, on top of this, uh, we from uh, the IOC, you know, have uh, put uh, then I just wanted to say cherry of the cake, but this could be misunderstood because it's too important to be the, the cherry of the cake. But, you know, we have 
made uh, it's also not a dream come true because it was more than a dream. It, it, it was an effort over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, you know, we have uh, managed to allocate the same number of quota places uh, finally for male and uh, female athletes uh, to have the first gender parity Olympic Games uh, in uh, our uh, uh, history. Of course, uh, these games are taking place in a very specific uh, geopolitical uh, situation. If uh, your General Assembly uh, would have uh, happened six, seven, eight months ago, I would have needed to go into detail in this. Uh, this uh, with regard to uh, the direct impact on Paris, uh, I think uh, this situation has uh, uh, changed. Uh, uh, there, the world is still in an extremely complicated, in a difficult, in a, I could say, bad uh, state. And it has even become more complex uh, with uh, what is happening in the, in, the, in the Middle East, with it what is happening in, in Africa and in all the other uh, too many wars and uh, armed uh, uh, conflicts. But in the Olympic movement, uh, we can see again that the world community has, like with the SDGs, where they were very reluctant at the beginning, and where they were re very reluctant with our approach uh, to these uh, geopolitical tensions in the very beginning. Now, the world uh, community uh, has recognized and has embraced this approach of uh, political neutrality uh, we have been uh, uh, taking uh, by uh, sanctioning those who are violating the Olympic Charter and by, uh, by protecting those who do not violate the Olympic uh, Charter, whether it's athletes or uh, NOCs. A couple of months ago, and uh, some of you may still remember uh, that the uh, ANOC General Assembly in, in Seoul some time ago, where, uh, you know, the the, the bad ghosts of uh, boycott, uh, you know, uh, were uh, pretty present in, in the room and uh, where threats of uh, boycotts uh, were there from, from both sides. Uh, now we can say this uh, discussion at this moment in time is over. We still have different opinions. Uh, one said, uh, one are saying, you know, we have been uh, going too far uh, with the sanctions for those who violated the Olympic Charter. Others are saying uh, we have not gone far enough. Normally, this shows you that you're in a good position. If both sides uh, are not 100% uh, happy, you have taken the right decision because otherwise, if uh, one would be happy, the other one would be extremely unhappy and then we would face real uh, problems. Now we can say with uh, good uh, confidence uh, that uh, this uh, discussion is over and uh, that uh, we will all uh, assemble uh, together uh, there in uh, Paris for a great uh, Olympic uh, uh, Games and uh, an Olympic Games uh, which will hopefully uh, feature uh, there are uh, powerful and uh, strong uh, teams uh, from uh, the uh, Pacific. I've heard that you have already qualified uh, more than 500 uh, uh, athletes, which is uh, quite an achievement. And again, with your step up uh, uh, program, I uh, think you're on the right way in the way of solidarity, not only to have these athletes uh, qualified, uh, but uh, also to make uh, them uh, uh, successful. And uh, there, uh, you know, Fiji uh, may make another effort uh, with the Rugby Sevens uh, uh, there. 
some work to do, uh, uh, Robin. Huh? Uh, but, uh, you know, the new coach uh, being an Olympic champion, normally there uh, you, cannot, uh, you, you cannot fail. We keep uh, all uh, our fingers uh, crossed uh, for you and for your teams. We are uh, standing at your side. We are looking forward to even strengthening our partnership and uh, friendship uh, uh, with you. And uh, we are looking forward to truly live our Olympic uh, motto uh, uh, with you. So let's go uh, faster. Let's uh, aim higher. Let's become stronger together. Winaka. Standing for the Olympic anthem, please. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas Bach, for the, uh, your speech earlier, uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, we now have the opportunity, and the floor is open, if you want to ask the president uh, any questions. Just put your hand up, and then uh, we'll show you the closest microphone you can speak from.
composing the questions, I think, President. Uh, the, the old tactic works, you only have to speak long enough to put them all asleep, <laughs> and then uh, you, don't face, you don't face any questions anymore after. I can see they're waking up now, so. But they don't know what to ask because they have been sleeping during all the speech. <laughs> <laughs> So I think we have to do a Tom and Jerry show or something. Uh, no, I can tell you the story with the sleeping. You know, when I was elected uh, uh, IOC member, then the, the then Doya uh, came to see me after I took uh, the oath. And uh, he said, uh, young man, I don't know why, but somehow I like you. So I want to give you some very good advice for your future in the IOC. Then he said, first, what you have to learn is whenever you speak, start by praising the president. Second, you have to learn to sleep with open eyes. Third, if you manage to sleep with open eyes and move your pencil at the same time, then I promise you a great, great future in this high house. <laughs> uh, so here we are. <laughs> but you manage this, uh, sleeping with open eyes, apparently very well. We have a question from the back. Ah, okay, finally. You probably could use uh, Sir John's microphone. Yeah. Oh. Here back, uh, thank you very much. Um, great, um, great to hear you. Uh, what would you like to see as an, the best outcome for Brisbane? Great success. <laughs> Now, uh, Brisbane has uh, the, the, the great opportunity, like any edition of the Olympic Games. Uh, you have to, to reinvent the Games. And uh, you have to reinvent the Games uh, in a way which uh, reflects uh, the culture uh, of uh, the, the host and the, the host region in, in this case. Uh, you, you should not uh, try to, to, to copy uh, something. Uh, some games uh, you, you think have been successful in, in, in the past. Uh, you have to do it uh, your way. You have to respect, of course, uh, the, the, the values, uh, the, the framework. But then within this uh, framework, uh, you have uh, to do it uh, uh, your way. And uh, there, Brisbane, uh, 32, uh, these games will happen in a new era. I do not need to, to come back and, you know, uh, with uh, the, the new society which, in which we will be living uh, at, at, at this time. Uh, there, Brisbane will have to take uh, this up to uh, embrace all these... Uh, uh, new developments in uh, technology and uh, lifestyle and then at the same time exploiting the potential it means uh, overall for Australia and the Pacific uh, region uh, for uh, uh, your important role not only in the world of sports uh, but uh, in, in, the, in the world in, uh, in general. Are there any other questions? No? Thank you, uh, President Buck. We'll uh, move on to the next agenda item then. Um, handing over the floor to Secretary General Blass. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, as we did this, the traditional welcoming ceremony and um, jumping on the schedule a bit. Uh, for the purpose of the official uh, recording of the minutes, 
I need to officially uh, take the roll call. So I'm going to start with um, American Samoa. Present. Australia. Cook Islands. FSM. Fiji. Guam. Kiribati. Marshall Islands. Nauru, New Zealand, Palau, PNG, Samoa, Solomon Islands, Tonga, Tuvalu, Vanuatu, and our associate members, New Caledonia, Wallace and Fatuna, Norfolk Islands, Niue, Northern Marianas, Tahiti, Tokelau. Thank you, President. Thank you very much, uh, Rick, and thank you very much, uh, members and associate members. Uh, we move on to agenda item five, the approval of the minutes of the Annual General Assembly, Assembly, which has been circulated. Rick. And everyone has a copy of the uh, minutes from the last AGM. Are there any comments? Any corrections? Can I ask someone to move a motion to adopt the minutes? Cook Islands, second. Samoa. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rick. And I think we deserve morning tea. Uh, so we have a break uh, for 20 minutes, and then we'll continue the program. Uh, hopefully we'll be fin finished before lunch. Thank you.
Demon. Demon. D.
Can I ask everyone please to take their seats? Please take your seats. Following Dr. Mitchell's statement of trying to finish by 12, please take your seats. Thank you. We're still waiting for. Yeah, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, and move on this next agenda uh, on a signing agreement be between Oceania National Olympic Committee and the Oceania Paralympic Committee. So I'm going to ask Mr. Paul Bird, and I believe it's Paul, right, signing? Yes, and also uh, President Mitchell to please proceed down to this table in front of the podium. Uh, and also Selwyn is a witness. NOC delegates, ladies and gentlemen, we're thrilled this morning in the presence of you all to announce a very significant milestone, one that you're witnessing this very moment. The Oceania National Olympic Committees has worked closely with the Oceania Paralympic Committee in partnership, stepping up together towards Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games. To sign the MOU between ONOC and OPC, we are pleased to witness um, President Paul Bird and ONOC President Robin Mitchell and witnesses, eyewitnesses being OPC Secretary General Selwyn Meister and Secretary General Rick Blass, Naka.
ladies and gentlemen, if we could put our hands together to mark this historic moment. Naka. I wanted to take the, uh, this time to uh, provide a, a small brief update on, as you noticed earlier, that uh, Enoke, my executive director, has not been around. And unfortunately, he had been suffering a similar um, situation that I went through with nerve pains, um, radiating down to his right arm, and uh, he was not able to sleep, but then he was still trying to uh, work the uh, agenda program for the AGM. And just one thing led to another, and it ended up that with the help of our uh, ONOC medical team, Dr. Potoy saw him and recommended that he be uh, taken to the hospital for care because they have the facilities to address his current needs. He's doing much better now. He's having more sleep. The Pain um, radiating from his nerves are have somewhat subsided, but still. And then there's the other factor of his health being compromised because his inability to, to do anything for himself uh, due to that limitation. So, But he sends his best regards to everyone and his apologies. And uh, I think hopefully we'll see him uh, this week before everyone starts to leave. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rick. And moving along with the agenda, I'm uh, pleased to present uh, my president's report. Uh, the report is in your uh, files that has been circulated. I don't uh, intend to make an extensive additional um, part of the brief because a lot of it will be reported to you by our commissions. Uh, and so just a couple of points. Uh, uh, that I'd like to make. Uh, this year is quite a significant year for, for all of us in the sense that it's um, almost the winds of change that's affecting Oceania. Uh, at the end of this year, uh, three of our senior members will be retiring at various times during the year. Uh, Kevin Gosper was the doyen 
is part of the class of 1989, those of us that first got involved with the uh, ONOC administration. Uh, Kevin served as president from 1989 till 2009. And uh, the last few days he retired as president uh, of our OSPO, handing over the baton to Yvonne Mullins uh, in athletics. Uh, Sir John Dawanikura, sort of, I think he was uh, 1980 or 70, 1970, I'm not really sure when he joined. Could have been 1900. But <laughs> he preceded uh, uh, those of us, uh, the 98 class, which includes Rick Blass and myself. So Sir John is uh, retiring as president of the PNG NOC, who was the fourth member of the Olympic family. Uh, Papua New Guinea, that, that is. Uh, Sir John was ONOC Vice President at 1985, and then uh, for various times, as he and Rick changed places uh, every so many elections. So with those uh, three members, we will recognize them uh, in due course, more likely next year, so we can have another excuse for a party wherever we are uh, for the assembly. Uh, in terms of uh, additional reports, um, you received a letter from Antoine about uh, four weeks ago, which was circulated about some of the changes we needed to make uh, to our constitution. Uh, part of it was to do with eligibility of IOC members to be part of the group. And when we look at the uh, uh, other continents, we realize that we're the only continent where IOC members uh, are voting as part of the election process. So you may have seen in the original agenda that it was being discussed, but I uh, spoke to Antoine, and I think it's more important that we review the whole uh, constitution of ONOC, because the status of ONOC may be changing in Fiji. Uh, in the sense, we're just a company limited by guarantee based in Fiji. We've applied for international status so that we're the equivalent of the United Nations, WHO, etc., which has um, a significant impact in terms of currency exchange. We don't go through the local processes at all. Uh, and it has benefits uh, locally as well as part of the international family. Uh, three, and we have almost all of our members have representatives in Fiji. A diplomatic representation. I think there's only two more that are still to come. And I think that's Tonga and Palau. But Tonga, I think they were trying to conquer Fiji at some stage, so perhaps they own Fiji or half of it anyway. But uh, that's something that we appreciate from ONOC because we can talk to your government reps in Suva. Uh, so we've set up a working group. Uh, the chairman is John Coates, an uh, expert on this uh, field. Uh, Ernestine Romengel, the Attorney General of Palau, and Patrick Fepuleai of Samoa, uh, the third lawyer in the group. Uh, Sir John, uh, with his experience in the movement, and Antoine. So these uh, five people working with uh, Jerome Pave of the IOC will be reviewing our charter, and we would like to adopt it in Cascai, Portugal, on the occasion of the ANOC General Assembly. We've also adopted, uh, not adopted, that's not the right word, but selected members of our audit commission will continue until the elections next year. Mike Bloomfield of Tonga chairs the meeting, uh, Nikki Nicole of New Zealand, and Bob Steffi from Guam. They went through our audit uh, report and then presented it to the executive before it was presented to you yesterday. Uh, in terms of the other commissions, there may be one or two changes to some of the commission members, but otherwise you'll all continue until 2025. Now we've uh, talked about the home games advantage and uh, this, a lot of this will be in the minutes proper, so I won't uh, touch on that at all. But just look forward to other areas that uh, we need to um, strengthen. Uh, as we work through to the elective General Assembly, uh, wherever it's being held next year. Uh, one of the other areas, perhaps just leaving a, a thought for us, 
At the moment, we are one of two continents in the world that runs games separately from the continental games. In 2027, Africa will be hosting their first games. They've just completed the games in uh, Accra, uh, run by governments. Uh, athletes were arriving, the village wasn't ready, so the other issues because it's non-sporting people that are organizing them. So 2027, Africa will have a continental games similar to the other three continents. There's benefits in this in the sense that ONOC has sponsors that uh, would help sport because at the moment the Pacific Games really is paid for by the host country and not all of them are able to afford uh, that. So uh, what I hope will happen, as you know, the first games uh, took place in 1963. Uh, don't reveal my age, but I took part in that games <laughs> long time ago. Uh, the first mini games were held in Honiara and Solomon's hosted a great games last year. Excellent world-class facilities. Thank you, Martin, from ONOC and for all the membership for what you and Melinda did and your country. Great games. A bit hot. <laughs> Australia and New Zealand joined as associate members at the games in Apia. But I think we all need to be as a family leading up to 20, uh, 20, oh, 2032 so really, we'll leave that to the Pacific Games uh, Council who will be meeting in Palau uh, in September. I'd also like to just acknowledge at this stage our host country or host town in France in the lead up to the Games. 10 of the 15 member countries have signed an agreement with uh, our colleagues from Divon, Le Bain, I think I've got that right, uh, it's convenient in the sense that you can fly into Geneva Airport and it's 10 to 15 minutes drive from there. When it was first uh, raised by our exploratory committee, I thought it was too far from Paris. But in essence, it's just two and a half hours on the TGV to Paris, Gardus, not Gardus, not the other one, yeah, down south. So I think we're preparing quite well. We have 60 people that have already identified by the 10 NOCs to be based there uh, in train for the games. And we look forward to all of the members being working together uh, in, in Paris. At this stage, it's unlikely that we'll be hosting a hospitality center. I mean, we make our own fun wherever we are, but it's gonna cost a lot to do something like that in Paris. But otherwise, that's uh, just a few of the items I thought I would just add to my report. But more information will come from the commission um, chairs that are presenting later on. Happy to answer any questions now, but I don't think we need to formalize anything of what I've said. Uh, the working committees are starting to work. Thank you. So no comments there, just a thank you to Antoine for triggering off uh, this uh, self-analysis, uh, but I think it was timely in the sense that we needed to uh, update our constitution so that's in keeping with uh, uh, the IOC charter. As there are no questions, which I'm very happy about, I'll pass the floor to Rick to make his report. Uh, thank you, President. Um, everyone would have now received um, all our our reports. Um, just a, uh, a new process in which we decided to take this on board because 
um, reports uh, from all the NOCs. Uh, again, thank you for those that uh, met our deadlines, or timelines. But then in essence of um, trying to conserve on, on going green, we felt that um, we decided now to proceed with one copy, uh, print one copy, and the rest will go on uh, uh, online and to be shared on SharePoint. Uh, where I would rec highly recommend that you also send copies of this to your national federation, your government, and we. I think it's really important that your government um, continues to receive um, what their NLCs are doing, as it then provides them the legal support to seek their government to provide funding and underwrite the cost of sports activity in your respective countries. So, again, um, my report uh, basically reflects the um, annual activities. I'm not about to go into uh, the length of it because uh, reflecting on what President Box said, uh, not wanting to put anyone to sleep. But it's there. Um, I think the only thing I really want to highlight is the regional safeguarding workshop, and I ask that all NLCs, if you have not implemented that, that's part of our mandates, part of the requirements from the IOC to ensure that we conduct and then provide a guidelines to safeguarding uh, our athletes and sports. Uh, reference to the Solomon Island Games has been a long uh, hurdle for Martin himself. Uh, I should know that, or oh, you may not know, is that there was a lot of back uh, backroom uh, uh, work that we had to do as ONUC. And this dates far back as the last 20 years. Uh, when Martin came on board, he stabilized the, uh, their NOC. And again, uh, even in 2019 in Guam, when we were having our executive meeting, that meeting was interrupted because several members of the National Federation thought strategically that they could undermine an elected uh, NOC president and secretary general, uh, prompting myself and President Vidya Lakan to immediately proceed down to Honiara. So there was a lot of issues that Martin had to deal with. Um, and the fact that he was um, willing to roll up his sleeve, uh, which he did. And sure, there are things that he still needed to understand in terms of accountability, um, but you know, at the end of the day, he's the person that uh, held it all together and presented one of the uh, best games uh, and also with a fantastic facility, and you all have witnessed that. So Martin and Melinda, uh, congratulations to the work that you guys have done and put in. Um, in acknowledgement, and I'm not gonna read into this because it's just, I might get lost. I just, looking at James because, in, I guess James made a mistake of having to walk by Nicole's office when I was meeting with their team in Lausanne. And the idea just came up if I could get him to uh, bring Nicole for the last time, knowing already that she was gonna uh, separate from the ILC. And when he said yes, then I said, well, let me try another name and another. And that came with Pamela, and then the last one was Petty. And it was sitting there trying to find a way to show our appreciation as of the Olympic family in Oceania on three individuals that have made a lot of changes to the way we operate as NOCs. And now that Nicole is out, I can say that Nicole never, never uh, said no to, an, um, to a suggestion or a possibility of a plan. She listened carefully. I also expressed the need to understand the way Oceania operates, our respective NLCs, how the difference uh, of NLCs between Tuvalu, um, Tonga, and um, Fiji, and even Papua New Guinea, how we all operate differently 
uh, some with a greater resource and some with, with not. But I was really elated when uh, James kind of, I think, reluctantly agreed, but smiled and goes, but no more, okay? And it's just that one time. I said, sure, I'll take that. But now I go back to uh, Nicole, Pamela, and Pede. And while we continue on with what we do here in Oceania, I want to just first thank the ILC, President Bach, and especially James for, uh, for his uh, agreement and approval to bring them and allow us to honor it. Now the last part is to you, the NOCs, because I had asked you for something that, um, and you did excellent, uh, by bringing a small gift um, indigenous to your respective uh, islands and you brought it in and uh, it was something uh, quite emotional and as you can see that I, um, I think Nicole continues to share her rainfall with us in the last couple of weeks so all the best to the three it's been a major impact to Oceania and again thank you James. And I'm almost finished with that, President. I, I, can I just stop here and ask if there's anyone has any questions? Or are they still reading? <laughs> um, I wanted to take this time to thank uh, Fasenach, um, the President and Secretary General, for uh, providing Fiji water uh, as part of, our, of their support of the, uh, as a host of ONOC and for providing the sports staff to complement on our team. And as you can see that you may see a lot of uh, unfamiliar faces, but those are team support from, uh, from Fasenach. So Fasenach, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> and I also wanted to thank the ONOC team, and especially Inoke, and who could not join us again for reasons. And They've spent a lot of uh, long hours, work hours, and, and we're working with the rain, and some may wonder why two venues. Uh, we were heading Easter, and the problem associated with, if we were to host the AGM around the April schedule, then we would not uh, be hosting our General Assembly here. Um, they're fully booked, and they gave us the option of these timelines, and then, we learned the, that they didn't have the adequate um, numbers that's needed. So why the two facilities is this reason. And uh, I also want to take the time and, and again thank our colleague, colleagues from um, Paris 2024, Simone and uh, Marion, uh, also um, from Devon de um Alexis and Danny. And lastly, I just wanted to announce because I forgot to mention of a partnership that we had engaged with Wiz, and you see this funny looking European, it's very joyful, and his testament to his association with Guam is, I have, I mean, I'm sorry, to Onak, is I have 13 Bula shirts, representing the number of years that he's been back and forth with us. So, and that's Joanne uh, Warringer. And you see him, he's really a great asset in terms of how we've actually done our, uh, there he is, thank you. Um, uh, done our um, advancement of our uh, techs and uh, IT uh, uh, procedures. But uh, again, this engagement was post COVID. Uh, he manages a games and events management solutions partner. So. Uh, we've been very grateful with, uh, with him coming on board and hopefully we get to use him with some of our games program. I believe that concludes my report, President. Oh, and lastly, I've, I think I might be jumping on this, is the ONOC Secretary General's report on Olympic solidarity. You would have also have received a copy of that. And again, it, it's just an item that we continue to summarize. Um, 
the programs and missions of uh, Olympic Solidarity here in Oceania. So we can follow that up um, at some uh, other time, or if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to take them now. Thank you. Thank you, President. Doesn't seem to be any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Rick. And we'll move to the next item, which isn't on the agenda, but it's uh, basically a recognition of an achievement uh, from uh, one of the nominations uh, to the IOC. And this is the IOC Gender Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Award. And I'd like to ask the President if he could uh, present the award to the winner, Patrick Johnson from Australia. Thank you, uh, President Mitchell, for doing my job in announcing uh, the winner. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, you just wanted to make enough, another effort to prevent me from a long speech. I got the message. <laughs> uh, sorry for you, Patrick. I had prepared uh, here all the reasons for about uh, 25 minutes. Uh, uh, but I nevertheless, uh, maybe uh, if you allow me just to summarize. You know, uh, uh, the Patrick uh, is an Olympian, and uh, what you can see here from his shape, uh, he's a sprinter, huh? uh, and uh, what he did in, uh, in sport as an athlete, as a sprinter, uh, he did with the same success uh, then in his uh, career on the sports management side, but with uh, different uh, qualities because uh, there he was not a sprinter or is not a sprinter, uh, there he is more on the marathon uh, side and uh, achieving uh, really great, great uh, successes with uh, regard to gender equality, diversity and uh, inclusion. And if I may, I just give you uh, uh, some of the reasons uh, the jury uh, as reasons uh, for uh, awarding him uh, this uh, prize for uh, Australia. So uh, what the jury is saying is that uh, Patrick Johnson's work has been pivotal in ensuring programs foster the growth and participation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in Olympic sports. He had a leadership role in the Australian Olympic Indigenous Coaching Scholarship Program, and he was a driving force in leading gender equality and inclusion, advocating equal representation of female members on key decision-making committees, commissions and groups at the Australian Olympic uh, uh, Committee. Some of the results uh, he achieved include uh, a 50% female representation of indigenous members on the AOC's uh, Athletes Commission, 40% female members on the AOC's Indigenous Advisory Committee, and a 50% uh, female representation on the AOC's Reconciliation Action Plan Working uh, uh, Group. And uh, this is just uh, uh, only some of uh, the great achievements and results having been performed by Patrick uh, Johnson. So I think you can uh, all join me and congratulate him very warmly on uh, this award and uh, thank him for all these efforts he have been undertaking. But uh, being an athlete, he also knows uh, that uh, every prize, every medal, uh, is not uh, the end, uh, it's just an encouragement uh, to do uh, even more and to uh, continue on this uh, great path of uh, inclusion. Dear Patrick, uh, congratulations and uh, thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, President, and congratulations, Patrick, from all of the family here in Oceania. I think, Sink Jen, uh, you, you can see we're very flexible up the top here, so I'm going back to Rick again to finish his report. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to be uh, uh, requesting for the um, general membership. Uh, we presented the audits uh, yesterday, President, uh, the financial audit, um, and uh, I just wanted to now present it was approved by the uh, the members yesterday, and it's just to be recorded at this General Assembly, uh, the approval of the ONOC uh, 2023 uh, audited statements. Can I get a st um, motion to, from a member uh, to approve? Motion. Second. New Zealand. Any objections or Antoine? None. Uh, thank you very much, and again, just to acknowledge um, an appreciation to Chairman Mike Bloomfield, uh, Nikki from New Zealand, and Bob from Guam. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Rick and members. Now, we're now moving on to the activities of our commission, and I'd like to call uh, Ken Wallace to present the Athletes Commission report. Congratulations, Patrick. You make us all proud, mate. Buller, g'day, President Buck, President Mitchell, INOC executive, NOC leaders, all the sports leaders throughout Oceania and the world. And the reason that we are all here today in this room, the Olympians, the Paralympians, and athletes throughout Oceania and the world. I'd also like to start by acknowledging the other members of the INOC Athletes Commission and every member of the NOC Athletes Commissions throughout Oceania for all their hard work throughout the year. It's my honour to present the highlights of the Oceania National Olympic Committee Athletes Commission report for the year 2023. Throughout the year, our commission has been dedicated to empowering athletes and amplifying their voices within the Olympic movement. The full report is in the papers provided, which I'm sure that you have all read, and any commission members or myself will be happy to answer any questions afterwards. Firstly, I'm delighted to announce the election and the appointment of new members of our commission. These individuals bring diverse experiences and perspectives enriching our advocacy for athletes across Oceania with representation in various governance bodies at the highest level as well as grassroots sports. Our members ensure comprehensive support and representation at all levels. In terms of activities, we have been actively engaged in initiatives aimed at supporting athletes from participating in the International Olympics Committee Athletes Forum, thank you, to advocating for athlete representation in decision-making bodies. We have strived to uphold the athletes' rights and responsibilities and the well-being of athletes in our region. One significant highlight was the Voices of the Athletes program, the VOA program, at the 2023 Pacific Games where athletes had a platform to share their experiences and concerns directly. This program, alongside other educational initiatives with the support of Athlete365 and Arado, underscores our commitment to empowering athletes both on and off the field of play. Additionally, we continue to encourage the utilisation of ONOC Athletes Commission grants and the IOC Athlete Activity Grants, offering valuable opportunities for NOC ACs to support athlete-focused programs and initiatives. Again, please come see any of the members of the Commission to find out how. And in conclusion, the ONOC Athletes Commission remains steadfast in our mission to empower athletes and advocate for their rights and interests. We are grateful for the support of all entities involved and we look forward to further co collaboration in the future. On behalf of the entire ONOC Athletes Commission, Thank you for all your support, and cheers. Thank you. Good night, Ken. Are there any uh, questions of the Ken's report, the printed report? Any comments? No? Thanks very much, Ken. Thank you. Medical Commission, Dr. Chris Mill. The chairman of the ANOC Medical Commission. 
Thanks, Mr. President. It's um, my great pleasure to report to you on the activities of the um, uh, Medical Commission uh, from ONOC. And I'm just waiting for these slides to come up. So, uh, yeah, we've, we've had a pretty active year uh, in the last year and we'll go through some of the highlights for you today. Uh, so firstly, just uh, an outline of what I'm going to talk about for the next five minutes uh, and then happy to take questions at the end. Uh, so our members are as listed there. We have a good wide geographic representation from um, uh, Micronesia, Polynesia, Melanesia and uh, what my predecessor Ken Fitch calls Macronesia um, and um, just um, happy to um, have that, um, that diversity of experience and people bring different things to the table. Uh, <coughs> in addition, we co-opted uh, Dr. Alex Manamua uh, and Ruben Mao from Solomons to uh, be involved with our commission as we were involved with the planning uh, and for the Pacific Mini Games 2025, I'm pleased to announce that um, Dr. Rachel Anarao has been uh, co-opted onto our commission to provide liaison with the uh, local medical services there. So what did we get up to last year? Well, the big thing obviously was the Pacific Games. So we had oversight of the planning process for athlete medical care. We ran two pre-games training courses uh, and really grateful to Dr. Donna Patoy and Kathy Wong for their running of these courses and we were able to train over 100 people. And I think that's the big thing, is upskilling the local people so they can get on and provide the care for the athletes in, in their countries. Uh, obviously, we also had a lot of close collaboration with Orado uh, and our members, uh, a subset of our, our group, looked at the TUEs uh, to make sure that they were all legitimate uh, and then could be granted to the athletes. Uh, just further to that, <coughs> two of our members, Dr. Terry Kipuni from the Cook Islands and Lewis Cruz from Guam, went to the WADA TUE Symposium in Korea, and that's a great way of keeping up to date uh, with the developments in the field. As you realise, it's a constantly evolving area, and we just want to make sure that we can provide the best overview for the athletes and, and, and deal with any applications fairly and up to uh, world best practice. Secondly, um, we, um, we've obviously been delighted to keep the liaison going with the Athletes Commission uh, and Ken has been instrumental in that work with us. Uh, as uh, mentioned by uh, President Mitchell, um, I've been involved and ha happy to um, be leading the ANOC Medical Commission and from this part of the world where we're a small continent with only 17 NOCs, just to have the heft of the other bigger continents and what they can bring to the table, keeping our processes aligned with uh, world best practice is all for the benefit of the athletes. Also happy to report that uh, managed to get to the IOC conference on prevention of injury and illness in sport and very grateful to the IOC for their support of this meeting. So roughly a thousand doctors and physios from around the world uh, gather and, and um, it's just a wonderful opportunity to share the world best uh, practice but also to collaborate with um, old friends and, um, and um, uh, advance the cause of healthcare. So what are our outcomes from last year? Well, as I uh, mentioned, we had um, uh, the uh, advice and support to the organisers of the uh, Games in Honiara last year. We worked closely with Orado on the anti-doping advice and um, we held our Medical Commission AGM uh, in a hybrid format as I guess most of the other commissions did as well. So in terms of what we achieved, I think um, it's already been alluded to uh, how um, uh, things went in, uh, in, in the Solomons last year and we're grateful for the close collaboration with the local people there. Uh, the close alignment with Orado and that's been something that's not been a new thing. We've uh, worked closely with Orado for at least the last 15 years uh, since that organisation started. And then also, as I alluded to, uh, our work with the ANOC Medical Commission. 
So there's still been some challenges. We're not going to uh, shy away from that. So COVID is still an issue, as you will be well aware. Um, I'm sure everybody in this room has either had it or has a family member who's had it. Um, and um, we've still got to be remain vigilant because this virus continues. It's a, like a leapfrog race, really. Uh, but fortunately, the, um, the, the uh, vaccines have proven effective. Uh, we had some unexpected challenges last year in Honiara, and, and we were just very grateful for the um, rapid um, response of people on the ground to make sure that um, we could deliver the best care we could to the athletes. And uh, I think Dr. Uh, Donna uh, Patoy uh, achieved the, the vaunted status of the uh, ice lady uh, because she was instrumental in making sure that ice got to the various um, athletes uh, as they needed it for um, uh, their drinks and also to uh, uh, ice baths to cool down after their events. So in terms of future plans, we plan to um, look uh, closely at what happened in Solomon's last year and the learnings from that can be applied obviously for future events. Uh, we um, will keep working with Orado uh, and as has been alluded to already, we have this exciting initiative with providing care uh, to Pacific Island athletes uh, in the lead up to Paris. And uh, so we've had some interesting developments uh, and very grateful to Olympic Solidarity for coming on board with that particular initiative and hopefully we can build on that for the future. Uh, so that's really it from me. I'm very grateful to uh, report from the, our commission, thank the Onok executive for their support, uh, particularly thank our, our two ladies who went up to Honiara and helped out uh, for the Pacific Games, uh, to thank Alistair on behalf of Orado for his um, great uh, collaboration with us, and then also Nala and Melly from the Onok office. So that's really it from me, and um, thank you very much uh, uh, for your attention. Thanks very much, uh, Chris. Are there any uh, questions uh, for Dr. Mill regarding his report? Thanks very much. Uh, you want to do the second part, Chris? The presentation? Yeah. Say again? Presentation? Or we do that later? I. That, that, that's it from me at okay. the moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. There's no question there. No question? No. no. Okay. Um, Equity Commission is the uh, next one. And can we ask Liz Dawson and Helen Brownlee, I think, jointly presenting? Kia ora bula. President Bark, President Dr Mitchell, members of the ONOC Executive, ANOC Secretary-General Ganilla Lindbergh, distinguished guests, ladies, gentlemen and colleagues. Thank you for the opportunity to present the report of the Oceania Equity Commission. You'll recall from last year that we entered into a new partnership to form the Oceania Impact Network to work together to further our aims of empowering women and girls through sport, to promote sport as a safe space, and to advocate for equi equitable and inclusive opportunities for diverse communities in and through sport. This has been a true collaboration with Team Up, the UN Women Fiji Multi-Country Office, with the ONOC Office, and the IOC through Olympic Solidarity and Olympism 365, each of which are represented here today. And my deepest thanks for not only the willing spirit, but the real action that we believe has shifted the dial already. We said we would do three things, that we would share the idea and begin working together, 
that we would activate a backbone support to develop the plan and the entity, and I would like to acknowledge Dr Michelle Cox, who started in December last year and is already bringing her expertise to bear. And we said we would pilot some collaborative projects. UN Women's Social Marketing Campaign, Team Up's Play for Equity Funding, and the Regional Safeguarding Workshop. And we said it would be by the Pacific, for the Pacific. Two pilots have been implemented, the first being the Team Up Safeguarding Skills Building Regional Workshop, which some here have attended. And it's been such a privilege to have been able to share your experiences, your inputs and your Pacific guidance with the IOC Safeguarding Working Group. I'm deeply grateful and incredibly moved by the courageous conversations and actions that are now being had here in Oceania in this space. And I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge Andrew Lapani and Rashika Deo and from Team Up and Shabina Khan and her colleagues at UN Women. These conversations and actions have reverberated throughout our sporting world. And the IOC executive have confirmed their support for the development of a re pilot regional safeguarding hub here in Oceania, with the first phase of feasibility to begin over the next month or so. And further, the European Olympic Committee Gender Equality Commission and the IOC's Gender Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Unit asked to understand the experiences of one of our participants. And here's a quick edit from our own Sefa Takape of Nauru. Hi, my name is Sefa Naya Takape and I work with the Nauru Olympic Committee is in the Oceania region and comes under ONOP. My role at NOC here in Nauru is the Sports Education Officer. And recently, uh, I've been appointed as the Safeguarding Officer. From the workshop, I found out also that uh, it was important uh, to be open and honest uh, with the difficulties that uh, I faced here, uh, here in Nauru in terms of uh, safeguarding. And uh, it was pleasing to note that I wasn't the only one facing the same problems, uh, not only my NOC, but there were other NOCs uh, in the region that were facing some uh, problems in terms of uh, their policy making or in terms of legislations uh, regarding their, um, their, their safeguarding. Uh, it was just amazing. And uh, I'd like to thank NOC and uh, um, my NOC, ONOP, IOC, and uh, also Team Up for facilitating the program. It was uh, it was um, life-changing, if I could say. And as an adjunct to this, Olympic Solidarity have committed, as you've heard from Secretary General Rick, 10,000 US funding for each NOC to assist in a safeguarding project. And I'd like to acknowledge the Guam NOC, Rick, Sandra, Joey, Mike, and assisted by CETI in organising and running their national workshop in December. Tuvalu have had their application confirmed, Vasanok have an application underway, a number of NOCs have made inquiries, and both ONOC and the Impact Network partners are here, we're ready to assist. And it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge the input and support from Sheila and Sinead from Solidarity and Barbara from 365 who are here with us today. The second pilot, a social marketing campaign, has been led by our colleagues at UN Women. Most of us who attended the Pacific Games on Honeyara will recall these posters and calls to action from the Call 132 Safe Net campaign. Not only did this give athletes and vulnerable persons a support mechanism, it created an important focus for dialogue and identification. At the recent 2024 Oceania Weightlifting Championships, of the 170 competitors at the senior, junior and youth grades, 93 were women, 77 men. 21 technical officials were involved, nine women and 12 men. And whilst there was no para event, Disability Sport Auckland was involved as part of the wider event, being present for three days with 10 schools and over a 1,000 students engaged. 
Thank you to all of those who have contributed and supported these incredibly important pilots and test programs. We're all learning how to make our sports better, faster, higher, stronger, together, in every aspect. And I'd like to acknowledge our Commission members, the ONOC Executive Board, Dr Mitchell and Secretary General Rick for your support, and the ONOC management and staff who have worked tirelessly with us to support and advocate for this important work. And I now give the floor to our own legend of sport and of women in sport who will complete the report to their General Assembly. Thank you, Liz. And um, can I just pay tribute to Liz for the work that she's done in the safeguarding space because she has led that and driven it and it was just a huge success. And, you know, I wanted to publicly thank you for the effort that you've put into that and, and the work that, that has occurred last year to make it a most successful event. And I know you were all influenced by it and hopefully that influence will continue and we'll continue to see improvements in safe sport throughout the region. So um, it's a delight to see so many people here and particularly President Bark. It's lovely to see you. Thank you for joining us again. Um, and I can sort of recall back to early ONOC General Assemblies and we didn't have this number of people. So it really... We had, the, we had the committees, had the NOCs, but we had a lot more people who are interested in what's happening in ONOC, and I think that's really good. Um, up front, can I just send my congratulations to Patrick Johnson as well for the Jedi um, Champion of Oceania. You are the first male um, recipient for Oceania, so we're delighted that that's happened this year. Whilst we really had only encouraged you to put in applications. It's great to see that it's, it's male and female. We can all work together. And so recognising the work that Patrick had done in that space is really great. Um, I, I think President Bark actually hit on the fact of safe sport being such an important part of the IOC agenda. And that's something that we're committed to continuing in the future. So, um, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. These are the goals of the IOC and ONOC for this year. We want gender balance in governing bodies, at least 30% representation. We want gender balance in team, in games leadership teams, 50% female athletes in NOC teams, and I know that's a tricky thing because they have to qualify an increase in female coaches and technical officials. Um, in Tokyo, oh, I can do it myself, can I? Um, these are the IOC stats from Tokyo, and you can see athletes went up slightly. So we had 51% athletes in Tokyo, women. Um, coaches went up slightly, but still very a low figure. Um, team management went up as well, again, not even 50%. Um, team leaders, up a little bit. Uh, again, not brilliantly, but moving up, so that's, that's a good sign. Medical officials, and I'm sorry, my friend, <laughs> um, Dr Milner, um, went down. And so, but I think that might change going into Paris. Um, and other NOC personnel went up a bit as well. So, um, as you know, over the past years, I've tried to collate some figures on women in governance. And so I've put together the figures from 2015 and the figures from 2022, which um, it was the last time that we ac I actually had some full figures and we haven't we have done it again um, today and you may have been um, asked by some of the the team from the equity commission so in we've gone up from 31 percent to 40 percent and I'm pleased to say that we've reached 40 percent again today in 2024 so we 
just need to check through those. But it's a really um, interesting time because next year you will again come up for your NOC executive elections and an opportunity to um, put more women in if need be. Um, the thing that I wanted to make a point of is, is the increase in national sports boards particularly because that's gone up so much. And so all of you sitting around the table can see that 532 women are out there leading sports in your countries. So you cannot tell me that there, is, there are no women who are suitable to sit on your executive. There are 532 out there that I know of in 2022, and there's probably more. So you need to find them. You need to go out and look for them and encourage them to take up their place. And I think you, you're all capable of doing that. And Oceana Sports Boards, and it's lovely to have so many of the OSFO people here today, has also doubled, almost doubled. So a great increase, and we'll continue to monitor that. And hopefully um, after your elections um, and by the end of 2025, we'll have an increase in numbers. So we're looking forward to seeing that. Our focus for this year and next year, of course, is the Paris Games. And that's everyone's focus and we understand that. We are going to have two regional youth leadership workshops, one in the north in Palau in September and one in Cook Islands in October. We have decided at our meeting um, yesterday that we are going to seek your um, nominations for, for people to attend these workshops. We want one male and one female who have potential for leadership and are between the ages of 20 and 40. So, sorry, my friends, uh, quite a few of you won't be able to be eligible. It's okay, Hugh, you'll be there anyhow. So, um, I start thinking, I've had a talk to a few of you and I know some of you have got some young people that you feel might be really worthwhile to, to join that and we're going to see how we can include um, the associate members as well. So start saving. You might we not might not be able to fund you, but you're welcome if we can fit you in. Um, we're obviously going to support the national safeguarding workshops, and as Liz said, would encourage you all if you haven't thought about what you're doing. The money is out there, and you need to put a plan together and get approval to get that through. We will continue our advocacy work and women's representation in leadership. Now, as you will see from um, on your tables, you've got a little brochure because this year the Equity Commission are actually celebrating 20 years of empowering women and girls through sport. If you didn't get a brochure, I still have plenty. Um, come and see me at the lunch break and you're welcome to have one. You also got a little bracelet which... Um, maybe won't fit some of your wrists, that's okay. <laughs> but I'm sure you've got people at home and grand young people and grandchildren who would love to have a bracelet. I don't want to take them home with me, so you can take as many as you like if you need more. So um, that we felt that it was important. We started um, the Life of the Women and Sport Committee in the Cook Islands, actually. So it's really lovely that we're going back there at the end of the year for our final workshop. And it started because we had an IOC conference in the Cook Islands and we were told we were the only continent without a Women and Sport Committee. So we decided to do something about it. Um, and we formed an ad hoc committee and the only two people who are in the room, as far as I can recall, from that time are Anita Blas and myself. And so thank you, Anita, you're hanging in there. And we had Rosie Blake as the inter from the Cook Islands as the interim chair. And as those who knew Rosie in those days, she was a bit of a mover and shaker. And uh, we're hoping to get Rosie back for that week and have a celebration dinner to tie off the 20 years. So we're looking forward 
to doing all of that. And so that's just a snapshot of some of the achievements we've had. I tried to make it simple so that you didn't have to read through your pages and pages which, from which I got this information. But um, some of the things that we've done and what we've, you know, hopefully where we're heading in the future. Uh, okay. So, you know, it's up to each one of you. You can make a difference. Men, women, young men, young women, doesn't matter who's involved with your NOC, they can all make a difference and empower women and girls through sport. And that's, that's our mantra, that's what we're on about and that's what we want to keep talking about, if we can. Um, as President Bark said, we've achieved gender parity with, um, for, with athletes for the Paris Olympics. I know my international federation has had achieved gender parity with technical officials for both disciplines of the sport, which I think is amazing. So if any of you have influence with your international federations, please work with them to achieve that as well. I know they're selecting people and they may have already done it, but at least you can look forward to LA and, tr and try and build up those numbers. So some of the things that we can do, and that's in our NOCs, can achieve gender parity through our work in our islands, with our NOCs, with our commissions that we have back home, with the committees, standing committees, advisory committees, all achieve, just start to think we need some women if we haven't got them. We need some gender parity. Um, we don't want to take over the world. We want to share it with everyone. And men and women working together can make a difference. Now, as part of our 20-year celebration, we thought it was appropriate to give an award and we've called it the ACE Award, which is the Active Champion of Equity Award. And thank you for those, all those who nominated. And again, you can nominate men or women. The nominations must come from the NOC or from the member sports of OSFO. And um, we ended up with four really great finalists and a selection panel finally made the decision of one. And that person is Yvonne Mullins, from, who was nominated by Oceana Athletics. <laughs> Yvonne is, has had a lot of experience. She's worked with a lot of you. Um, she's had very strong leadership roles. She's had a lot of mentoring roles and her efforts to change culture, particularly in changing gender equity and getting that embedded in policies and in procedures, just especially at the decision-making level, has been quite exceptional. She's presented, made presentations. I think one of the, the things that really um, I find amazing is that at the recent Solomon Island Pacific Games, she was looking after the TIC call room and presentation area and she achieved 100% women running all of that. So <laughs> you have to let some men in next time. <laughs> so her enthusiasm and leadership within the sport has just made a huge difference. To, I know to many of you because she's worked with you. Um, she does a power of work in Australia as well. And I think over the years, her advocacy and challenging you all to achieve gender equity just made her a wonderful inaugural um, winner. And I'd like to ask Dr. Robin Mitchell to present this award, please. Better than me.
Benaka. Thank you all and um, look forward to increasing our numbers and seeing some more safeguarding workshops. So you've got some work to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Liz and Helen, for the extensive report and the work that you've been doing uh, in our region. Uh, we're moving on to Education Commission. Uh, Jim Tobin, you have the floor. ONAC Education Commission update. The outline. Thank you. This is today's outline. Introduction. The purpose of the ONAC Education Commission is to advise and provide strategic direction to the ONAC Executive on all sport, training, and education matters within the Oceania region. The Commission guides the work of ONOC's flagship program, the Oceania Sport Education Program, OSEP. The Commission's work is guided by its Terms of Reference, TOR. For more, informa for more information, there's a thorough report in the 2023 ONOC Annual Report. Commission members, we have 13 members. We have a big commission. We have three members representing ONOC's NOCs, Melanesia, Polynesia, Micronesia. We have two members rep representing other ONOC's, ONOC commissions, Athletes Commission and Equity Commission. Two members representing OSFO for team sport and individual sport. And five members representing ONOC's regional partners, University of South Pacific, Team Up, Pacific Island Forum, Secretariat of the Pacific Community, and Physical Education. Commission meeting. The Commission had two meetings last year. For the first time since COVID, an in-person meeting in January and a virtual one in October. Another in-person meeting was held last month in Nandi. The facilitators for all meetings were Melly, OSEP Chief Sport Education Program Officer in 2023. And this year, last month, was Vara, Acting OSEP Chief Sport Education Program Officer. The January 2023 meeting looked at the approval of the Commission budget for 2023, the OSEP implementation budget for 2023, as well as the fourth quarter 2022 OSEP technical and financial report. Both in-person meetings in 2023 and 2024 were two-day long meetings held in Nandi, with the first day being a day-long ONOC management orientation program with all the ONOC team leaders making presentations. 10 terms of 10, 10 TOR roles. In 2023, the commission established 10 subcommittees for the 10 TOR roles to review and make recommendations. This slide is the first of the five roles, one to five, and the subcommittee members from the commission and from OSEP staff. Next, please. And these are the, from six to 10, the other roles and the subcommittee members for those roles. Okay, next slide. Commission terms of reference. This shows you a better view of the 10 terms of reference roles that were developed. And from that, we decided to select four to give to the ONOC executive board. Okay, this is, a, I know it's a big document. Uh, in January 24, the Commission submitted four recommendations for consideration at the ONOC Executive Board meeting and received ONOC EB approval. The four were, which have the red around them, borders. Number two, advocate for quality physical education in the Pacific Island schools. Number six, monitor and evaluate training and education matters according to the ONOC strategic plan. Number eight, assist with the compliance to national and regional sport accreditation. And finally, number nine, 
support the alignment to regional and international sport qualifications. Okay, Education Commission approvals. In February 2024, in our meeting, we looked at approving the 2024 Commission budget and technical and financial reports, as well as the Commission's recommendations that were approved by the ONLOC Executive Board and thus in, are starting to implement these four recommendations by commission members and OSEF staff. Acknowledgements. Firstly, I, I would like to acknowledge our commission members. All of us are volunteers. The Education commis Commission members have demonstrated exceptional dedication and expertise throughout the year collaborating tirelessly to advance the Commission's objectives and provide recommendations to the ONOC Executive. Secondly, I'd like to acknowledge the IOC, President Bach, and Olympic Solidarity, and the support from ONOC President Dr. Robin Mitchell, Vice President Bucklai Temengil, Secretary Ricardo Blas, and the ONOC exec Executive. Finally, I acknowledge the work of the OSEP regional and national staff a special thank you to Melly, OSEP Chief Sport Education Program Officer from 2022 to 2023, who worked closely with the Education Commission, demonstrating outstanding professionalism, expertise, and unwavering support. We wish you the best as you return to your substantive role as ONOC's Chief Administrative Officer. And to and Vinaka to Vara, the new acting OSEP Chief Sport Education Officer, and also Anna, Master Joe, and Mauricia. Congratulations. Special recognition to Melly with his graduation from Memos 25 last year. Melly, please stand up. We all put our hands together uh, 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 congratulating you on this outstanding achievement. His memos project was titled Relationship Building Between NOCs and Governments in Oceania. Let's give him a hand again, please. <laughs> that concludes the ONOC Education Commission update. Back to you, Dr. Mitchell. Thank you, Vinaka. Thank you very much, uh, Jim, and your commission for the extensive work that uh, you've candid, uh, carried out over the, the last few years. Uh, the program is really extended uh, uh, throughout the whole region, and the main aim was really to train locals within the countries uh, to deliver the programs because of the increasing cost of travel between the island countries. Uh, are there any questions of uh, Jim of his presentation? No? Thank you very much, Jim, and your committee. There's no um, questions, so we'll move on to the next presentation. Um, call Baklai uh, Temengel to report on the International Relations Commission, and she'll also um, speak on the Sustainability Commission uh, report as well. Uh, Chairman Marcus Stevens is currently uh, in a hospital facility. He swallowed a fishbone, which uh, uh, is quite a big one, but it's an un unusual position in the sense that it spears the windpipe rather than the esophagus. So he's had a CT scan, which we've seen a copy of it, and we wish him quick recovery or recovery of the bone anyway. Uh, outside. So, Bakla, you have the floor. Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Oh, thank you, Dr. Mitchell, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, if I may, uh, President Mitchell, just uh, really recognize our friends and partners again. Uh, the International uh, uh, Relations Commission 
uh, would not do the things that we're supposed to be doing in terms of our strategy uh, moving forward um, in sports development and sports, sports development. So let me just uh, recognize again the president of the Olympic Committee, uh, President Thomas Bach, uh, the International Paralympic Committee President uh, Andrew Parsons, Kanila Lindbergh, IOC and ANAC General Secretary General, of course, Dr. Mitchell, IOC member, uh, Mr. Blas, our Secretary General, the ONAC Executive Board, the IOC members, all the ONAC commissions, the NOC's President and Secretary Generals, Mr. Kevin Kaspar, the IOC Honorary Member and President of ASFO, and our former President of the uh, ONAC, uh, Mr. James McLeod, Director of Olympic Solidarity and NOC Relations, uh, Olympic Solidarity Staff, uh, Mr. Vidya Lakan, President of the Pacific Games Council. Mr. Paul Bird, President of Oceania Paralympic uh, Committee. Uh, Mr. Hugh Graham, Graham uh, Vice President of the Commonwealth Games Federation. Representatives of regional sports federations. Representatives of various universities from Australia and New Zealand. National universities from the respective nations of the Pacific. ONAC partners and friends of the sport in the Pacific. I would like to recognize again all of you and welcome all of you because many of you have been participating in many of our meetings, uh, particularly in the past uh, two days of the Step Up Oceania um, uh, V2. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to present to you uh, what has been um, uh, the activities of our uh, um, the commission since, uh, uh, since its inception in 2018, uh, we have been continuing to accelerate the responsibility of where sport can have a space and a voice and a bird's eye view in, um, in everything that's happening around Oceania. And this was really highlighted by our president uh, of the International Olympic Committee, President Bach, this morning. Sport is not just uh, getting all of our uh, youth and our Oceania to the Paris Olympic Games and the 2028 LA Games and the Brisbane 2032 game, but accelerating the responsibilities of where sport can play a, play a much more a critical role in a vision that's present in all of our development in our region. So we're very happy that through the, uh, the vision and the strategy of ONAC, and particularly with the Olympic movement, we are able to work together in this uh, platform. The commission membership, of course, uh, with your ONAC vice president as chair. We are very happy that uh, the University of the South Pacific is also a member with Dr. Panga because it's important for uh, our alignment to uh, work with our existing institutions, particularly in the education platform. Uh, we have Mati Yuva, who's a Samoa, from Samoa National Olympic Committee. And we welcome Kayla Whitelock, who's the ONAC uh, Athletes Commission representative from New Zealand uh, uh, that's uh, coming on board and uh, participated and was present in our meeting uh, yesterday. I also would like to uh, just acknowledge our outgoing commission member, Mr. Penisoni uh, Naupotu, for engagement advisor at the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat and of course, uh, Ken Wallace, our outgoing Athletes uh, Commission representative. It's very important to also have uh, uh, the presence of Mr. Penisoni was quite uh, a good adding value to our uh, response to many of the, uh, our partnership with our government at the regional level and at the national level where we can have the presence of sport uh, in uh, regional uh, par policies and uh, reporting as well. Um, for this year, I would like to just uh, highlight some of the activities that's been done, particularly uh, in the Step Up Oceania 2.0 uh, during this past week, uh, this past last days. Uh, our commission continued to advocate for the role of sport in advancing sustainable development during the Step Up Oceania this week. The Step Up uh, Oceania outcome is available for everyone and all the contributions from our NOCs and partners are most valuable to help steer our journey in sports, development and sports for development. 
if I may highlight the panel session that captured very valuable insights from IOC member and Olympism 365 chair, Avita Ripila from PNG, Dr. Susie Schuster from the Senior Lecturer in Health and Physical Education at the Na National University of Samoa, Mike Armstrong, Head of Social Responsibility at the Oceania Football Confederation, and Barbara Swizer, Senior Manager from the IOC Olympism 365. And this um, panel was steered by our facilitator, none other than Matalita, who's an Olympian and member of the ONAX Athletes Commission. These interventions built on the Oceania Sport and Sustainable Development Goals Strategic Partners Forum that was hosted last year in April by ONAC, the International Olympic Committee IOC, the Olympic Solidarity, in conjunction with the Pacific Regional Sports Task Force, the engagement report from the forum capturing a summary of the dialogue and a consolidated list of the follow-up actions. Our report in the ONAC uh, annual report includes an overview of activities that contribute towards strengthening sports-related research through the Pacific Regional Sports, research and scholarships co-funded by the University of the South Pacific and ONAC, and celebrating and reviewing traditional sports and games during the Olympic Day. Olympic Day. But today, I would like to focus on our engagement in regional and international policy dialogues to raise the voice of sport in Oceania. At the regional level, the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific con Continent was adopted by forum leaders in 2022. And in November, leaders endorsed the first phase of the implementation plan. Through this uh, regional consultation processes and written submissions from ONAC, the strategy includes specific reference to sport under the people-centered development thematic area, an original collective action to strengthen sport diplomacy, partnerships, and leverage major sport events to maximize the contribution of sport towards specific regionalism. As just chair for the as a chair for the Pacific Regional Task Force, I also provided a progress report and presented an update at the 2023 Pacific Island Sports Ministers Meeting in Honiara. And afterwards, we delivered an intervention on the IOC Olympism 365 Commission on the topic of enhancing reach and impact through collective action. In June last year, the International Conference of Ministers and Senior officer Officers responsible for physical education and sports, MINEPS, took place in Bagu, Azerbaijan. We thank the senior officials from Kiribati and Nauru who attended the MINEPS and delivered the country statement within the formal proceedings. ONAC was represented at MINEPS and delivered an observer statement to highlight the regional progress to advance sport, physical activity, and physical education through the Regional Sports Task Force. The UNESCO Fit for Life flagship program was adopted at MINEPS 7 and is a global platform for new partnerships and collaboration with member states, observers, and sporting colleagues and friends to deliver targeted action to advance people-centered development while leaving no, no one behind. In support of the Fit for Life Alliance, the Pacific Regional Sport Task Force joined UNESCO's Fit for Life Alliance Global Coalition in pursuit of the systematic use of support, use of sport to build more inclusive and peaceful societies. ONAC pledge during the MINEPS B1, ONAC made a formal pledge to leverage the 17 National Olympic Committees and associate members across Oceania to key actions, including data collections, capacity building, and advocacy contributing to support the Fit for Life Digital Hub. <laughs> the need to collaborate on ONAC's commission to advance Fit for Life for Life initiatives through the Olympic movement in Oceania, maximize sustainable legacies with our regional partners, sub-regional sports events, uh, including the Pacific Games, mini games, and collaborating with many of you here in the room today. 
A further pledge was made on behalf of the Pacific Regional Task Force uh, to align regional actions to harmonize approaches, data, collective, drive targeted investment, and connect with key stakeholders. In closing, Dr. Mitchell, esteemed guests and dear colleagues, sport is an important enabler of sustainable development and a cross-cutting policy area in the Pacific. Together, we have a great potential to harness the regional mechanism and collective action to create lasting change for our Pacific people in physical activity and physical education and sport. Strategic partnerships and importantly, strategic action will define the next decade for sport in Oceania as collective efforts ramp up as we head into Paris 2024 and to LA in 2028 and toward Brisbane 2032 and beyond. The commission looks forward to working with all of you to translate these possibilities into tangible and sustainable legacies that we define and transform our region in the decades to come. Binaka, Kokmal Masulang Rogui, thank you very much, everyone. And now, if I may uh, continue to just give you a brief update from the ONAC Sustainable Commission uh, report uh, on behalf of the chair, uh, Marcus Steven, uh, just to highlight the commission of the Sustainability Commission uh, started, uh, it's fairly new, and we had our first meeting uh, uh, last year in uh, our ONAC meetings at Brisbane. And the commission is really dedicated to realizing a vision of sustainability in partnership with the International Olympic Committee, National Olympic Committees, and strategic allies across the region. Established with the endorsement of the ONAC executive, the commission is charged with formulating ONAC sustainability action plan through collaborative initiatives and strategic, strategic alliance. If I may just recognize the commission memberships uh, with the chair, Marcus Stevens, Avita Rapila, Sarah Walker, Nicholas McDermott from Kiribati, Martin Rara Solomon, Terry Sasser, Marshall Islands, uh, Pepe Tua, Latasi, Tuvalu, and Makarita Lenoa, Fiji, and Lua Rikis from uh, PNG, and ONAC AC member. Uh, the commission meets uh, twice a year, and we had a meeting yesterday where the members um, look at the terms of reference uh, to finalize the terms of reference to send it to uh, the executive board, and also look at the Pacific Strategy uh, Action Plan for sustainable uh, strategies in the Oceania Strategy Plan. Let me just highlight the help of Barbara and Sane. They were uh, joining us in that meeting uh, to really uh, making contributions to, to those uh, 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 regional documents that we can present to the board and then present to the National Olympic Committees and, and make things uh, happen in moving forward. And as the president said, uh, President Buck, uh, uh, we are moving toward change or be changed. Thank you so much for the opportunity, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Baklai, for uh, presenting the reports on the, the two commissions, International Relations uh, and Sustainability Commission. We now on to the last item before we break for lunch, and this is to recognize the um, and uh, present the ONOC Merit Awards. I'll ask uh, Meli, uh, we'll read the, the first uh, uh, award, which will not be pre presented today, but it'll be presented next year. The person who is being um, recognized had had to go back home yesterday to New Zealand uh, for family uh, interests, put it that way. Millie. Thank you, Chair. Dr. Robin Mitchell. NOC delegates, ladies and gentlemen, the first recipient of the ONOC Merit Award is up on your screen, Mrs. Jill Gamming. Round of applause, please. <laughs> Jill's background is in education, and especially in the design, management, and evaluation 
of hockey coach and official education and development frameworks, both regionally and internationally. She sits on the International Hockey Federation Education Commission, Committee rather, and the International Hockey Federation Empowerment and Engagement Panel. Currently, she is the Oceania Hockey Federation Development Officer with the responsibility for the Team Up Sport for Development Program, Hooking for Health across three member countries. Jill serves as a mentor and a role model for aspiring sports officials, generously sharing her knowledge and experience to help develop the next generation of referees and umpires. She is committed to upholding the values of fair play, respect and teamwork in sports, instilling these principles in all that she interacts with. She has been involved with the Oceania Sport Education Program, or OSEP, from its inception as one of the two representatives of OSFO and sits on the ONOC Education Commission, as we saw earlier on. Jill is instrumental in and has made significant contributions in the ONOC Education Commission working group, working groups rather, particularly in strategic partnerships, sourcing new training and funding partners, and alignment to regional and international sport qualifications. OSAP has made a significant achievement in building capacity and capabilities across the Pacific, and she has been an instrumental part of the collaboration between OSAP and OSFO to ensure that all Oceania athletes are able to thrive and perform in a positive environment. Her vast knowledge, experience, and skills as a former educator and sport official have been evident in her contributions and work with the ONOC Education Commission. Jill's exceptional achievements in, and unwavering dedication to education and sports officiating has earned her the prestigious award. She embodies the very best of what it means to be an educator, a sport official, a mentor, and a leader in both the academic and athletic arenas, having an indelible mark on all those fortunate enough to have crossed paths with her. Finally, let's celebrate and honor Jill for her remarkable contributions and enduring legacy in sport education, shaping the minds of our entourage and athletes, and upholding the spirit of sportsmanship in our communities. Our next uh, Merit Award recipient, Today we gather to honor and celebrate an exceptional individual who has dedicated her career to the advancement, getting emotional here, oops, of clean sport in the Oceania region. It is with great pride and admiration that we recognize Natania Potoi for her outstanding contributions and unwavering commitment to promoting fair play and integrity in sport. Natania is not just a name on paper, she is a beacon of light in the world of anti-doping efforts. With almost two decades of experience in spearheading innovative, culturally sensitive, and athlete-focused anti-doping programs, Natania has demonstrated unparalleled dedication and passion to the hard work she has done throughout the Pacific. Today, as Natania Portoy, a fellow Momosian, receives the well-deserved merit award, let us not only applaud her accomplishments, but also reaffirm our commitment to upholding the principles of fair play and integrity in sport. Natania's dedication and passion serves as an inspiration to all of us, reminding us of the importance of working together to create a playing, rather a level playing field for athletes around the world. Having served in the role of Executive Director for Oceania Rado, or, regional anti or Oceania Regional Anti-Doping Organization, for 16 years, from 2004 to 2020, rather to 2020, Natania has moved on to working closer with athletes. She is with an organization called Pacific Rugby Players, serving as the player development manager. Please join me in congratulating Natania Potoy for her outstanding achievements and unwavering commitment to clean sport in Oceania. Can I also please uh, ask President Buck to present the Merit Award to our second recipient, Natania Potoy.
sorry, uh, second last one, that the presentation to Natania. Congratulations from your former uh, employees at uh, ONOC since 19, whatever it was. Uh, Buckley just has another addendum before we break for lunch. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Um, I just wanted to make sure to uh, recognize that uh, international relations and all of us, we have to have that those people beh behind us and keeping the wheel uh, moving forward. So I just want to recognize also our implementing partners, Jackie Love from Sports Matters uh, and Atma, who have been working so hard uh, in making sure that uh, all our meetings are done well and all of our partners are collaborating. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Buckley. Uh, Melly, just to confirm before we break, lunch is where? Okay. Hand signal's not working. Thank you, Rick. It's Island 619, out the door to the left, right to the far end. All right, thank you. Um, as we're falling behind on time and Earlier, uh, Dr. Mitchell did want to try to finish by 12. Um, I was more shooting by two, so in the interest of time, if we can uh, commit ourselves to our 30-minute 30, uh, 30 lunch, and then we come back so that we can close and then come back for the evening and show the wild side of Oceania. Thank you. So be back by 1.30, 1.30, thank you.
Thank you. Are you good? Christine, can you please take a quick photo of us? Oh, okay. Is that okay? Please. Yeah. Is that one here? Set. Yeah. Set. 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 I just leave this here yeah, or yeah. I take it back? No, no, I take it back. Set, Ma. Thank you. Thank you.
bonjour and hello everyone. Bonjour and hello everyone. We hope you're enjoying sunny Fiji and enjoying the General Assembly so far. On behalf of the entire Paris 2024 team, we are delighted to present this progress report on our preparation for the
All right, can we uh, ask everyone to please take their seats so we can uh, finish up on uh, ONOC business? Thank you. Uh, can we get the doors closed there? All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, I'd like to call on the President of the International Paralympic Committee to uh, present to the, to the Assembly. Um, thank you, Andrew, for uh, coming back to the region again. And um, I see you have acclimatized quite well uh, in the Sulu. But, uh, we really appreciate what you've been doing the OPC meetings as well as working with uh, ONOC. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. President, President Ba, my dear colleague and friend. Good to see you here in this part of the world. President Michio, Dr. Robbie Michio. Also, my colleagues at the IOC. John Coates, Gunilla Lindbergh, Ovita, Sora, Baclay, Secretary General Blas, ONOC Board, IOC Administration, NOC Presidents and SecGen's Associated Members, our team from the Paralympic World, Paul Bird, President of the Oceania Paralympic Committee, the members of the o Oceania Paralympic Committee Board, Dwayne Kale, IPC Vice President, who is from this region, from New Zealand, and the National Paralympic Committees. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, coming right after lunch is a challenge, I know that, so I will try to entertain you with a quick story. Uh, and it goes to 1984, the Los Angeles Olympic Games. And I remember that I was watching the 800 meters event in athletics, and I'm Brazilian, by the way, and then there was a Brazilian athlete called Joaquin Cruz, he won the gold medal in that race, and uh, I was seven years old. I looked to my mother, and she was crying. And I said, why are you crying? The Brazilian athlete just won the gold medal. You should not be crying. And she was really emotional, and she said to me what that gold medal represented to him because of his journey from coming from a very poor community to become an Olympic champion. So at that moment, I understood that sport is more than just, just gold, silver, and bronze. Later that year, I was given a book by my father about all the countries in the world with pictures, maps, the history, uh, some characteristics. And I do remember that by reading that book, one particular country caught my attention. It was Nauru. And I spent years of my life thinking I would like to move and live in Nauru. I could tell my friends, how, uh, how many square meters Nauru had, the population uh, of Nauru, and also what their economics more was based on. So I became a kind of a honorary ambassador of Nauru in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, but this is just to say that really early, early days in, uh, when I was really young, I understood what sport could do for people. 
and also that the Pacific region was in my dreams because for a couple of years I kept telling to my parents, I'm, one day I will be living in Nauru. So being here is very magical to me, it's very special, and to be wearing this Sulu uh, makes me try to blend with you because 40 years ago I wanted to be one of you here in this part of the world. Now I got your attention apparently, so thank you, thank you. It's a good story, eh? Two good stories. The Olympic Charter defines Olympism as a philosophy of life. Uh, it, brings, it brings together uh, physical activity, uh, the balance between the mind, the body, and the will. In the same way, the Paralympic movement is not only a sport movement. The Paralympic movement is, again, is more than just gold, silver, and bronze. It's about changing lives of people through sport. It's about a more inclusive world through para-sport. So it's not only about the 4,400 athletes living in the Paralympic Village, it's about the 1.2 billion persons with disability living in the four corners of the world. But what is important is what these 4,400 athletes, they do, they impact the world through what they do in the field of play. And this is what the Paralympic movement is about. So there is no identity crisis here. We are a elite sport organization, but we are also an organization that tries to change the world using sport. And it's because it's sport that the impact is so big. The Paralympic Games is the only global event or only event of global impact that puts persons with disabilities center stage. If you think in politics, culture, economy, art, no, it's the sport event, the Paralympic Games, that puts persons with disabilities center stage and impacts more than four billion people through broadcasting, uh, again, in the four corners of the world. But in order to do that, we need partners. And I was always an enthusiast of the partnership between the Olympic and the Paralympic movement. To the point that when I was president of the Americas Paralympic Committee, which is the regional governing body in the Paralympic world, uh, we had the, for the first time regional games organized back to back the able body competition and the para competition. It was the Pan American Games and the Para Pan American Games, Rio 2007. And now we have regional games well-established, organized back-to-back, -back, like the Asian Games and the Asian Para Games, and again, the Pan Ams and the Para Pan Ams. And while the first agreement between the IOC and the IPC was signed in 2001, I do believe, President Ba, that the two of us, we started a new chapter when we signed that agreement in the Pyeongchang Paralympic Games in 2018. Because the previous agreements, they were more focused, or they were only focused on the games. And it was incredible to have those agreements at that time. But the agreement that we signed in 2018 was more. It was about the partnership between two organizations and partnership about two movements. And this partnership goes until 2032, and I hope we will renew, 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 or take this partnership to another level. We just witnessed here the signing of an MOU between the Oceania Paralympic Committee and ONOC. And Dr. Michio again, Robin, thank you very much, because by coming to this part of the world, by coming to, I remember being here in, the same, uh, in the, the same event five years ago, and what we have seen is that the relationship is stronger and stronger between the Olympic movement of Oceania and the Paralympic movement of Oceania. Thanks to both presidents, I would say, uh, Dr. Robin and Paul Bird. By the way, Paul Bird just got the Paralympic order uh, a couple of months ago in recognition for what he has been doing in the Oceania region for the last 40 years, can I say? Can I say 40 years? People understand how old you are? Okay. <laughs> so I want to thank the NOCs who have already embraced Paralympic sport here in Oceania. Uh, and some of them are becoming NPCs at the same time, and it is great to see and it's great to see the enthusiasm. I would like to urge those who have not yet uh, opened your arms to the Paralympic sport in your countries that you could do so, you know, Poe is here, uh, traveling through the islands and uh, different countries here in the region, and for sure, he will be able to help you to support parrot sport initiatives in your country, in your island, uh, in any part of Oceania. I also would like to congratulate OSFO for stepping up and accepting the Oceania Paralympic Committee as a member. Uh, normally we talk about the NPCs, but also the regional Sport organizations, the regional bodies of the international federations are absolutely fundamental to develop uh, opportunities 
for persons with disability, for athletes with disability, and in Oceania, it's no different. It's no different. I would like just to finish to speak about Brisbane 2032, because, and President Bach could not agree more with you, and these games, they will be the games of the future, but more than that, they are not only the games for Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. Sorry, Aussies, but this is the game for Oceania. This will be the Oceania games. And while we would like to see the 17 uh, flags of the NPCs, because we don't have NPCs, National Paralympic Committees, in all the countries of Oceania yet, and our ambition is to see that in the opening ceremony of the Paralympics in Brisbane, to me, it's more important that we take advantage of Brisbane 2032, of that opportunity, and we have the 17 flags at the opening ceremony of the Paralympics in 2032, but more important to see them in 36, 40, 44, meaning that we took the opportunity to really consolidate the Paralympic movement in those countries, that it was just not a one-off in 32 because the games are in this part of the world, and we were able to consolidate NPCs that can and will be able to provide pathways from athletes with disability from grassroots to the elite level. And so to me, Brisbane 2032 is just the beginning of another incredible chapter of Parasport journey in Oceania. Once again, thank you very much for your hospitality. Thank, it's a pleasure being here. Anytime that you call me, I will be here. Next time, maybe Nauru, so I can fulfill my dream <laughs> as a kid to live there, even if it's for a couple of days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, President Andrew. Um, I'm just looking at the Nauru delegation, whether they got uh, all of the appropriate uh, citizenship and uh, pastors so that we can ensure that he keeps coming back to the region. We're moving back to the agenda, and can I call on the OSEP presentation, please? Good afternoon. Sorry. Good afternoon. Thank you. It's, uh, it's an honor to present to you the uh, 2023 OSEP report. As you all know, OSEP is the uh, flagship program for ONOC. Today I will share the, with the membership the activities, the milestones and best practice achievements as well as the challenges and the financials for 2023. OSEP is an innovative uh, Pacific-led sport education program that has transformed and complemented capacity and capability development within the sports sector in the region. It's a 17-year-old program which has grown from its humble beginnings to what it is today. What I have before you on the screen is the OSEP strategy for 2021 to 2024, and this strategy is closely linked to the ONOC 2023 to 2025 strategic plan. Our focus for this quad is to empower, to collaborate, to advance, and to transform. 2023 has been a busy year for OSEP a very busy year in terms of uh, empowering, inspiring, and revolutionizing the Pacific sport workforce. We've delivered a total of 10 trainers refresher course in the region. The 10 refresher courses were for Cook Islands, Samoa, Tonga, FSM, Palau, PNG, Kiribati, Tuvalu, Solomon Islands, and Fiji. So you can imagine how busy it is, it's been for OSEP in 2023. In addition to that, we've also delivered the SEO capacity building workshop. 
This was attended by nine SEOs from the region, two NOC sport development managers, and one NOC secretary general. We also delivered the Regional Master Educator Professional Development Workshop in Fiji. In attendance were Regional Master Educators from Fiji, Guam, PNG, Samoa, Australia, and FSM. Also present in the training was an RME from the Orado program. In addition to those uh, workshops, we also recruited two SEOs from Tonga and Solomon Islands in 2023. In total, 200 trainers were refreshed and relicensed from the 10 uh, refresher courses delivered in the 10 NOCs I had previously uh, mentioned. In terms of collaborating with world-class leaders, we have been collaborating with world-class leaders, particularly in our region. The collaboration and response from NOCs has been positive and encouraging. Thank you to all the NOC leaders for embracing OSEP in country. We have a few government partners that have been strongly advocating for OSEP in the communities. The Fiji Sports Commission, PNG Sport Foundation, and the National Sport Council of the Solomon Islands. The work with SPC has been on the development of sport qualifications. With ESCA Australia, we attended the ESCA conference uh, in November 2023. Out of the attendance at the ESCA conference, we've managed to secure uh, one of the ESCA consultants uh, and trainer to de uh, deliver the strength and conditioning level one ESCA course in Fiji around April this year. We are bringing in uh, members from the region to attend this ESCA level one course, which will be hosted by ONOC OSEP here in Nandi. This is a uh, capacity building, building initiative between ONOC and ESCA. For SMANS Australia, our RMEs have been in attendance at the annual SMANS conference with the intent to strengthen Pacifica sport management research in the region. The work with TMAP has been around the development of sport qualifications on safeguarding Andrew Lepani and Roshika Dell, both from TMAP, have been instrumental um, in the development of the safeguarding unit standard for the full sport admin qualification that's going to be endorsed in May this year. With the OSFO collaboration, Regan Kama from Oceania Athletics, Jill Gemming from Oceania Hockey, and Edwina have all been working hard behind the scenes with OSEP on the well-being project, which we've agreed to take on in 2024 and the new quad. With Oceania Rugby, the trainings delivered in the region with OSEP that we've called the Super Week format is a combination of delivery of World Rugby courses and OSEP courses as well. These uh, Super Weeks are jointly funded by Oceania Rugby with OSEP. And a big thank you to Oceania Rugby for opening up uh, training uh, slots for national federations outside rugby as well to be in attendance. To advance diverse and customized sport qualifications, ONOC OSEP had ad established a team of IAC developers to look into the development of micro qualifications as well as full qualifications. Two weeks ago, we, um, we celebrated at ONOC the um, recognition and the endorsement of the six micro qualifications that now sit on the Pacific Qualifications Framework with SPC. 
The six micro qualifications were for technical coaching and strength and conditioning. In 2023 as well, we developed two full, uh, two full qualifications the Cert 4 in Sport Administration, and the Diploma Level 5 in Sport Management. These uh, two full qualifications will be endorsed in May this year by the uh, stake, uh, sports stakeholders. Overall, the six micro qualifications are part of our regional good, goods, and they play a significant role in showcasing the diversity and richness of sport in Oceania. OSEP delivered a total of 58 courses in 2023. The 58 courses were delivered in 12 NOCs, and I'm proud to say here today that out of the total trained, 43% of those who were trained were women. <laughs> PNG, Fiji, and Solomon Islands recorded the highest numbers in participants reached. Samoa recorded the highest percentage of women trained. The highest number of active trainers were from PNG. Fasanok and Fiji Sports Commission delivered a total of 17 courses, followed by PNG, OC, and NOXI. NOXI was the only NOC that delivered a module from um, the Advanced Sport Management course, which is also known as MOZO. This was specifically delivered to the Solomon Islands 2023 Organizing Committee for the Pacific Games. OSEP also had uh, a lot of challenges in 2023. Staff turnover, NOC engagement, communication. We also had issues with uh, regulatory compliance and technology integration. One of the projects that OSEP is currently working on is, um, is called the Learning Management System that uh, we've partnered with um, USP. At the moment, USP is developing uh, a learning management system where two of our community courses will be delivered online. In terms of our financials, the surplus from 2022 stands at around 112,742, and our grant from Olympic Solidarity was around 500,000. We had a total income of uh, 612,742 to spend in 2023. We managed to uh, spend around 585,000. 161. We still have some uh, funds left to bring on to 2024, hopefully. OSEP has a lot of people to thank for the uh, work done in 2023. And we also would like to acknowledge the individuals and organizations for their contribution and unwavering support during the past year. The IOC's Olympic Solidarity, ONOC President, Secretary, uh, Secretary General, Executive Director, and staff, the ONOC Executive and the Education ONOC Education Commission, the NOC leaders, and your membership, the national federations, our OSEP regional staff, and the NOC support uh, education officers as well as our trainers in the region, the Sport Industry Advisory Committee, the partners, the service providers, and the community at large. We'd like to thank everyone for the collective effort and the partnership that have uh, fueled our achievements for this year. Vinaka Vakalevu. Uh, 
Are there any questions of uh, OSEP, the OSEP program? There doesn't appear to be. And uh, th uh, first of all, can I just add my thanks to all of the NOCs in helping to develop this program, which as you know, it costs a lot just to travel. And by training your own NOC members to deliver the programs both centrally and nationally, uh, it really goes a long way, as you can see from the stats that are being provided. See, more importantly, I think the increasing numbers of women in education of sport uh, is important. And we've had a workshop that, uh, another workshop, a partnership with uh, Team Up UN Women uh, that encourages this with the support of the Pacific Regional Community as well. So, Vinavalevu to the OSEP in the NOCs, uh, support from Australia, and particularly from our grandfather in uh, IOC Solidarity. Grandfather meaning gives most of the money to, o to own up. Thanks, James, and the staff. Yeah. Moving on to Australia, Oceania Australia Foundation, Kevin. Pula Helen, you have the floor. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Bula, and welcome to us, team guests. Um, I'm delighted to present the foundation report, a bit of an update from what you've seen in your annual report. The Foundation has two scholarship programs running now. The first one, which you're probably familiar with, is the US Junior Scholarship Program. And at this stage, we're at two campuses in the US, Neosho College in Kansas and Iowa Lakes in Iowa. We also have an Athletics Business Scholarship uh, on the Griffith at Griffith University sorry, on the Gold Coast in Queensland. This is a new partnership that's been in operation for a couple of years and I will explain a little bit more about both of these programs. So our US Junior College program is a two-year scholarship to a junior college. Junior college is a great opportunity for athletes from the Pacific because it's a good follow-on from year 12 or 13, and it's more of a community environment. So they live on campus, tuition's provided, um, all the accommodation, food, taken to and from competitions, and they have the support of the, uh, um, not only their coach, but also their academic trainers who make sure that they're competing well on field, but also keeping up with their academics. At the end of that, they have the opportunity to go on further to a four-year college and do a bit more. So I've got some stats for you. So, so far, the Foundation's awarded 53 scholarships and we have an equal gender balance. As you can see, 70% have moved on to further education and the others who've returned home are giving back to their home community. I have a couple of stories about a couple of them. So, Rhys uh, from Fiji had a two-year scholarship. He graduated in May of 2023. Reese was on the Dean's list. He competed in triathlon at the Games, the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow. And he had to come home early, but he managed to finish his studies back here and still graduate and to make it onto the Dean's list, which is quite outstanding. So that was ideal. And he did provide a video at our last year's assembly for those of you who were here. And Troy Mabu Sirocco, also Fijian, he uh, started, he got his scholarship in 2019, had just settled on campus and then, of course, COVID struck. So we returned all of our athletes back to their home countries because we were unsure what would the outcomes would be. And he'd elected not to go back for a couple of years once things settled. When he finally went back, he went to Lincoln College, which is where he'd started. And that year, Lincoln College was the first college to run out of funds and close down. So we had to find him a new college. He moved across to Iowa Lakes, which is where Jordan Harris, a 2013 alumni, was the head coach. 
and he graduated in May last year. He's now moved to Ava Maria College in Florida and coach Jordan Harris, our 2013 alumni, is also there as the coach. And another one of our boys from this last year, Philip Canono, he is also at Ava Maria College. Now I could stand up here and talk all the time about what the scholarship does, but I actually have one of our athletes, Cheyenne Rover, who's going to come and we're just going to give you a little bit of information about it. So Cheyenne, please come forward. Can we hear both of us? I'm sure. So, Cheyenne, what was it about the scholarship that encouraged you to apply? Um, hello. <laughs> so, I, I could say that I wanted to experience the um, American student-athlete life, <laughs> but really I was given the opportunity and coming from the islands, it was something that I believed I couldn't give up on. Um, to be able to go over and just experience what being an athlete is like in a different atmosphere, getting access to facilities. Um, and so that's why, that's why I applied for the scholarship. That's wonderful, thank you. Can, can you tell me of any highlight or a highlight of your time while you're in the States? Um, so a highlight, I think one of my biggest highlights um, from being a recipient of the scholarship was that it gave me a stepping stone um, into moving on to Division II um, college. And so with the scholarship, you got two years um, to go through community college and then you finish with an associate's degree. And so after that, trying to transfer your credits to universities back in the Pacific was really hard and almost zero to none would transfer. And so using the scholarship program as a stepping stone to get into um, university where I was able to receive um, a full-time scholarship for both athletics and academic to complete both my bachelor's and my master's after that. So that was a highlight for me. What a fantastic achievement. That's, that is sensational. And what would you say to someone who was considering applying for a scholarship, which we're about to offer our scholarships for 24, what would be your thoughts to, to pass on to them? Um, I would tell athletes not to consider it, but just to do it, <laughs> because it's a once in a lifetime um, opportunity and you... <laughs> yeah, the experience, it, you're surrounded by a community that doesn't, um, is not just for um, athletes, um, holistic well-being, athletically but academically, and so moving on, um, you were able to really balance both academics and athletics, and you had a whole community um, that was supporting that, and so that's what I would tell athletes who were considering <laughs> it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much for your time. <laughs> Now, I'll just give you a little brief update, or Cheyenne just stays here with me in case you have any questions after for her, um, of the Athletic Scholarship at Griffith University. It's a three-year business degree, and we've done this in partnership with Oceania Athletics and Griffith University. The scholarship provides annual return airfares, you've got all the details, and the athletes actually live independently, so the accommodation is provided at Oceania House on the Gold Coast, which is near Oceania Athletics, and they live independently, get their way to and from college, to training, uh, they're provided with a transport card, and they're provided with an allowance so they can manage their own life outside of college, but they are supported with Oceania Athletics being quite close, and the arrangement that we have with Griffith is that they have good support at Griffith University, and Duncan Free has done a lot of work on this, so I'd like to acknowledge him, he's in the room, and also Carolyn. So uh, at the moment we have two recipients. So Adrienne Minagi from Papua New Guinea is our recipient who started last year and she's done outstandingly, competed at the Pacific Games. I, she, all her details are in our annual report. And Braylon Yee from Fiji has just been awarded her scholarship this year. 
and uh, she started, and they're both doing the business, it's a Bachelor of Business degree. Looking to the future, the scholarships are now open and we'd really like you to put forward uh, nominations for the 2024 intake. We will be doing swimming and athletics scholarships this year. Iowa Lakes is back on board. They now have a coach. When Coach Jordan Harris left, there was not sufficient time to um, review athlete nominations before the start of the year, so we deferred till this year. So please encourage your athletes to apply. And we're also about to launch the new foundation website where we'll be building a database of all our recipients and having all the news of our athletes. Thank you very much, Vanaka. Thanks very much, uh, Helen. Are there any questions for Helen on the foundation program? Not a question, just an acknowledgement of what an amazing program this has been. Um, for those of us in the Marshall Islands, we have made good use of this program, and, and we'd like to take ownership for Coach Jordan Harris, the <laughs> alumni who's also helped to coach some of the other recipients. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so Amy. much. Thank you. What is my goal? So right now I work as a teacher, full-time teacher. I do some swim lesson coach and I also serve on the Fiji Athletes Commission. And so my goal after this is to be able to inspire other athletes in the Pacific to take on this really great opportunity. Um, yeah, and to serve my community. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Helen and Cheyenne. Uh, President Gosper, uh, probably if you use the Vanuatu one, it might be easier, unless there's a roving mic somewhere. I think the, there's a question from the President whether he could apply for the, a warm clothes allowance, especially when he's attending freezing ONOC meetings. <laughs> Thank you, President. Uh, I just wanted to add a couple of words. This is a very special Olympic program in this region, and it's a, a combination of mind and body. And uh, together with John Coates about nine years ago at a meeting in Melbourne, for whatever reason I can't remember, Solidarity had some surplus funds. And together we said, we can snap that up and start a scholarship program. And it's essentially been carried by my PA, by, by uh, and whom you've just heard from, and, um, and it's grown. And the strength of it is there's no country in the world like the United States which understands the importance of sport within the varsity community program and every professor or lecturer or teacher in the institutions in America understand the value of success in sport in the athletes in their institutions and the west coast where we've focused on has been perfect for our island youngsters and they haven't let us down their performances without exception have been outstanding and I would just in my final years, commend you and thank Solidarity for supporting us uh, partially with this program because it is a very important initiative and we're very proud of it. Thank you, President. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. The, sorry. I don't think there's any more questions, comments? No. Um, moving on to item C, which is Brisbane 2032 project. Um, who's Atma you're presenting? Yeah. Uh, while Atma's um, moving up to the uh, microphone stand, uh, for the um, ONOC members, uh, there was an omission in my um, 
uh, presentation earlier uh, about the role that DFAT, the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and, and the and the um, MFAT, which is the New Zealand uh, equivalent. Uh, both of these uh, countries are starting to contribute more and more to the development of our Brisbane 2032 program as part of the, the group of 17 that we are. Uh, but not mentioning in the minutes part, which I was uh, uh, should have done, uh, with your approval, I can amend that to reflect that the contribution of DFAT, particularly through TIMA, which will be based in Fiji, when Andrew Lepani finally gets his uh, work permit. Uh, but otherwise, uh, great contributions from both of our big islands uh, to the work of sport. Yeah. Thank you. Atma, over to you. Thank you, Doc. President Bach. President Andrew Parsons, ONOC President Dr. Robin Mitchell, Oceania Paralympic President Paul Bird, OSPO President Yvonne Mullins, Commonwealth Sports Vice President uh, Hugh, Hugh Graham, and also uh, to Craig Phillips, NOC delegates, esteemed, uh, esteemed delegates. It is my pleasure to give you an update on the Brisbane 2032 Home Games Advantage program. A little bit of a background that you are already familiar with, that Brisbane 2032 was declared as a bid from Oceania by the Australian Prime Minister, the Queensland Premier, and the then AOC President, Mr. John Coates. We know that uh, the IOC president, Mr. Bach, in Brisbane in May 2022, or was it 2023, said that Brisbane 2032 will be games for the whole Pacific region. The games, Brisbane 2032 has the potential to make a tangible mark in human legacy for the entire Oceania region. It can provide us with levels of outcomes that we've never seen in this region, not just in sports, but in health, social, and economic benefits as well. We, the Pacific Island nations in New Zealand, want to authentically feel the home nation advantage. So ONOC created this home games advantage and it's leading this program together with the imprimatur of Oceania Paralympic Committee and on behalf of the Pacific Islands and Oceania sports stakeholders. Our crying call is a call to action that 2032 is now. While this was established, the program was established in July 2022, we are at the moment in the second phase, which is an engaged phase, where we're engaging with multiple partners together with the National Olympic Committees, National Paralympic Committees, Oceania Paralympic, everybody is in that phase of engaging with multiple partners to help support their programs, and as we head towards the embed phase towards Los Angeles 2028. The Home Games Advantage objectives are broken up into three different key segments. The key objective is about pathways and performance. We make no apology for that, because at the end of the day, we, that's something that will be easily measurable come 2032. Our secondary objectives is around events and engagement, bringing events to the region, to the islands, and, uh, and being able to uh, create additional pathways through Pacific Games and, and qualification systems and all that. And finally, legacy objectives, which is around capacity development and empowerment, but legacy in the wider sense not just sports, but sustainable development goals as well. We know that the Oceania Paralympics Committee's mission is to making a more inclusive Oceania. We are stronger through working together. At the moment, you have, OPC has 10 members, or is it nine members, nine members, 
right? And four members are expected to be ratified soon. Palau, Nauru, Tuvalu, and Cook Islands, and work is going on uh, through Paul and his team in terms of creating a holistic and integrated approach for some of the countries who wish to, together with the National Olympic Committees. And their goal is, as part of this program, is to have 17 members represented at the Brisbane 2032 Paralympic Games. As a flagship event, we organized a Step Up Oceania conference last year. And this year, in the days leading up to the ONOC General Assembly, the second edition of the Step Up Oceania conference was convened here in Nandi. Over two and a half days of deliberations, the conference proved to be a powerful vehicle for engagement connecting National Olympic Committees with many stakeholders from sports federations, governments, universities, and civil society. The session opened and closed with, a very strong, with very strong voices from athletes sharing their stories and their journeys on the road to Paris qualifications and beyond. With blended examples of good practice in high performance and using sport-based approaches to advance sustainable development. We explored our aspirations towards Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games legacies for Oceania. And finally, finished off with a promising young athlete from Fiji sharing her story and her dreams to represent Fiji at the Brisbane 2032. What a powerful presentation was from 16-year-old Brianna Rambakewa, who received a standing ovation from the whole audience. And given her story that only 11 months ago, she did not even finish in the top eight in her age category in the secondary schools championship in Fiji, went on to compete through the club system and got qualified as the third best athlete from Fiji, arrived in Honiara Pacific Games, won a bronze medal, and last two weeks ago, she won the gold at the Queensland Under-18 Championships. And that just shows that we have not just hidden athletes that we talk about in the Paralympic movement, but also in the total sporting arena whereby we have a lot more athletes that we have to explore and find and, and support. The conference also featured two masterclass sessions that explore two important topics on applying innovations in high performance sport and thriving athletes which focused on how athletes can better balance well-being and high performance. Both masterclasses connected diverse sets of regional stakeholders and produced important strategic actions and a way forward for further strengthening these areas. Going forward, we've now had two editions of this conference. Going forward, my thoughts are that post the Paris Olympic Games, our focus needs to shift to creating a step up per country, a step up Papua New Guinea, a step up Vanuatu, a step up Fiji. So each country can bring their own local based stakeholders in one room and being able to engage and prepare their strategies for 2032. That is very important. If we are going to make a big difference to achieving our primary objectives, secondary objectives, and legacy objectives, then each country needs to have that level of engagement from the government, academic sector, the, the National Olympic Committee, National Paralympic Committee, people from the priority sports, and not just limited to the presidents and secretaries, but wider group of people so that they become the influencers of change. That is very important, and we're working on a framework which we hope to be able to get approved and share with you and, and be able to invite countries who want to take that up. We have also been working very closely, initially with the Queensland University sector, and more recently with the Pacific Islands University sector and New Zealand University sector, to be able to create a university engagement approach to our Brisbane 2032 partnership. We now have three university cohorts, nine Queensland universities, several of, the, several of the universities are in this room, eight Pacific Island universities, 
encompassing one regional university through the University of the South Pacific and seven national universities. And we're working to onboard eight New Zealand universities. We believe that the cake is very large. We have 15 Pacific Island nations plus the seven associate members who could do with a lot of help. If we look at an average of seven to eight national federations, priority national federations for the Olympic Games 2032, then there's about 150 organizations that need help in terms of creating capacities within each organization. So we're working with this university alliance to, in those areas of collaboration so that we can have more scholarships and academic exchanges, enhanced knowledge sharing and capacity building, access to high performance environment and sports science services, learning and teaching to strengthen Pacific sports workforce, and that will particularly be with the university to university uh, alliance, collaborative sports related research and advocacy and innovation. Yesterday we had a full day where we had the University Alliance coming from Queensland and the Pacific Islands coming together for the first time. And this provided an opportunity for dialogue to take the steps for this engagement forward and start navigating on how these partners can chart a course forward to support Oceania's aspirations towards Brisbane 2032. We recognize that there are many steps still ahead of us and will require new ways of working together and new systems to support the sports sector but these strategic efforts are all with the view to strengthening high performance and sustainable development in and for Oceania long after 2032. Of immediate steps that we are taking with the University Alliance is to finalize memorandum of understanding with the different, different uh, cohorts. The master class that was held here and the University Alliance meeting that took place yesterday and already a planned study tour by the Pacific Universities to Queensland has been, is starting to be planned. We were also part of multiple stakeholders. Our stakeholders were part of the Queensland government's legacy planning. And we are pleased, very pleased that the Queensland government's legacy plan aims to deliver sustainable benefits that are experienced locally, regionally, nationally, and across Oceania. And as you heard from Amy Cupert, as part of the presentation, Queensland government's presentation, everything that they're doing includes Oceania, which is an important part of that Games for Oceania concept. And we will also start looking at developing legacy planning and legacy outcomes within each country and collectively as Oceania as part of the Brisbane 2032 program. We were invited we were invited to uh, the Pacific Island Sports Minister's meeting, and uh, we, del we delivered an update on the Home Games Advantage Initiative together in partnership with Oceania Paralympic Committee. It was a two-day meeting. The first day was with the senior government officials, and the second day was with the Pacific Sports Ministers. It was very well received, and we have the support of the Pacific Sports Ministers to be able to escalate the Brisbane 2032 agenda within their own governments and collectively within the region. Their follow-up meetings have been taking place with the leaders of the Pacific Island Forum with the prospect of including this in the leaders' meeting to help build a political will and support amongst the governments of the Pacific. And we'd like to thank Michael Bloomfield, uh, Tonga NOC president, who recently facilitated uh, a high-level meeting with the uh, Tongan government. Conversations are also ongoing with governments in Oceania and drawing, when we are drawing plans that extends beyond Oceania, as well as with regional and national sports federations and high performance centers. Work is also progressing on creating lasting legacy for Oceania towards innovations like long-term Olympic and Paralympic visa into Australia and New Zealand. And this was part of the uh, the conference, we had a presentation from, uh, uh, from University of Queensland who was originally engaged by DFAT to do the original study. And using that data, they are basically helping us pre prepare an ad advocacy paper which will reach out to Australian Olympic Committee and New Zealand Olympic Committee to get it into the right hands in the Australian and New Zealand governments. 
we're also working on creating a host family program that helps create a home away from home for, for the athletes. So this is at the moment in very early stage, but there is a large Pacific diaspora as well as the large Australian community in the Southeast Queensland who are happy to be able to host young athletes and provide a safe and warm home away from home for athletes that may be based there, whether they are athletes or whether they are students as part of the scholarship system. So we are in the process of preparing these plans. Finally, I'd just like to say thank you. Thank you to my uh, working group chair, Mr. Kevin Gosper, Andrew Minogue, and also to ONOC executive, NOCs, OPC, and NPCs, OSFO Regional Federation, Oceania Australia Foundation, and the ONOC events team, and also in particular to Jackie Love, and Lorraine Ma, and Fiona, who's been helping me with the uh, Step Up Oceania, and also to Jackie Love with the, uh, with the program that we're putting together with the university sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Atma. Are there any questions or comments on the uh, Step Up program? No? Well, keep working. <laughs> 2032 is just around the corner. Um, moving on to the International Olympic Committee, uh, agenda item 10, 11, sorry, agenda item 11. I pass the floor to James McLeod. Uh, to cover the first two parts of the topic. Thank you very much, uh, Robin. Um, Bula to everyone. Uh, Bula. Uh, it's very nice to be here with you uh, this afternoon in Fiji. Hopefully you're all still awake and we, I'm going to go into a few more details with my colleagues uh, on some of the agenda items that have already been covered, but we wanted to give you a bit more details on that. So I'd just like to also say a huge thank you to ONOC uh, President, uh, Secretary General, the ONOC staff, uh, but also you, the NOCs, for making the team so welcome here over the last few days. I know you've had six very intense days of meetings, including uh, meetings around uh, the Paris Games, Olympic Solidarity, uh, and Olympism 365. So I'd just like a shout out on behalf of my colleagues, uh, Sheila, Barbara, uh, Sinead, Delian, uh, for the warm welcome that you gave them uh, while we weren't here. Um, today we're gonna just give you a bit of an update, as I said, on some of the priorities for the IOC um, at this exact time. Uh, with only a four months before Paris. As you can imagine, a lot of it is, is based on that. And then Barbara uh, will give you an update on Olympism 365 um, and Sheila on Olympic solidarity. First of all, just like to say a huge congratulations to the Solomon Islands for hosting such an amazing Pacific Games. Uh, currently, uh, there was 12 athletes that were qualified directly for Paris at those games. Um, and at the moment, we have 531 athletes from Oceania that have qualified for Paris. So congratulations to all your teams for that. <laughs> and I'd also like to just uh, wish uh, our colleagues from the Marshall Islands a lot of uh, good luck for your preparations for the Micronesian Games that are coming up in a couple of months' time. Not the best timing, I know, for you, uh, but uh, good luck with those games as well. Um, as the President mentioned earlier, uh, last week the IOC Executive Board met uh, to discuss a lot of uh, matters. Uh, there was updates from the organizing committees uh, of Paris, Milan, Cortina, uh, Los Angeles, Brisbane, but also the Youth Olympic Games in Dakar, and I'll give you a bit of an update on what is happening there. Um, but there was also updates on various matters linked to Olympic Agenda 2020 plus 5, uh, such as an update from the Human Rights Advisory Committee uh, on eSports, on the Olympic Qualifier Series, um, but also on safeguarding that Liz uh, mentioned in her report. Um, all very positive updates. Uh, but as the President also said, uh, there was a lot of, of attention focused on digital engagement, but also uh, AI and the future of AI. And that is something that we'll be looking uh, to work on with you as NOCs and start engaging with you as the NOC community in the next few months and indeed in 2025. 
Um, there was also an update on the individual neutral athletes um, with a Russian or a Belarusian passport, and an update was given to the executive board on the IOC, ex uh, IOC's position there. Um, there are currently 12 uh, athletes with a Russian passport and uh, seven athletes with a Belarusian passport that have qualified uh, for the Olympic Games in Paris. <coughs> That being said, the executive board decided uh, to set up an eligibility review panel to make sure that those athletes uh, fulfill the criteria they, that the executive board had already put in place relating to their non-support uh, of, the, of the war or the military contact, uh, contacts uh, or contracts that they may have. And that eligibility uh, panel will start its work imminently to be able to review each of the athletes that has qualified for the Games and decide whether they would receive an invitation for the Games. The EB also looked at the opening ceremony and the participation of any eventual AIN athletes in the Games in Paris. Um, and there was a decision not to allow AIN athletes to parade in the delegation parade at the beginning, but at least to have an experience of the Games uh, and uh, the open ex opening ceremony itself. Um, so we've been working very closely uh, with our colleagues in Paris uh, on that. The president also mentioned the declaration by the IOC against the politicization of sport, and I'd like to just go into a bit more detail on that. Um, this links specifically to uh, some movements of the Russian government to set up games uh, in Russia. Um, that, for example, one that has just taken place, which is the Games of the Future. Um, there is a lot of discussion at the moment about future games such as the games, uh, the friendship games that would happen after the Olympic Games in Paris or al also the BRICS games. Now these are government-led initiatives. Uh, the Russian Olympic Committee is not involved in them but there is a lot of movement uh, from the diplomatic cause uh, across the world to be able to talk with the different countries, with the different international federations about how to organize these games. The statement that the IOC, IOC made was very clear in relation to the fact that we believe that the politicization of games and having games that are based on a political nature rather than allowing all athletes from across the world to participate regardless of their political uh, affiliations uh, is not something that we, sh we should uh, support. And that's why uh, the IOC strongly encouraged that any stakeholders of the Olympic movement uh, not to support the, the, these games. Now, that sounds all uh, very ominous we're not worried about these games from that point of view, but what we're worried about is your athletes. Uh, WADA has also come out and said that these games are not sanctioned by them, meaning that we have no credibility in terms of the doping control process that would happen. And we also believe that your athletes, should they go there, uh, will obviously be put in a position which will be very difficult for them uh, to not be used as propaganda. So. The urge that we would like to give you today is that if your governments are being approached in this respect, please get in contact with myself or Sheila or anyone uh, at the IOC and we can discuss that with you directly. Boxing was also referenced this morning uh, by the IOC president. Um, as you remember, for the Games in Tokyo, uh, but also now for Paris, the IOC has actually put in place a boxing unit to overview oversee the qualification and the competition itself in boxing. And this is because of the non-recognition of the IBA uh, by the IOC. Uh, we wanted to make sure that boxers had a pathway to be able to get to an Olympic uh, qualification, an Olympic tournament, and we believe that that is an important thing. And as such, we put in a lot of effort, again, for the Paris Games uh, to be able to do that. Uh, thank you as well uh, to the Pacific Games Council for allowing the boxing uh, qualification to happen in the Solomon Islands, and that allowed uh, for 12 athletes to qualify directly through the Pacific Games. But there are obviously two, and you can see uh, an athlete there from Samoa and from Australia uh, qual uh, qualifying for, for the Games. And then we have also two world events, one that's just taken part, uh, place in Italy, in which 100 different uh, countries participated and 600 athletes participated. Um, 11 from Oceania, Oceania, but that allowed for a number of athletes to qualify. The final qualification opportunity is going to take place in Bangkok, 
um, and we would urge you to remember to register your athletes yourselves uh, and the deadline for that is on the 1st of April. Now, as the president said, um, and this was discussed in the executive board, uh, this will be the last time that, that process will happen uh, through the IOC. It's important for us to say that we've been able to do this for uh, Tokyo and Paris, uh, but as we've mentioned, uh, boxing is still not confirmed on the LA uh, 2028 uh, sports program for the reasons that we, you all know relating uh, to, to the IBA's non-recognition. Um, the IOC session even discussed this in Mumbai and made it very clear that the, that uh, pathway uh, was something that had to be reviewed on a continuous basis. Now the problem that we have here is obviously that the boxing federations across the world are those that are running boxing in your, in your countries, uh, but also are those uh, that are working with the current leadership in the IBA in some cases. Now this is again a call to action to you as the National Olympic Committees to go back again and have a conversation with your national uh, boxing federations and explain to them very, very clearly now that this is the last time that the IOC will be uh, supporting the boxing route in the way that we have done. We would like boxers to be in future games, but there are governance issues that need to be addressed by your national federations, and so we're asking you to do that. Again, if you have any questions on that, uh, please don't hesitate to come and talk to me uh, or my colleague, uh, Lenny, that you all know very well. Now, moving to the Olympic Games, uh, we've got a number coming up, and as I said at the executive board, there was uh, some updates on that, uh, but I'm just going to kick off with a, a video just to keep keep you awake on the Paris Games because it really is exciting what's coming up. So Games Wide Open is uh, the slogan for Paris 2024, and I think it really represents this openness that the, the Paris uh, as a capital and France as, uh, as, as a country is trying to project. Um, and I know we're very lucky. We'll have Simon, uh, Simon and Marion who are going to give you a bit more details on what is going on there. Um, I hope I didn't steal your video either. So... Um, I was told I wasn't, but um, uh, so for Paris 2024, recently the uh, Paris Coordination Commission met. Uh, it's the last coordination uh, meeting before the Games, and I'm very pleased to say um, that everything is on track, everything is getting ready. Uh, they're in the testing, testing, testing phase, and so the organizing committee is really growing uh, by a huge number of employees every week. The volunteers had their first um, big get-together. I think it was 45,000 volunteers that got together um, uh, in Paris to be able to have that first kickoff. Um, so things are really happening. The, the, the games are being built. All the temporary overlay is going in. So. As a coordination commission, um, we're very confident uh, that things will be going well. Naturally, we're focusing on a number of points uh, at this late, late stage. Uh, the villages, 
Uh, what you can see there is the village in Paris. Uh, the handover of that village happened in February. That means the handover to the organizing committee. And so now they're in there working on all of the overlay uh, and making sure the services for your athletes will be available. Um, we naturally focused as well on the opening ceremony uh, experience, the, 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 the operation that that will be. It will be a very challenging operation. Uh, it's the first time that an opening ceremony for an Olympic Games will happen outside of a stadium, um, and it will be a very exciting one uh, with your athletes being able to uh, view and experience the whole thing from a boat as a parade, um, and then at the Trocadero at the end. Um, we focused on transport, understanding that Paris is, uh, is a city that has very good public transport. And again, I'd like to urge you all to consider that when you're doing your games planning. Uh, think first about using the public transport rather than using uh, the vehicles. It will help everyone. Um, we focused on security. There was uh, updates from the French, uh, French authorities on the security arrangements uh, that would be happening. Um, and then obviously, as I said before, uh, we were looking at the athlete experience itself because this is the moment uh, that an organizing committee really makes sure uh, that the athlete services are going to be up to top, scra uh, top notch. Uh, what that means on our knocknet, on the Paris knocknet as well, you've got all the updated information, the policies, etc. And I know that at the um, at the meeting you had this week uh, with our colleagues from Paris 2024, uh, you were able to look at some of the, these policies. But I really encourage you. Your job, your chef de mission's job, is to make sure that you know every single thing that is happening in Paris, um, so that your athletes uh, have the best experience uh, possible. All of those uh, will be available on the Knocknet uh, should you look, want to look at them further. Another point to uh, highlight here is the Olympic qualifier series because they're coming up very quick uh, soon in May and in June in uh, Shanghai and, and Budapest. You'll remember that this was one of uh, the commitments that the IOC made in Olympic Agenda 2020 plus five to make sure that we had, were looking at sports that had a youth focus, that had an urban focus, and that was how we created the Olympic qualifier series uh, for the sports of uh, BMX freestyle, braking, skateboarding, and sports climbing. Um, for Shanghai, there's already a number of athletes uh, that have registered, and there's 36 of those, again, from Oceania that will be competing in those. Um, this is not the traditional Olympic event. Um, so you can't just rock up there and expect an accreditation. You need to apply for a guest accreditation. It's all at your cost. Uh, if you want to go and experience it, please do. Um, and you've got the contact details, uh, details there. In terms of the Dakar 2026 Youth uh, Olympic uh, Games, um, we're really committed, as you know, to having a really ensuring that the first multi-sports Olympic event in Africa is a success um, in 2026. We are reviewing currently the sports program, and that is something that will be discussed uh, at the later executive board meetings uh, this year to make sure that it's fit for purpose for Dakar, for uh, Senegal, uh, but also for you as the NOCs to make sure that your athletes will have a great time. Um, in terms of LA uh, 2028, uh, as you remember, the sports program has been confirmed. Everything apart from boxing, uh, I referenced what I was saying before, um, but there's the five new sports, as a reminder, the baseball, softball, cricket, flag football, lacrosse, and squash. Uh, that are part of the program, which is very exciting. New sports part of that, but I know a lot of you are probably scratching your heads for some of the sports. If you want uh, additional information from us or the IFs, please get in contact with us uh, because we'll be able to explain to you the, the governance structures as well relating to your uh, executive boards. Um, then Brisbane. Brisbane, I'd just like to say congratulations to Atma and the team just on the presentation before on Step Up. We do strongly encourage you to start thinking that far in advance. You as the National Olympic Committees have got to have plans in place for 2032 already. Uh, I commend, obviously, what ONOC is doing. Uh, the Step Up conference last year that I att we attended in Brisbane really was uh, impressive, but that's the first step. We need to make sure that you as, uh, as NOCs have your own pro programs. And through Olympic Solidarity, and Sheila will explain it, I think, later, uh, the development of national sports structure 
is a program that exists specifically to help you look at your strategic long-term long aims. So we really would encourage you to do that. Now moving to athletes, uh, I'd just like to also say how lucky we are We'll be working with Ken on all of the new uh, programs for athletes. Um, we're looking forward to working with the new ONOC uh, Athlete Commission uh, on areas such as uh, the engagement uh, with your athlete communities. We did that in, in the Solomon Islands where we were able to spend a lot of time with your athletes to explain Olympic solidarity, the Athlete 365 programs, but also manipulation of uh, competitions. Uh, you can see the WADA booth as well. And that is something we will continue doing because we believe that that is important and we'll obviously have a really interesting and exciting athlete 365 area in the Olympic Village in Paris uh, that we would encourage you to make sure that all of your athletes go and more importantly that they vote in the athlete commission um, in the athlete commission elections that will be taking place in Paris now reference was also made very briefly to the uh, athlete commission grants that the Olympic solidarity uh, provides um, I would say there's a bit of a missed opportunity again here. These grants are available to you uh, and we're not seeing as big an uptake as we'd like to see. They're a very easy opportunity for your Athletes Commission uh, to access $10,000 per year over the four-year period. Um, and obviously that is something that you as the NRCs have to make that application and we really would encourage you to do so. There's no real excuse not to do it because you're gonna help your athletes community. Um, so we'd ask you to do that. And then Sarah, I think we'll explain afterwards on the athletes role and responsibilities uh, guidelines uh, that have been set up, again, a high priority for us. Now, near the end for me, uh, the Refugee Olympic team, just some good news we wanted to share with you. As you know, the, the Refugee Olympic team is a team that the IOC has been pu pulling together to shine a spotlight on the plight of over 110 million people worldwide who are forcibly displaced or refugees. Uh, we had a team in Rio and in Tokyo, and we're very pleased to let you know, our team, the refugee team, your team, uh, that two athletes have actually qualified uh, for the Games in Paris, one in boxing, Cindy there, and Kimya in taekwondo. So. That's some positive news uh, uh, relating, relating to that. Um, now, just to finish off, uh, in terms of sustainable development, we've discussed uh, this a lot over the last six days, but also today. Um, and for us at the IOC, uh, the president referenced it, one of the recommendations of Olympic Agenda 2020 plus five uh, recommendation 11 is specifically how uh, sport can be used as this important enabler for the SDGs. Um, that led to the creation of uh, Olympism 365 strategy and we're very privileged and very honored and very happy to have Alvita as the chair of the commission um, in, uh, at the IOC. So thank you Alvita for all of your help on this. Um, but it really is something that's quite exciting. And Barbara will give you a bit of the details of the, uh, of the concrete actions, but just as a reminder uh, what the strategy is and what we're trying to achieve, here's a quick video um, on that. Olympism is a philosophy of life. It celebrates the transformative power of sport for social change, not only during the Olympic Games, but every day, everywhere. The IOC brings this philosophy to life with its Olympism 365 program. By working together across the Olympic movement, with the United Nations and beyond, we are contributing to the sustainable development goals. And sport is our bridge. The world is facing immense challenges. Sport is a low-cost, high-impact response. We enable thousands of safe and inclusive programs to be delivered at grassroots level. Athletes and young people are leading innovative projects, helping communities overcome barriers. Fighting poverty, fighting poor education, empowering girls so they know that they can succeed in life. They can do better. Hundreds of projects worldwide are also offered through the National Olympic Committees, financed through the IOC's Olympic Solidarity Development Program. 
Trained coaches and educators are using sport as a hook back into education to develop young people's transferable skills, to boost their employment opportunities, and to create more peaceful and inclusive communities. I think more teachers should be aware, more parents should be aware of what the importance of sport is and how that sport can really shape their children's future. If they do not know the power of sport, then obviously the kids will not know. We strengthen the capacity of organizations to deliver local initiatives reaching millions of young people. These joint efforts contribute to the global goal of reducing physical inactivity by 15%. We work together with communities, businesses, and policymakers to affect change at every level. Olympism 365 is the catalyst to amplify the impact of sport and Olympism. We invite you to join us to promote these values of excellence, respect, friendship, solidarity and peace together. Because it's only by joining hands that we can truly live our new Olympic motto faster, higher, stronger, together. Thank you, James. Thank you, IOC President, ONOC President, Dr. Mitchell, IOC members, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure for me to present to you some of the concrete actions and partnerships that we have developed over the last year as a result of the Sport and SDG Forum um, at the first Step Up Conference in 2023. The forum, as you know, because many of you have been present, was a great place for inspired and connected dialogue among different stakeholders at the intersection of sport and sustainable development. And partnerships have been key to this dialogue. Connecting sport with non-sports actors, with governments, with civil society, with UN agencies, development banks, regional bodies, just to name a few. It's about creating a real ecosystem. Stop for questions. We go straight. Sheila, please. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Bula Danaka. Uh, thank you to everyone. And just to uh, echo already James' words, to thank you to everyone. And a uh, big thank you to the ONOC executive, IOC members, and uh, the, the team here today. For you, the NOCs, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you again, but I will be going relatively quickly because we've already met several times in the past few days. We were able to review as we're coming to the end of the 2024 Quad Olympic Solidarity Quad Plan, some of the things that we wanted to focus on, the key priorities, and some of the things that we're wanting to achieve by the end of 2024. As you'll see on the screen, these, some of these slides are familiar to you and it was some of the areas that we were touching on across the five different areas that we focus on in Olympic solidarity. I think we are happy to say that over the past few days we were able to discuss what has been happening in 2022 and 2023, knowing that we were not able to meet in 2021, and that there's been a lot of good work around the improved usage of Olympic solidarity funds by you as the National Olympic Committees and working closely with partners to deliver this in a safe, inclusive, and sustainable way going forward and creating stronger collaborations, as already echoed by our colleague Barbara and also mentioned in the previous statements from President Bach and James. We still have some challenges. We're listening to you. We recognize them, and we are looking always carefully at the feedback that you're giving to us through your annual surveys and also that the feedback that you're giving us in person. We continue to find ways as we can to be flexible with you and we appreciate the way that we work together with all of you. And that comes from not just the, those of us here today but everyone at the Olympic Solidarity Offices who really appreciate the way that we're working with you. We, work, we worked through all of the programs that you've been engaging in very well and some of the areas that maybe are still opportunities for you to look at. And with that, I will briefly just touch on some of those. 
for universality. As a reminder, we've spoken to all of you. We just wish that we are able to finish strong with your pro programs being reported on, especially when it comes to the athlete programs, to be timely with your reports, whether it's the scholarship program for Paris or the team support grants. As it relates to entourage, we've seen a very good engagement with technical courses for coaches. We would encourage you to start already thinking, maybe not for this year, but for the Olympic scholarship for coaches to be looking at how you're going to be putting people in place as it relates to step up and the future of nominating good coaches from the region for projects to elevate them to the next level. With the athletes that you're working with going to Paris, please do not forget to talk to them about the opportunities for athlete career transition. And this is the moment to speak to them about that because as they're preparing to have other ideas in mind, not a focus for them obviously if they're going to the games, but to have it in mind that there is opportunities post Olympics to continue to develop and grow. An athlete commission grant, a reminder that has already been echoed so I won't say too much more, but please, please do work with your athlete commissions to uh, put forward applications. I can't say too much in this area on the Continental Athlete Support Grant and Youth Athlete Development because you've all been engaging in these projects very, very well. I would, however, encourage those of you who have not started to work on your development of national sports system, consider looking at how the step up concept and a strategy nationally can already start to be discussed and put in place. We're here to talk to you about those projects, but this is really a timing, even with Paris coming around, start to talk to your national federations about what their vision is, to start to look at the ways that you can put in place some things towards the end of 2024. So you are going to start 2025 to 2028 with good strategies and projects in place, but that have a long-term vision. As mentioned already by James, we're very happy with uh, those of you who are able to support the refugee athlete um, scholarships in the region. Just a recognition that uh, there was some good work in the area around the Secretary General's workshop that was hosted in New Zealand and that uh, we appreciate the work of New Zealand as well as uh, contribution of Australia coming to take part and all of the Secretary Generals there I think benefited enormously and uh, we look forward to continuing on that work with ONOC who already are leading in that area. Just a reminder, Please, please work on your administrative subsidies being submitted for 2023. Um, I'll be mentioning it again, but the deadlines are coming up for 2023. And I think all of you could probably list that because we've talked about it so many times. So um, once you've gotten your 2023 subsidies in, you can apply for your 2024. <laughs> so um, memos deadline is at the end of March for those interested. And the Olympic values, we already spoke with Sinead um, and uh, she shared these deadlines with you, so um, I'll just share the PowerPoint later and it's up on the screen. Uh, safeguarding applications already echoed. Please make sure you're getting those in. I'm not going to read any of this because I think you know it all by heart. So please, please recognize these deadlines are very important for us. And um, ONOC has negotiated on slightly different deadlines for the continental programs, but that will be an ongoing discussion with James and ONOC and Angela, our uh, head of finance. So, um, I don't need to say too much about the subsidies either because your chef de mission, after the excellent workshop with Simon Marion and uh, that was facilitated by ONOC in, in a fantastic fashion, your chef de mission, they know all of these, you know all of these dates and or these programs and the dates or deadlines that are existing. And if you have any questions, our colleague Céline is there to answer uh, and we're also still here to um, reply to any questions you might have. And I would just like to say a big thank you to everyone and I would like to thank also Onok Shivneel for the photographs that I was able to use to make sure that this is a very Oceania presentation. Um, thank you, well thank you very much. Just a few final things from me before over for uh, Q&A. Just on Olympic solidarity, I think 
you no longer have an excuse for not submitting the reports. We've had time with you in the last six, uh, six days. You've got all the information there um, to be able to submit reports, make your applications, and there really are some great opportunities uh, for you and your athletes through the program. We'll also be working uh, with the Olympic Solidarity Commission, obviously, this year to look forward for 25-28. Um, to be able to confirm those programs to the NOCs as early as possible. Um, but we will be organizing next year a series of uh, regional forums across the world specifically linked uh, to giving you the updates on what you can apply for for Olympic solidarity. But also in discussing with the president today, uh, we'll be including a lot of information at that time in exchange on the AI and the impact AI will have on sports. So I think that will be very exciting uh, that we'll be able to do that in, uh, in the regional forums next year. Uh, last thing as well, just uh, something we forgot to mention is that uh, the IOC is now actually an observer member is that the right? <laughs> uh, at the International Union for Con Conservation of Nature. Uh, so what Barbara was explaining to you about um, all of the work we're doing around uh, sus sustainability, we now have that uh, observer member status uh, in that UN organization that allows us really to, to have a voice in what's going on, um, uh, which, it, which is a, a, great, uh, a great advance. So with that, uh, Dr. Mitchell, um, that would be the end of our presentation and available for any questions anyone may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, James, and to the other members of the Solidarity staff. Uh, are there any questions that you haven't asked over the last three or four days with them? Or of James? No? Please work hard on your report so that you can keep getting money before the end of this quad. So all the best to you and thanks to you, James, and the staff. Now the final part of this um, agenda item 11 is uh, any additional IOC members' reports. And if I could start with Ovita, please. Um, thank you, President. Um, a copy of um, the Olympus and 365 Commission update, as well as the Paris Coordination Commission com uh, update has been shared with you. And we've just heard the presentations from um, James and, and Barbara. So I won't um, go through my report in detail, but I just wanted to echo um, the sentiments shared by IOC President Thomas Bach in encouraging the Olympic movement to give back to society and that we must maximize on the unique opportunity to create a Brisbane 2032 home games advantage for Shania uh, to leave uh, tangible legacies on and off the field of play for the benefit of our region and our people. So just to reinforce that message again, I know I did uh, say this at the, the, the two-day step up forum, but I just wanted to, um, to echo those sentiments and, um, and reinforce the message. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Ovita, and then we'll jump right across the, the table to Sarah, Sarah Walker. Thank you, President. Uh, kia ora, Bula. Uh, my written report for the IOC Athletes Commission is in the online files, but I would like to draw your attention and highlight two very important points. Firstly, the Athlete uh, Commission Activity Grant of 10,000 US dollars. In 2023, we had six of the 17 NOCs actually apply for the grant, which went towards things like holding local athletes forums, uh, improving governance knowledge through education of the AC members, as well as many other initiatives. In the current quad, however, uh, from 21 to 24, Oceania NOCs have collectively applied for 18 grants out of a possible 68. That means half a million US dollars of Olympic solidarity funding for athletes has not been utilised in Oceania. <coughs> Secondly, the Athletes Declaration. The implementation guidebook was launched last month and there is a link available in my report. This guide exists to support your NOC in the implementation of the Athletes Declaration. It has base level and next level recommendations for each of the 12 rights listed in the Athlete Rights and Responsibilities Declaration. 
I think you'll be impressed at the level of detail available in it, so please check it out. I realise this is a report, but in regards to the Athlete Commission Activity Grant and the Athletes Declaration, I would like to make a request for you to action these two areas. We know that the NOC support can make a powerful difference in the athlete lives, and any support you can provide will have a positive impact for the people that we're here to represent and are at the heart of what we do, the athletes. Vinaka. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah and uh, Buckley. Thank you, Dr. Michel. The, the IOC Sustainability and Legacy Commission update was uh, pro provided to, uh, with the documents for all the members. So if there's any um, questions, we can discuss uh, on that, the commission report. Otherwise, please read the report. It's, very, uh, it's critical to the activities of our National Olympic Committees of how we can apply some of the best practices that's happening uh, in the lead up to Paris Olympic Games. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Butlay. Uh, John, John Coates. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, my only commission is the Legal Affairs Commission, and um, you really don't want to know anything about the matters we deal with. Um, but I, I thought I would take this opportunity to pay credit to you and to President Thomas Bach um, for the work that I observe. In your case, you presented a report on behalf of the Association of National Olympic Committees to our last executive board, and the amount of um, work that's happening across the continental associations like this um, and through your own organisation uh, was truly remarkable and um, is a great credit to you for the leadership you, you give to that group, just as you do here. The other thing I wanted to do was just to um, state how lucky we all are to have um, had and still have President Bark as our president uh, since 2013. The, um, I've worked with President Bark since um, we were both National Olympic Committee presidents. We were both appointed to the International Council of Arbitration for Sport together in um, 1994, I think it is. I wasn't on the first IOC Athletes Commission, obviously, um, but uh, he was a member of that, and um, I think that's always um, ensured uh, that he's put the athletes first in everything he's done. But we, um, I don't think President Bark could have anticipated um, the 12 years that he's just had. He's, when he was appointed the first, um, we've had in the past, we've had boycotts, we've had terrible we had the Munich massacre, we've things like that to deal with. But uh, the doping crisis that we faced uh, with the Russians um, out of the Sochi games and the measures that the IOC had to take there, uh, where we um, took a philosophical, we took a position of individual responsibility is against collective responsibility. Uh, he led us in all of that. But then, um, after that, um, there was no time to settle back. We've, he's, um, he's had to lead us through the, um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And that um, had the potential to um, split the Olympic movement um, when we had a boycott in 1980. Um, half the world didn't turn up and then the next games half the world didn't turn up in the American games and um, so he's had to manoeuvre um, a, a, a manoeuvre to ensure that he held the Olympic committees together and the international federations. And um, uh, the latest challenge, of course, that we had to deal with was the, um, the 
friendship games that the Russians at a government level are going to undertake um, in September after our Olympic Games. And um, thus the very important declaration that was crafted and adopted at our last meeting just a week ago. The, um, then, if that's not enough, we have the issues in the Middle East. We have the issues in Gaza. Um, we still will be, the Palestine Olympic Committee and the Israel Olympic Committee will both be represented in Paris. And the president uh, maintains very strong associations with those bodies. Um, and just understanding that uh, Hamas and Palestine Olympic Committee are quite separate. And so we, um, we go along to these executive board meetings, Robin, and um, we start off with a report from the president. And um, he takes us through the last month the 10 or 15 heads of state that he's spoken to, or that call him. Um, he's, um, along with the Secretary General of the United Nations, I think he plays one of the major roles, and, and through President Bark, we play one of the major roles in maintaining, you've got to sit down and listen to this, all right? Yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> it's a um, kind of farewell speech. <laughs> <laughs> That's my farewell, I think. <laughs> But it, was, but, uh, it is amazing. The, um, he can pick up the phone, he can talk to them, and, um, uh, and thus uh, he's, he's been guiding us through, through these difficult times. We're not there with Paris yet, uh, but the um, prospects are very good. Uh, we'll have, I think, 206 National Olympic Committees back. North Korea um, will be participating at this stage. Um, the other National Olympic Committees that have been suspended for this or the other reason, um, Guatemala and others like that, are back. Um, so we um, to, to pull all of this together, all of the continental associations, the international federations, um, is a, a massive job and um, I can't think of anything in the world that effectively matches this. Um, corporations, there are bigger corporations, obviously, in terms of um, uh, their size, but um, for the good that we do, um, we're, we're very, very fortunate to have um, Thomas Bark leading us. And I also um, would be remiss not to uh, congratulate um, you on the team that you have around you. you um, and we've seen some of them today. Uh, we've seen James McLeod, uh, we've uh, Barbara, uh, Sheila, um, then um, we didn't bring him out this time, but Kit McConnell, the work that he, he does with the International Federations, the um, having to respond to changing qualification rules um, arising from the Russian invasion, those sorts of things. Um, you have an amazing team of people around you, but um, they're only amazing because of the Christoph Dubis and other, and Christoph De Kepper. They're only amazing because of, because of the leadership that you give. And I, I had the, the opportunity that I most worked closely with you was leading into Tokyo, where we pulled off those games. Um, and everyone said they won't happen uh, because of COVID, but they did. So um, this is uh, one of the, I finish up on the IOC executive board at the end of the Paris Games. And so this is um, an opportunity, President, where I wanted, on behalf of um, this part of the Olympic movement and um, uh, every, everyone else that I've been involved with, my NOC, to thank you for the contribution that you uh, have, t have undertaken. I'm sorry that it's aged you so much. Um, <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we are very, very grateful and um, we thank you, and we, we also thank you uh, for always wanting to come to Oceania at every opportunity. And I think that's, um, you certainly um, put your affection for the NOCs and the athletes of this part of the world on your heart. You wear it, and I thank you for that. So thank you, Mr. President.
Thank you very much, uh, John. We have uh, another IOC member, Gunilla, but she has the opportunity to present uh, agenda item 12, which I will ask her to do that after, after, after afternoon tea. Uh, but in the meantime, the only issue that I have with my president next to me, he's complaining about the cold. And he comes from Germany. <laughs> But we've turned the temperature down, so... Uh, uh, look, at, uh, look at Baklai, she is much better equipped than I am, you know, so, and uh, she does not come from Germany. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but I could still apply for this uh, junior college uh, scholarship in the U.S., which includes the allowance for winter clothes, so... <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, and um, we'll break until 4 o'clock, a short break for coffee, and, uh, and we'll see you back here with the presentation from Gunilla. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a general announcement to the, um, all the memorians, please. If you can report to the front corner on the right part of the stage when you're facing the stage for a quick photo opportunity. Thank you. To all fellow memorians, actually I, I haven't graduated, but to Meli and his crew, please report to the right hand corner when you're facing the stage. Thank you. Now I ask, I was going to see if I see that.
Side. You know what's best. No, we can move this. Yeah. Uh, come in, Lee. Come in, Lee. In the middle. Yeah, so we can see everybody. I'll squeeze them. I'll squeeze them between. I'm fine. Lady yes. yes, thank you. The, the lady I'm sitting next mm -hmm. is from Griffith University. Mm -hmm. After your presentation, she said she wanted to touch base with you. Yeah. She wanted yeah. the University Alliance and this, mm -hmm. that conversation. Yeah. But I mentioned that Jeremy is also our USP rep on the Education yeah. Commission. Good. But I don't, know, I don't know if she's talking about Education Commission or the OSEP program. In but if you want to meet her.
It's a video after, uh, I think I have two videos. Okay. Right. I you. Do you want me to click? Yeah. Okay. I feel safer. Okay. Uh, you uh, just leave this off and then I'll click something back. How do I stop this? They'll turn it off. I'll stop. Okay. Will you say next or I just uh, keep clicking? You, you keep clicking. Okay. Or, I, uh, yeah, if I say something, I say. No, we manage. <laughs> We manage. All right, can we go ahead and start taking our seats, please? So that we can try to finish up. You know, like 12 o'clock and like 2 o'clock. <laughs> Can I ask everyone please to take their seats? Thank you very much, everyone. We'll get the um, final session for the afternoon going. And um, invite Mrs. Gunilla Lindbergh to present the ANOC report. The floor is yours, Gunilla. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, Mr. President of IUC, Mr. President of ONOC, and Mr. President of ANOC. Mm -hmm. I have my bosses over there, so for the three organizations. So. Uh, I will try to... Uh, uh, make it short, but uh, we have some information that I think it's important. First, I have to say bula, and I've, I feel like I'm coming home. I don't know how many times, this is the highlight of the year for me, when I can come here, and uh, it's so nice. You are my favorite continent. You are... Oh. <laughs> You are 17 NOCs, but I think you are the best. It means small. So, and just to come here and uh, put the Bula shirt on, you feel like everybody's a team. It's relaxed, you have the palm trees. And I say like Andrew, maybe I shall try to have a little cottage on an island one day. So, just to, to relax. Anyway, I'll try to take you through uh, the ENOC report. And as Mr. Coates said, we have had 
a lot of activities during uh, the year. So we start with the uh, Eno Council that we had in December in Lausanne. As you know, we, we had problems with uh, last year's uh, Enoch World Beach Games and the General Assembly in Bali. They uh, council just four weeks before the event and we have been struggling and uh, they have really done a lot of harm to our organization, to the NOC, so and of course most of all, all to the athletes that had qualified. Uh, we are working with them, we are trying to get money out of them and the good thing is that we are at least managed to pay all the NOCs back for the travels that was concerning the athletes and, and your trips. But uh, we don't give up. We had the president of the Indonesian NOC, as I said, at the meeting in uh, December. He promised he will have a solution until the end of December. Now we are in March and uh, we have to take other actions, and that may be a juridical one. So next meeting coming up is in Athens uh, in April, the day after the uh, handover of the torch to, uh, from Greece to Paris. That's on the 26th of April. Uh, at that meeting, we will, of course, have further discussion about the World Beach Games and also our Enoch strategic plan evaluation and see our program for the coming years. For the Enoch commissions, we have many commissions and you are a part of all of them. The representatives from uh, Enoch, you are very uh, much involved and we have had most of the commissions on virtual to, um, because they are small commissions and it's easy to have smaller commissions on virtual and then we save money that way. Next one, please. Uh, we have the General Assembly coming up in Cascais in Portugal. Uh, so you will all get, the, all the NOCs will be invited and the commission members and of course the council. So the arrival uh, should be actually 28th of October for the uh, council meeting. And we have a cooperation with Olympic Solidarity. So they will have a day session for the NOCs in Cascais and update you about the uh, new programs. And uh, we think it's good as everybody is there to, make, uh, to take the opportunity for that. Uh, then General Assembly, 30th and 31st, and we will do like we did in Korea to have a third day where we will have a special session, um, smaller groups so we can discuss more and talk more and not only reports. Cascais uh, and Enoch, of course, we are working very much with different sustainability initiatives. And uh, here are some of them. We have the partnership with Toyota to use the electric and hybrid vehicles. Uh, it's an investment uh, we have done for, with the NOC Portugal Olympic Forest Project for the carbon emission compensation. Uh, and we have planted trees. Uh, we have a partnership with uh, Re Food Cascais, making sure that all food produced for the event is consumed, not by you, of course, but the hopefully by you. But if it's something left, uh, it will be given to different hospitals and schools, so no waste. Uh, we have the Blue Water Solution, where we will have no plastic bottles. And we are promotion of the event partners with uh, different sustainability initiatives. And we will engage athletes from the Enoch Awards Summit, uh, Awards Summit in the sustainability campaign. And the mayor of Cascais is very much involved and they are looking forward to uh, welcome the whole world. 
Cascais uh, is about 30 minutes north of Lisbon. So you fly into Lisbon and then you will met, be met at the airport. It's not a big city. Uh, so we will have, like here, we have actually six different hotels with a conference center in the middle, but it's walking distance, so that should work well. I think it's a video there. Yeah. It's when the tree planting. Uh, one person that is responsible for the sustainability in the Olympic Committee, for the events, for the for the daily life of the Olympic Committee. It's not once a year uh, project, it's, you have to think about it all the time. We have to save our planet. It's an amazing initiative. I think I need to congratulate them to start this kind of uh, uh, team building uh, work. It is very important that uh, we, we spread this message and we, we form the National Olympic Committees in order, and we help them in order to, to have their solutions in their own National Olympic Committees. Yeah, we planted 1,000 trees that day, and uh, it was, of course, for the forest that had terrible, uh, it was burning down the year before, so hopefully uh, it will come some water so we can see the result of that. We also started to um, uh, organize seminars for sport directors. Uh, for uh, transfer of knowledge between the different NOCs. We have small groups. Uh, we have 50 uh, NOCs at the most, and it's a global initiative, so they come from all the continents. And uh, it has really been very successful. And we have had the first one in Portugal, uh, the second one in Jordan, the third one in uh, Morocco, where uh, the uh, technical and sport directors, I should say, those who are really much involved in the preparation on the technical stage and with the athletes to change the ideas. The good one there. Is that another video? Yes. This seminar is a great. It's the third time, the third edition, and it's getting better and better. The perfect place to discuss things we experience at home in our NOCs, and we get together and we share so many experiences. I think uh, the most important it will be we have some groups here which we spoke about uh, the safe and the security in the village and out of the village. This seminar, I would say that it is a one step forward comparatively to the previous one, especially with the road to Paris. Maybe this is better 
because uh, we can see the more ideas. It's really captivated my interest to actually hear the experiences from the different NOCs, big and large. So definitely, and a lot of takeaways. I mean, so I'm looking forward to go back home and uh, work with my colleagues. Exciting, special, and uh, grateful. Um, partnership and networking. Uh, yes, next one, please. You can skip that because I have already mentioned. When it comes to the uh, World Beach Games, uh, we will, of course, make an evaluation on if we should continue or not, uh, and what do our different stakeholders have to say. So we have had meeting with the previous hosts, the Qatar Olympic Committee, the IFs, the Technical Working Group of NOCs, the athletes and the events commission, and uh, we will make a report and in, until the next uh, meeting. I can say so far all the stakeholders have been very positive, uh, especially of course the athletes and the IFs who want to promote their sport. Um, but we also say that we have to make another format, we have to cut the costs, and it should not cost the NOCs anything, so we're trying to have that uh, as a special project. Next one. We also have uh, started with uh, different webinars and workshops uh, on different topics. And uh, actually today uh, we have a workshop uh, about the digital strategy and the engagement, engagement of the NOC sponsors that is led by the NOC of Australia. You see in April, we have the strategy coming from the IF side with the archery and badminton. We have on 7th of May, the TikTok, and we have uh, Red Torch, NOC social media performance analysis on 15th of June. And uh, all these are webinars, so you can just connect it has also been uh, very popular and we have had a good feedback from the NOCs. We have some more coming up. Uh, on the 4th of June, uh, NOC of Italy in Greece, how to achieve a high success rate on video views during Paris 2024. 18 of June, IUC Digital Communication Strategy, or also for Paris. Uh, 24th of September, the same. Uh, 12th of November, artificial intelligence and the NOC's work on social media. And 10th of December, how to retain NOC's fan engagement in between the games. We also had, a, uh, we started a photo program uh, actually in um, Beijing already, but for the youth games in uh, Gangwang, We've been working together with the IOC. Uh, this program is actually meant for smaller NOCs or for the athletes who are not on the podium and who hardly can find any photos of themselves, nor in the media, nor in the Getty uh, library. So we have engaged three photographers and the NOCs have been able to get those pictures free of charge so they can use that those on the website and also to use by the athletes. And we had two NOCs from Oceania who took part, Australia and New Zealand. We are discussing also the continuation of the photo program and the partnership with the IOC-NOC relations 
and IUC Press Services team. Uh, it's a high level of the photos, and it's easy to communicate among the NOCs, and we hope that we can continue with this uh, also for Paris. Uh, we are still uh, discussing with the NOC on how to work it, but we have those photos in our library and it can be used on the website. And you can see how the photos were used all over the, the five continents for those athletes who ended up 20 or 25 and who nobody cared about, but they were big uh, champions in their countries. Uh, for the uh, Gang Wang, uh, it, it was a competition between the different NOCs and Slovenia was winning, Lithuania came second, and Thailand of all winter countries ended up three. Uh, you can skip that. It's just statistics. Uh, we, we have made a survey among the NOCs and the program is rated 9.24 out of 10 points. Uh, we also are working with the, uh, as we said, you saw before, the Paris 2024 Digital Accelerator Program. Uh, and a social media video production, not from the venues, not in the village, but we will have a small studio where they can make interviews with the athletes and uh, also those will be free for the NOCs to use and uh, ready to go video content for the NOCs social media. Of course, we are very careful with the IUC rules so we don't make any uh, mistake there, but uh, hopefully we, we can manage together. We also have started the Enoch TV, where uh, 73 sessions live streamed with 478 efficient playtime. And the content watched was in 62 countries and we saw the average of viewers 34 years old, and the audience 60% men and 40% women. We are working uh, with some NOCs on how to cooperate. So we are working with Belgium, Morocco, Qatar, Mexico, and also with ONOC, because it's a good way to spread your message and simple way all over the world. So I rushed. One more? Yeah, it was one more. <laughs> we also, I don't know if you have noticed, but we have started an NOC Games Memories campaign. Uh, 170 days campaign with all the NOCs. So we have one day, we have one or two NOCs where we present and showcase the Olympic Games coming uh, and the athletes coming from the different NOCs. And also for, we try to, to uh, publish the, um, as much as we can about the history and the athletes. And this will finish uh, when the Paris Games is uh, starting. So that was short presentation. Uh, we will have an office in uh, Paris in the NOC hotel, we will have a small office uh, where you can come and discuss and whatever you want to do. And uh, then, of course, uh, we will send out the invitations to Cascais in May for all those who uh, need visas as well. And we know you're very busy with the Paris Games, so we try to organize everything before the Games. Um, but if it's something, we, we are there in Paris and we are there for you. So we thank you very much. Thank you for the cooperation and thank you for the good friendship we have with Onok and good luck. And I just saw you qualified three more weightlifters from the region. So good. Continue to do good things there. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Gunella. Any comments, questions? No? Thank you. On to agenda item 13 and the games of the 33rd Olympiad in Paris. I understand there's a video presentation. Before, before we start, bonjour uh, everyone. So I think uh, this word will be able to, to use it quite a lot uh, over, the, over the summer, hopefully. Uh, my name is uh, Simon, and I'm very, very um, grateful to be here. Very happy to represent Paris 2024. I'm here with my colleague uh, Marion. So we are familiar faces for your uh, chef de mission. And for some of you, and also uh, president, ownership member, and, and OPC. Um, so over the last uh, few days, we've been having one to one meeting with every chef de mission. We went through like a breakdown session from how to get from Paris, uh, from, sorry, from Fiji to Paris for them. So normally they should be up to date. Uh, they have all the tools at their uh, disposal to help you and answer uh, all, your, all your questions. We have done the same thing uh, with all the NPCs from, from Oceania, thanks to, thanks to OPC. Um, I think we are pretty, pretty confident. Um, things are, are going well. We are keeping, yeah, we are tracking everything, everything well, so that's pretty, that's pretty good. Um, we are only 17 weeks before, before the games. So yeah, that's, that's coming uh, very, very soon, and we are really excited for that. And as you may know, French people are a bit uh, passionate about that. And we could talk with Marion during ages about this uh, Paris 2024 games. So we come up with the idea of just doing like a presentation for you. No action required from you. You just have to sit down, watch. There will be some general updates. Then uh, it will be specific to President and Secretary General. And at the end, if you have any questions, comments, uh, I will be here to answer every question. Thank you, Pinaka. Bonjour and hello everyone. We hope you're enjoying sunny Fiji and enjoying the General Assembly so far. On behalf of the entire Paris 2024 team, we are delighted to present this progress report on our preparations for the Olympic Games in just 122 days time. My name is Paola Mora and I have been head of NOC and NPC relations and services since 2020. Bulavinaka, my name is Gavin McMahon and I manage the NOC relations team for Oceania and also our NOC communications team. We would like to start our presentation with a general overview of Paris 2024's progress. Then we'll talk about NOC services before focusing on services for NOC presidents and secretaries general and celebrations and ceremonies. And then finally, we'll look at the next steps. Our team currently in Fiji will be happy to answer any questions throughout the AGM. We will start by giving you an update on the various venues being built for the Olympic Games. Thanks to the incredible work carried out by Solideo, our event delivery authority, we're on schedule for all our sites. I would like to thank them again because thanks to their work, we are on time, on budget, and we have met our ambitions. At the beginning of March 2024, Solideo handed over the keys to the village, ready to welcome you. All NOCs are fortunate enough to already know where they'll be in the village during the games. A representative of each of your NOCs has had the opportunity to visit your future games time home at least once. As you can see, the village is very compact, making it easy for you and your athletes to move around. And this is a photo of showing the NOC Services Centre as well as the Village Plaza. As you may be aware, 95% of the competition venues for Paris 2024 are existing or temporary infrastructure. A total of 15 Olympic Games competition venues for 21 sports are located within a 10 kilometer radius of the village, which have been renovated. We will now go over a few of them in detail. The aquatic center with a capacity of 5,000 seats is the only site built for the games and was delivered to us at the end of February. This is where artistic swimming, diving, water polo in the qualifying phases events will take place. Beyond the Games, this low-carbon facility is designed to meet the needs of Saint-Saint-Denis, its host region. The Arena La Chapelle 
was completed on 11th of February and it was opened with a basketball game. This venue will host the events of badminton and rhythmic gymnastics. Work on the Stade de France has begun. The pitch and track will be completely redone. The giant screens will be doubled in size. Everything will be ready for the 1st of June. On the 23rd of June last year, we unveiled the details of the Olympic torch relay route, an unmissable tradition that takes us back to the roots of the Olympic Games. The first torch of the Paris 2024 Olympic torch relay will be lit on 16th of April 2024, according to ancient tradition in Olympia in Greece, and it arrives in Marseille by boat on the 8th of May 2024. Torch Relay occupies a special place at the heart of the Games because of its ability to reach out to as many people as possible and connect the people of France. For 68 days, the Olympic flame will crisscross the country, visiting more than 400 towns and cities. The Relay will offer a deep dive into the history of France. It will build bridges between eras, highlighting exceptional sites that have contributed to France's influence at every major period in its history. It will be a great introduction for the world to the Paris 2024 Games and will come to an end on the evening of the 26th of July during the spectacular Olympic Games opening ceremony which we will talk about later. By then we'll be ready for everyone. Let's now have a look at the Olympic torch relay route. On the 8th of February, Paris 2024 also unveiled the medals for the Olympic and Paralympic Games. These medals represent the creativity of Paris 2024 with an exceptional concept, the meet meeting of the most wanted object of the Games with the iconic symbol of France and Paris, the Eiffel Tower. Each medalist will receive a piece of original iron from the Eiffel Tower placed at the heart of their medal. We hope you like them and that you'll be able to win as many as possible. Let's now have a look at the presentation video. Sauter plus haut. Courir plus vite. Lancer plus loin. Battre plus fort. Pour s'approcher un peu plus près. D'un centimètre. D'un centième. D'une touche. Du plus convoité des objets jamais créés. D'or, d'argent ou de bronze. Mais avant tout, de Paris. On son centre, imaginé par Paris 2024, un véritable morceau de Tour Eiffel. Un hexagone, serti à la manière d'une pierre précieuse, mettant en lumière un savoir-faire unique. Son rayonnement donne vie au symbole de la victoire et fait briller, cent ans plus tard, le retour des Jeux Olympiques et Paralympiques à Paris. Transmettre la fierté d'une ville, d'un patrimoine, d'un pays tout entier, pour illuminer une nouvelle fois la ville lumière et le cœur des plus grands athlètes. En 2024, le rêve est un bijou. Et Paris en est les craintes. Paris 2024 et LVMH sont fiers de vous présenter les médailles des Jeux Olympiques et Paralympiques de Paris 2024, designées par la Maison Chomet. Let's focus on what has been done for NOCs in recent months. One of our biggest milestones was the Chef de Mission Seminar. We had the privilege of hosting NOCs from the 13th to the 18th of July last year. A total of almost 200 NOCs with 390 participants were attending in person and 66 attending remotely. Each Paris 2024 FA was presented, one-to-one -one meetings took place, and the Chefs de Mission also visited the Olympic Village in Paris, Lille, and Châteauroux as well as sports venues. 
there's nothing like uh, the video of the seminar to show you what we achieved during that seminar. Chers amis, c'est un vrai plaisir de voir enfin et je voudrais au nom de Paris 24 vous souhaiter la bienvenue. Following the Chef de Mission seminar, we were delighted to host the ONOC and Olympic Solidarity Forum right here at our offices at Pulse between the 18th and the 20th of July. This three-day forum focused on operational matters such as delegation registration, transport, and we were able to take you to your future Games Time home in the Olympic Village. The event was an important moment for the Oceania team as our teams and your Chef de Mission were able to meet face-to-face -face for the first time and this continues with the monthly calls that we're currently organizing with all NOCs from Oceania. In addition to these events, our services and relations team have organized visits for all NOCs and NPCs. 112 individual pre-games visits have been organized since 2022. Six of these were for NOCs from Oceania, and these were tailor-made to meet the operational needs of NOCs from your continent. They required a lot of daily involvement from Paris 2024 stakeholders and we thank them for their involvement and support. NOC visits have now come to an end, but our teams are in constant contact with NOCs and we are available, available to answer any questions that you may have.
we will go through everything you need to know about the Paris 2024 Games as a President or Secretary General. So let's start with the arrival process. NOC presidents and secretaries general will have access to transport services for arrivals and departure services from the 15th of July, which is 11 days before the opening ceremony. And that continues until the 14th of August, which is three days after the closing ceremony. For arrivals at the primary ports of entry of Charles de Gaulle or Orly International Airports, Paris 2024 protocol volunteers will welcome NOC presidents and secretaries general as they leave the aircraft and will help them with customs and immigration procedures in France. Paris 2024 volunteers will also be available to welcome NOC presidents and secretaries general when they arrive at train stations or in a coho city. For NOC presidents and secretaries general arriving at Charles de Gaulle or Orly International Airports, there will be a desk where your pre-valid accreditation cards can be validated and this will be located before or after immigration depending on the terminal of arrival. The desk will be open from 7 a.m. until 11 p.m. from the 18th of July until the 8th of September 2024. If pre-valid cards are not validated at the airport, it will be possible to validate at the press and Olympic Family Accred Accreditation Centre located in Pochmayo Hub. NOC presidents and secretaries general will get their transport card at the same time as their pre-valid card is validated. This card will give them free access to public transport. Paris 2024 volunteers will then escort them to the load zone for transport services to the Olympic Family Hotels. As a reminder, and as we have often told you, all information regarding the arrivals and departures of NOC presidents and secretaries general must be updated on the arrivals and departure system to ensure a smooth arrival and departure process. Olympic Family Hotel. All the Olympic Family Hotels are four or five stars accommodations and as you can see, are located in the west of Paris. The Hyatt Regency Paris Etoile and the Meridian are very close to each other and not far from the main press center. The Collectionneur will accommodate IOC members as well as International Federation Presidents and Secretaries General. It will house the IOC Executives Offices and IOC Member Services. Access to the hotel will be restricted to holders of specific accreditations or guest passes. The Hyatt Regency Paris Etoile OF2 will be your home during the Games. The offices of Olympic Solidarity, IOC NOC Relations and the Association of National Olympic Committees will also be located in this hotel. No specific accreditation or guest pass will be required at the entrance. Please note that each NOC was given the opportunity to book two rooms. If NOC presidents and secretaries general are unable to participate or must leave before the end of the Olympic Games, their rooms reserved at the Hyatt are paid for by Olympic Solidarity and may be transferred to persons who will replace them in their official capacity. Le Meridien OF3 will host sports ministers. And now let's move on to transport. NOC presidents and secretaries general will have access to all the different transport services provided by Paris 2024 which includes TX, TA, TC and TP. TX, the usual games time fleet service known as T1, T2 and T3 has evolved to facilitate the way of using fleet systems by developing an operational needs oriented approach. The TX system is a pool of cars with drivers providing one way transfer services between locations on the TX destination list between the 15th of July and the 14th of August, 2024. Those with TX privileges on their accreditation can access ready-to-go services and bookable services with using a pool of cars and volunteer drivers for one-way journeys to and from these locations. Accompanying guests without TX entitlement on their accreditation cannot use TX transport services without the primary guest as it is not an operational need. TX services are available for travel between all TX destinations in Greater Paris and within the Coho cities. The TX destination list has been enhanced to allow for operational needs to be met. Presidents and secretaries general are also encouraged to use public transport when traveling around Paris and the Coho cities. With one of the most extensive and efficient public transport systems in the world, travel times to games venues can be significantly faster on public transport than by TX, for example. It is a free of charge access to all public transport in Greater Paris, including the whole of the Ile-de-France mobility network concerned by games venues. 
Paris 2024 will also offer Transport Connect or TC services. These will be reserved for accredited persons only. This is a shuttle bus service with regular lines operating from transport hubs and public transport stations to competition venues and some non-competition venues, including the Olympic Village and the Port Mayo Hub, which serves the two Olympic Family Hotels, OF2 and OF3, as well as the main press centre and the International Broadcast Centre. Please note that you can also use TA services. Next, Coho Cities. Depending on the destination, NOC presidents and secretaries general will be able to use the rail network, high-speed trains, TGV or intercity trains, and air transport for Nice only to travel to the Coho cities when they have competing athletes in those cities. Please note that travel will only be organized to and from Paris. NOC president and secretaries general will be assigned an Olympic family assistant according to their NOC's delegation size. NOCs with less than 49 athletes are entitled to one Olympic family assistant and two if you have more than 49 athletes. OFAs will be volunteers who will act as personal assistants during the Games. They may support NOC President and Secretary General with the communication with TX drivers, TX reservations, as well as TC services. As a reminder, OFAs do not have access to Olympic family lounges or tribunes and are not allowed to travel to Coho cities. OFAs will start their mission on the 27th of July until the 12th of August. NOC presidents and secretaries general will receive the contact details of their OFA or OFAs, if applicable, at the Olympic Information Desk at OF2. The OFA will meet the NOC president or secretary general in that hotel. And now for ceremonies, presidents and secretaries general, as well as their accompanying guests, will receive complimentary tickets for the opening and closing ceremonies. Access devices for both ceremonies will be distributed at the Olympic Information Desk at OF2 prior to the ceremonies. For the opening ceremony, NOC presidents and secretaries general and their accompanying guests will be seated at the Olympic family stand at Trocadéro. They will have access to the garden party, an outdoor hospitality place in the Trocadero Gardens prior to the ceremony. And regarding the closing ceremony, take note that it will take place in the iconic Stade de France in Saint-Denis on the night of the 11th of August of 2024. We will now move on to the fourth part of our presentation, ceremonies and celebrations. As you probably know, for the first time in Olympic history, the opening ceremony will take place not in a stadium, but in the heart of Paris on the Olympic Seine. Athletes will be at the heart of the ceremony and will be featured on boats alongside performers as part of Paris 2024's constant ambition to hold games created for and by the athletes. The parade will depart from Austerlitz Bridge and will then make its way around two islands, Ile Saint-Louis and Ile de la Cité before passing under 17 bridges. From the boats, athletes will enjoy spectacular views of competition ven venues such as Place de la Concorde, Esplanade des Invalides, Grand Palais and lastly Iéna Bridge, where they will finally disembark and make their way to the Trocadero, where they will be welcomed for the ceremony finale. The opening ceremony will consist of three main elements, the parade of athletes, which involves a six kilometer journey from east to west along the River Seine. The parade time for each of these boats is estimated at 42 minutes uh, and will include the artistic show. And finally, some protocol, uh, protocol elements of the ceremony will take place at the Trocadero and Iéna Bridge. Please be mindful that the agenda and timings are subject to review. This is a map of where the different stakeholders will be located during the ceremony. The Olympic family will be at Trocadero and NOCs at Iéna Bridge. The position will be slightly different on Iéna Bridge and at the Trocadero. It will be a standing position on the bridge with refreshments and bathrooms available nearby. The Trocadero is a seating bowl for dignitaries, Olympic family and the media. Between the recording of this video and the AGM that you're attending right now, a webinar was hosted by the Paris 2024 ceremonies team to provide a further update on ceremony operations for NOCs. This is available on the ceremony section of Knocknet. The closing ceremony will be marked by audacity, fraternity and emotion. Athletes from all, all around the world will represent their countries and territories one last time at the Paris 2024 Olympic Games. 
The closing ceremony, as Paola said, will take place at the iconic Stade de France, the largest stadium in the country. It was built for the 1998 FIFA World Cup and will also host athletics and rugby sevens during the Olympic Games. It will now host an unforgettable closing ceremony. The celebrations are in line with the vision of Paris 2024 with the motto, Games Wide Open. The goal is to offer the emotion of the games to as many people as possible throughout France, outside the competition venues, and thus create an active popular momentum. A hundred years later, we want these games to be a great celebration. And one of the key venues for this will be the Champions Park. For the first time in the majestic setting of the Trocadero, the Champions Park will offer medalists a unique experience in the history of the Summer Olympic Games, an iconic place to celebrate their performance and their medals. At the end of each day, medalists from the previous day will be invited to gather and celebrate their victories in an unforge unforgettable setting in front of the Eiffel Tower and 15,000 adoring sports fans. A live broadcast of competition and main finals will follow the celebrations. The Champions Park will be open for 10 days of celebrations between the 29th of July and the 10th of August, with the exception of the 2nd to the 4th of August when the park will be closed. Medalists will have the opportunity to celebrate their victories with their family and friends in a dedicated area at the Palais de Chaillot before and after meeting the public. After celebrating their medals, athletes will be able to proceed to the mixed zone if they wish to do so, or enjoy the live site in a restricted area. Here's the timeline of what to come at the Champions Park. From the opening of the gates to the public at 4 p.m., then the celebration of the medalists who will parade among the 15,000 fans. Finally, the daily broadcast of the major finales on big screens. And the site closes at 11.30 p.m. So this sums up this unique experience that's been organized. To make this event a real success, we're counting on your support as NOCs to get athletes involved in the project. And now let's finish with next steps. Here's a calendar of the important dates of the coming months. Two big milestones for the accreditation process with the NOC accreditation application deadline on the 28th of March and the start of pre-DRMs on the 15th of April. All your NOCs have already a meeting planned in their agenda. Important briefings are coming up with the dignitaries one on the 4th of April, the security one on the 23rd and the 24th of April, and the medical one on the 24th <coughs> and the 25th of April. The 12th of July will mark the start of the FDRMs, the final delegation registration meeting. The village will officially open on the 18th of July. So this brings us to the end of the presentation. We hope the updates have been useful. Uh, enjoy the rest of your time in Fiji. Simon and Marion are there to support you and answer any questions that you might have. And of course, we're waiting for you in Paris and looking forward to seeing you here. It's not always easy to compact all this type of information in a short period of time. Any question or comments? Okay. Oh. No? Okay, perfect. So we are around with my own, so don't hesitate if you have any question. And the key message here is, yeah, we are really excited to welcome you uh, in Paris in a few weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paris 2024. And we invite our next door neighbors, New Caledonia. President Michel, uh, I speak French, and um, Michel uh, translate. Vous avez pu voir dans la présentation qui a été faite autant par tout à l'heure par James et par Simon le parcours de la flamme. You, you've seen the torch relay uh, journey uh, that was present, presented. Dans la présentation dans la présentation qui a été faite la nouvelle Cadouin n'apparaissait pas dans le parcours de la flamme mais nous avons eu la chance et l'honneur d'apprendre il y a un mois que la flamme passerait en Nouvelle-Calédonie le 11 juin. The, the torch relay was not scheduled, scheduled to come to... It's working? Yeah. 
what not, it's not scheduled to come in New Caledonia at first, but uh, we had the information and the great news to one month ago to 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 know that uh, the torch relay is coming in New Caledonia on the 11th of June. C'est une formidable opportunité pour la nouvelle colonie pour le sport calédonien. Et nous avons souhaité, en intervenant cet après-midi, faire que cette fête soit aussi ouverte à nos sportifs et à nos représentants océaniens. C'est une uh, it's a great opportunity for sport in New Caledonia. And we would like to make the, this celebration an opportunity also for the Oceanian, our neighbors from Oceania. Même si nous sommes calédoniens et français, nous considérons aussi euh, véritablement océanien. Euh, la participation qu'on peut avoir aux Jeux du Pacifique montre bien que la Nouvelle-Calédonie est totalement inclue dans le, dans le Pacifique et dans l'Océanie. Et à ce titre-là, nous serions honorés de pouvoir euh, avoir la présence euh, de représentants des pays donc, euh, qui sont présents aujourd'hui dans la salle pour venir euh, célébrer avec nous euh, ce passage de la flamme. We are, we are New Caledonian and French, but we are also Oceanian. And that uh, you see all of our athletes at the Pacific Games performing every four years. And uh, we would like to share this celebration with you. And we would like to invite all of the Oceanian NOC and uh, non-NOC uh, PGA to come and join us on that day, the 11th of June in Numea, to celebrate with us the torch relay coming in the Pacific. En plus, du, en plus du drapeau français, ce serait vraiment une, une grande fête d'avoir les drapeaux des autres pays du Pacifique. Et donc, nous allons voir de quelle manière nous pouvons organiser cela et nous reviendrons vers vous pour vous dire un petit peu de quelle manière les choses peuvent s'organiser. Avec le French flag in Numea, it would be great to have all the flags of the country uh, of the Oceania region. Uh, to be in Numea for that celebration. So we will come towards us quickly to tell you how it can, it can be organized. Le deuxième, le deux, le deuxième élément qu'on voulait vous donner, c'est sur les Jeux de Paris 24 et en particulier sur le Club France. À chaque Jeux Olympiques, le Comité national olympique et français organise le Club France qui permet d'être un lieu de, de rencontre, d'échange et de célébration des athlètes français. Le yeah. uh, the French NOC organise pour each uh, Olympic Games le Club France, qui uh, est une célébration uh, venue pour les athlètes de la même si la nouvelle Calédonie n'a pas la possibilité de sélectionner et d'avoir des, des athlètes calédoniens qui sont présents pour la nouvelle Calédonie, nous avons eu la chance, donc, sur les précédents Jeux Olympiques et sur les Jeux de Paris 2024, d'avoir des athlètes calédoniens qui participeront aux Jeux de Paris 2024. We, we can't have direct selection for the games, qualification for the games uh, for New Caledonia, but we are within the French team. We have some athletes that are participating to each Olympic Games. Last time in uh, Tokyo, and we've got already uh, athletes qualified for Paris 2024. Et donc, nous espérons que ces athlètes euh, reviendront et puis euh, auront des médailles comme ça a été le cas sur euh, Tokyo. Et nous souhaiterions donc euh, de la même manière avec euh, l'ONOC, avec son le Conseil des Jeux et ensemble, avec euh, l'ensemble donc euh, des pays océaniens, organiser donc au Club France une soirée spéciale Océanie. On regrouperait donc euh, des représentants de chacun euh, des pays pour une fois encore montrer euh, la grande famille océanienne. We strongly hope for medals for our athletes in uh, in uh, Paris, especially in swimming and in sailing. Uh, We've got great opportunities, we hope. <laughs> uh, we would like to organize, and uh, during the, the games, uh, an evening for Oceanian, all the Oceanian uh, area at the Club France, and to everyone to join us and to celebrate the games uh, with, in, all, with all the, the Oceanian family. Nous allons donc organiser cela avec le président du comité national olympique et sportif français, voir de quelle manière les choses elles sont, elles pourraient être mises en place. C'est une opportunité qui nous, auto, qui nous est offerte par notre comité national olympique et nous espérons que cette opportunité donc permettra, même à Paris, 
à 22 000 km d'ici euh, que euh, l'ensemble des pays des NOC euh, océaniens se retrouvent ensemble encore une fois. This opportunity is offered by the president of the French National Olympic Committee and we will come back to you shortly to tell you how it, when it will happen during the, the games and we will be really looking forward to have all the family, Oceanian family together in Paris to celebrate the games. Dès que, les choses, dès que les choses seront définitivement mises en place, donc de la même manière, on communiquera avec l'ensemble des, des, des responsables des comités olympiques pour vous dire de quelle manière les choses se mettront en place à Paris. Voilà. Merci en tout cas pour ceux qui vont à Paris. Bon jeu et profitez-en parce que la ville de Paris est magnifique. Et ce qu'on nous a montré tout à l'heure avec les différents monuments, vous allez vivre là encore, 100 ans après parce que les derniers Jeux ont lieu en 1924, vous allez vivre, pour ceux qui iront à Paris, quelque chose d'exceptionnel. Les à the last Games in Paris, uh, we will, uh, we hope you will enjoy Paris. Uh, Paris. Paris is a great city, and we hope you will enjoy that, and we are looking forward. Okay. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, uh, Christophe and uh, Michel, uh, for the kind invitation. And I'm sure if the rest of the Oceania Nussis win medals, we will invite you to our celebration as well in Paris. Thanks a lot. Mm. Moving on to Pacific Games Council report, please. Bula and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, President Mitchell and your executive committee, thank you uh, for the opportunity for the Pacific Games Council to report to your membership today. Um, 2023 was a huge year for us. As we've seen a lot of images already today, the Pacific Games, the 17th edition held in Honiara from the 19th of November till the 2nd of December with um, our biggest ever 5,000 athletes and team officials uh, participating in uh, 24 sports. So to the 17 NOCs, including Australia and New Zealand, and the seven associate members, most of whom are with us here today, a very big thank you from the Pacific Games Council. I'm speaking on behalf of our president, Vidya Lakan, and our executive board who have been here uh, throughout the week um, to thank you very much for a massive contribution. Um, we also presented to uh, OSFO, um, the uh, sporting organisation or sporting representatives of, of our region who ran the competitions, invested resources, time and personnel into making uh, each of those sports uh, such a success. Um, as James mentioned, we had uh, the International Olympic Committee managing one of the sports for us with boxing, and we were delighted that 12 athletes qualified um, directly uh, to Paris, which is a fantastic uh, legacy of the Pacific Games, and I hope we can do more of that uh, as we go forward in the other sports. Um, I'd like to call upon Martin, uh, the president of NOXI, our host PGA, uh, and he will update you on some of the facts and figures, um, but it was a magnificent performance for this country um, to stage the Games for the first time. So, Martin, over to you. Thank you, Andrew, President Buck, and President uh, Dr. Robin, and members of the board, distinguished guests, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this, this afternoon, I am very happy to give you just a brief update on the gathering that was uh, gathered in Honiara from the 19th of November to the 2nd of December. So the last game we hosted was the South Pacific Mini Games in 1981 
and there were five sports, uh, and there were seven, 15, 15 countries attended. Uh, but this last year's game um, was the biggest one that uh, the Solomon Islands can host, uh, and it was hosted in Honiara with a total of 24 countries attended, 24 sports, a, a total workforce of 410 staff, 160 people seconded to the games from the government, and we have a 512 milestones to tick before um, the end of the games. Total number of athletes attending the games, 3,663 athletes, 1,285 officials, total of 4,948 athletes and officials. There were 12 sports venues uh, used for the games. There were six games villages. There were 124,151 meals. Uh, there were 17 TV stations uh, televising the games, and the total uh, volunteers for the opening ceremony participants, 2,800, 3,000 volunteers for the games, and a total of 1,021 medals were given out to the athletes. 366 were gold, 324 were silver, and 331 were bronze medal. That is the stats I want to bring across to you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, in addition to uh, being the president of the host PGA, National Olympic Committee, uh, Martin was also the chair of the Games Organising Committee um, and did a fantastic job. So congratulations, Martin, Melinda and your whole team. Um, the last dot point there is a special thank you to ONOC. Um, we've already heard today from Ken, uh, the Athletes Commission, and Chris Milne from the Medical Commission uh, those two programs in particular added tremendous value to the athlete experience and to the welfare of the athletes at games time. And as ONOC uh, reported, our Secretary General reported to our General Assembly, there were numerous activations across a whole lot of areas where ONOC contributed. So Dr Mitchell, Secretary General Blass, thank you very much for the contribution uh, that ONOC made to helping the Pacific Games Council and our Games Organising Committee um, to develop, uh, to deliver um, what was an exceptional games. Um, looking ahead for us, um, Martin's uh, provided the figures. Um, 5,000 athletes and officials for the second games in a row is a concern to us. Uh, we raised that with you at our recent General Assembly. While we've been here in Fiji this week, our sports committee and our executive board have been reviewing uh, the size of the games and some initiatives we're looking at taking to try and get that number down a little bit to a level where we were perhaps a decade ago when the games were more sustainable and manageable. Uh, so we'll be presenting some reporting on that to you in the coming weeks. Um, I think a lot of you are aware we've got a bid process underway for 2029. Bids will be closing in the next few weeks for 2031. And when we meet in Palau in September, uh, we'll be making decisions on those two games hosts, which means for the 2032 uh, Brisbane Step Up uh, initiatives, we will know where the games are and probably close to knowing 100% the sports programs across those um, games coming up towards 2032. So um, that's going to be an important meeting and an important moment for our region uh, to set a very important direction for sport. Um, I have great pleasure to hand over to Bucklai or Frank uh, to talk about Palau and the mini-games next year, which is obviously a big focus of our work as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. On behalf of the Palau National Olympic Committee President, uh, Frank Yota, who's with us uh, this afternoon, uh, 
We are ready to welcome all of you to the games next year. Uh, there are 12 sports in the program that were presented by Andrew. Uh, the opening ceremony is June 29th and closing on uh, July 9th, our Constitution of Day of the country. So we're looking forward to everyone. If I may just take a few minutes, only five minute video that we wish to present, uh, particularly on the design of the logo that really um, represents all the activities and uh, our way forward in sports program and also a little bit of uh, video about uh, Palau and the games that's coming up next year in 2025. Uh, Mate. The logo concept revolves around the traditional bai, a culturally significant structure in Palau. The bai symbolizes the essence of Palauan culture and values, serving as a space for unity and exchange, embodying Palau's role as the host country. There are 24 triangles on the bai, representing the 24 member nations and territories of the Pacific Games. A prominent yellow circle within the design represents the moon, a symbol deeply ingrained in Palawan identity and featured on the national flag. This lunar motif influences various aspects of the Palawan lifestyle. Incorporated into the design is the blue squiggle and three dots, which is the Pacific Games official logo that depicts the ocean and people, symbolizing the interconnectedness of the Pacific peoples and the essence of unity and connection across the Pacific three regions, Polynesia, Micronesia, and Melanesia. A distinctive element is the abstract brown shape, reminiscent of a canoe, evoking a sense of journey and exploration across the waters. It moves harmoniously within the endless circle, mirroring the voyage towards Palau for the Pacific Mini Games in 2025. These chosen colors pay homage to Palau, mirroring the hues prevalent in Bai architecture, Palauan arts, and the national flag. The 2025 Pacific Mini Games in Palau captures the essence of collaboration and teamwork. It's all about the power of being together. It's akin to when sports teams work as one to achieve victory. People and groups can accomplish remarkable feats when they join forces, much like athletes overcoming tough challenges together. In sports, each player brings something special and communities can do the same by uniting for success. Picture life as a grand game, and when we all play on the same side, we all succeed and leave a legacy for the future. It is empowering unity. We have just one more, uh, one more video. It's just a few minutes to for the, about the games. Thank you. Uh, thank you, MC, and good evening, uh, colleagues. Uh, before I start, may I recognize some very strong supporters of sport in Palau and indeed in the Pacific. No, President Rip had to leave. He's got another commitment next door, he said. But I want to recognize uh, the uh, representatives of the council, the chiefs, President Tommy. I wish to make a special mention of you because it was during your administration that I was trusted with the responsibility of organizing the 2025 Pacific Mini Games. So thank you for bringing the games to Palau. Uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps, thank you for your support and thank you for being here and honoring the athletes of, of Palau. Uh, the other members of the uh, political leadership in, in Palau, thank you for being with our youths and supporting them. I was asked to say why we are here, and I think that question has already been answered. The Games were interested to Palau in 2019, and they will take place in 2025. And as is always the case, the membership of the council, they need to be reassured 
the, our next host of the Pacific Mini Games are preparing to host them in 2025. Uh, because of COVID, uh, Andrew and I couldn't be here any earlier. So when we came here, it was only to, to find out to what extent you are preparing or your preparation have gone to host us in 2025. And may I say that uh, after meeting with all your political leaders, and then meeting all the sports leaders as well, and then today we spend the time to see all the venues that we will possibly use for our competition in 2025. We are fairly satisfied that you will be ready in 2025 to host us. Thank you very much, uh, Bakhlai. Are there any questions of the Palau uh, Organizing Committee and the NO NOC? Otherwise, see you all there in September. Yes. Mm. We move on to agenda item 15, which is the World Anti-Doping Agency and Orado presentation. Good afternoon, President Bach, President Mitchell, Water Representative Ying Q, Water Athlete Council Chair Ryan Peeney, NOC leaders, athletes, ladies and gentlemen, wow, what a week. I am aware that we are approaching the end of a lengthy day in a very long week filled with exceptionally beneficial informational content. Therefore, it is my pleasure and my privilege to uh, announce the Arado team has decided instead of delivering a 20 minute presentation, because we all know you're not gonna pay attention, we kindly uh, ask that you, instead of showcasing Arado's accomplishments over the past year, I encourage you all to, uh, to peruse ONOC's annual report for a comprehensive understanding of our activities and achievements. This allows us to utilize this valuable opportunity in the presence of numerous individuals such as yourselves to impact, oh sorry, impart a more impactful and memorable takeaway message. Slide two, please. 
So while this slide is, um, excuse me, can I have the video playing, please? My apologies, technical difficulties. Anyway, so let me continue. If you've attended the CDM meeting earlier this week, or visited our engaging outreach booth, you would have observed that the Orado team has prioritized the significance of pre-games clean sport education. So in our very short and sweet presentation, such as myself minus the short part, Orado would like to leave you with two key messages. One, clean sport slash anti-doping education can and is a lot of fun. Two, every Arado member country has created an annual education plan with educational activities and events for your athletes to attend before this year's games. We also had a prize competition during the week, which I know you all had a chance to enter and be a part of. We would like to present the winner, but first, I would like to acknowledge all of you who took part and took the time to come to our booth and take the water quiz and learn more about clean sport. We may have only one prize winner, but you are all champions of clean sport. So without further delay, our clean sport champion winner is none other than Mr. Paul Bird. A round of applause, and Paul, can you please come up and collect your prize? Is Paul in the room? Sorry? Sorry, there will be no redraw. Can I have a representative on behalf of Paul? Thank you very much. Can we now go to our final slide? To our NOC leaders, you don't have to create anything. It has all been done for your athletes. All you need to do is make contact with your national anti-doping organizations to discuss the details of the events they have planned before the games for your athletes. Finally, the Orado team would like to thank each and every one of you present in this room, for all your commitments to clean sport, and most importantly, towards ensuring a level playing field for all of our athletes, not only in Oceania, but the world. So I leave you with this quick message. We are one team. Play true, Vinakavakalevu, and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Orado. Are they, is anybody from WADA presenting as well, or Orado's done? Okay. Thank you very much. Also, Jet. Thank you, Dr. Robin Mitchell. Um, before I start, just I was listening to President Bach's opening comments um, this morning, and I was intrigued with all the work that they're doing. And then also, John then followed up with all the stresses of your job. Seems like you're under a lot of stress all the time. So my, I have one more stress ball left that I thought I'd present to you. I think you need it more than I do. Really and looks what so the stress? Stressed. Oh, sorry. <laughs> They're just old. It's only the cold. <laughs> oh, I was going to ask for your jacket when I walked by, but I decided not to. Um, but the other thing with the stress ball is if somebody does fall asleep during your presentation, 
You can throw it at them. It'll wake them up. All right, thank you. Osfomet, um, interesting factor, which a few colleagues explained to me is, it's 20 years. So Dr. Robin Mitchell and Kevin Gosper came to a couple of us 20 years ago to start up Osfo. We're the only body of this nature or umbrella body of all regional sports federations in all the continents. And so we're celebrating 20 years of, uh, of accomplishments and the work that we've done in uniting the regional federations. So I wanna thank the support of ONOC and all the uh, regional sports federations. So we started with 14 originals and uh, we right now have 28 sports that are involved and have been on a regular basis, so thank you. We also have five of our operational working groups that met, which was communications, promotions, working, um, and the well-being, which uh, Edwina heads up. Governance, leadership, high performance working group, and sponsorship and funding. We have a, a strategic plan. We're about halfway through it right now. We're still working on a lot of um, uh, activities and programs. Uh, Sheila, if she's still here, thank you very much. Stepping in as our keynote speaker, it was great. We appreciate it. And it, uh, a lot of uh, information that we needed from a regional sports perspective. Uh, the interesting factor, and I think a couple of people have mentioned it, is that after nine years, Kevin Gosper, who's been our president and leader, um, finished up his term, and we had a new president elected. And I'd like to recognize Yvonne Mullins, if she could stand up. No, please. Thank you. So, Yvonne, um, and also two executive members. We, um, we had uh, basically Helen Smith uh, reelected and Mariko uh, Mitchell John from uh, Oceania Ham Hamble, <coughs> excuse me, uh, was also elected as a new executive member. Uh, Helen McMurray, thank you. Helen McMurray continued to give us an update on the foundation. Andrew Minogue was there giving his spiel on um, the games, which we continue to appreciate, and our partnership with um, the Pacific Games. Edwina, once again with uh, the well-being, delivered a master class, and I think for those who attended, it was well worth it. A lot of great information, and we thank Edwina for that presentation and the master's class for the Step Up program. Thank you. Uh, Jill and Reagan continued their work with OSEP and the uh, ONOC um, um, education program as well. And uh, Andrew came in with the Team Up program and also presented to us, which was fantastic. And Ryan uh, continues to provide that athlete's information that we need uh, with the athlete's representation and our commission in that regard. Uh, we continue to con uh, work with our members and look at surveys on a continued spaces. And Helen Smith, who's in charge of our uh, strategic plan, was also overseeing the working groups. I'd just like to have the rest of the executive members that are still here, could you just please stand up for a minute for acknowledgement so people know who you are? Thank you, Helen. Anybody else? Oh, we're down to two now, I think. Yes, Edwina. Yeah, there we go. Now we're all getting all shy. Thank you. There's a couple of the executive members. Thank you very much. Um, this year we had four recipients of our merit award. Peter Topp, basically for his work the last 20 years in the region with FIFA and also the International Touch uh, Federation. Carol Kowalski from uh, Oceania uh, Squash also received a merit award. David Crocker from FIBA Oceania, who's been in the region, a lot of you know him. He's, he's also placed in the Asia Pacific area now. And uh, we have uh, Natalie, Nadina uh, Blacken, who was also with Oceania uh, Badminton. Nadia, excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Uh, we had 29 members of the Federation, which I just mentioned, and our accounts. Uh, we're down to about $56,000 in our accounts, and uh, we also presented those uh, audited accounts at our meeting. Now, the Executive Committee, um, we conducted 10 video conferences throughout the year on various matters, and, uh, and I won't go through all those right now. Annual, annual report was produced. 
again in conjunction with uh, ONOC, and we once again thanks, thank you for that. We have representatives on the Pacific Games Council and our general uh, administration. We have uh, uh, Jill and Reagan on the, as I said before, with OSEP. Now, one of the things that happened, and this was really exciting the last two or three years, is between OSFO and ONOC, we sat down and had an MOU for sports grants. First time ever that we were able to do that in 2021 and ran through to 2022. These are some of the sports that received the grant. There was over $250,000 of solidarity funds, which we went through a proper system of review. 11 sports received that uh, information and some funding over the last two to three years. These are the sports that actually benefited from fencing to cycling to table tennis to FIBA Oceania to archery, hockey, taekwondo, athlete, uh, athletics, tennis, badminton, and swimming and there's the allocation of funds that went to them. All, all programs have been completed, all audited reports have been completed, all acquittals, and also all reports. And I wanna thank those sports that were involved. I just wanna mention, when you talk about a program like that, is that um, basically we had over 70 coaches and officials that benefited from this, these programs. Uh, we were over 50 programs were conducted in that two and a half to three year period. And on top of that was through 15 countries in the Oceania region. And the main factor and the biggest factor here, we touched and over 750 athletes were involved with the program. It was all about improving their performance going forward. So with that funds and how we allocated them and the sports that benefited, it's, uh, that's how we ended up. I'll just finish on a note, and as you can see, Kevin's already left the building because uh, I'm the last one on the program. And uh, I thought maybe we could actually just acknowledge that uh, Kevin started with us. I went to him nine years ago. I sat down. I had to persuade an 82-year-old man why we wanted him to actually lead our organization. He says, well, why me? I'm 82. And I said, well, just give me a couple years. And he did, he gave us a couple years, but I turned that into nine years. He won't forgive me, it won't forgive me for that, but uh, he's done a great job for OSFO. He's given us a profile. His leadership's been outstanding. I just wanted to recognize him for all the hard work. And it's not just with the OSFO, that's kind of his, he still has the foundation that will continue to work, but all the work he's done in the Oceania region over the last 30, 40 years, every, everybody's been touched by Kevin Gosper. So I just, if you could actually stand up and just let's give him a, a clap <laughs> of acknowledgement. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Chet, and uh, thanks to OSFO for the work that they do uh, for our athletes and their entourage uh, cooperatively with the, the NOCs, the PGCs, and all of us uh, within Oceania. Um, President, we tried to uh, get this uh, to spread throughout the other continents, but the, uh, unfortunately, the, the world, I have said, no, we can't do it just for one continent. We have to do it for all of them. And of course, you've been going 20 years and nothing's changed, but thank you. Thanks, uh, Chet. Thank you, Yvonne. All the best in your new role, and we'll see you in Silver tomorrow. <laughs> well, folks, we're coming to the end of our assembly, but I think Rick has a few housekeeping notes or allocation of jobs tonight, whichever. I did, say, I did say we were going to try to finish before 12. I just didn't know if it was lunchtime or midnight. midnight. So it'll be midnight. Uh, real quick, just reminders after a lengthy week of uh, meetings. Again, we've met with your chef de missions. Uh, some of your secretary generals had attended the workshop. Some of you, uh, the presidents also um, walked in, in in some of our discussion points. As a reminder to all the NLCs, again, ILC uh, Olympic Solidarity covers six athletes, two officials. Uh, funding to, uh, to your team in support of uh, programs up in Devon 
uh, look at your solidarity grants, please. The NOC uh, National Activities Program. For those that may still have some access to old program, look at that. I know Sheila uh, was very surprised, and I actually was surprised to learn that this time around, ONAC had been more aggressive in pursuit of and use of the uh, world programs. So, also on the going back to uh, the pre Olympic uh, training camp at Devon, uh, I'm very happy to uh, say that many, a good majority, I believe 13 members that are actually signed up. And again, I asked everyone, sign up today, then we can worry about it tomorrow, try to help you uh, source out your funding. Um, and when it comes to funding, as uh, President Mitchell alluded to earlier, in recognizing DFAT, this is not the first time DFAT has stepped in uh, for ONOC. They started back in 1999 in preparation for the Sydney Olympic Games. And at that time, Kevin was um, our president, and DFAT started to underwrite some costs, some training programs. And along with that, there were also conditions, conditions that affected two NOC, actually four NOCs back then, and it's just due to a government uh, bureaucracy. But they managed to find an alternative, and Kevin then gave them an option to use ONOC in which they did, and those uh, option provided the support grant to the four NOCs. Now it's only down to the two NOCs, and I've learned that uh, DFAT, again, um, will continue to review their uh, support, uh, but if it's going to address the two NOCs, it's, it's going to have to go again to what they earlier started uh, in support of uh, the two NOCs. But more importantly, to highlight the fact that uh, Ian Chesterman and uh, Matt Carroll, uh, along with Eddie Moore that many of you have met, were very key and instrumental in, in bringing the programs, uh, delivering the programs, and I encourage them to keep asking DFAT for more money, considering that <laughs> Devon Desbane's uh, cost might uh, increase. So again, more importantly, please, uh, to your um, government, ONUC's appreciation and support of the ONUC members that are recipients of those uh, fundings. And again, a special thank you to Eddie Moore because he's more uh, directly engaged with the NOCs to have you secure the funds um, for your team. Um, I covered that one. And as a reminder, and I said this to Sheila, I struggled not to say anything, but I think it's very important because our big boss is here. And I just wanted to point out that with those pending deadlines, I, I want to remind the IOC that ONUC members, especially up in the northern and some of the Melanesian area, were di directly affected by government protocol shutdowns, and many of the borders were just opening up last August, and that many of them are now trying to catch up in terms of the use of funds, or catch up in terms of trying to report on the funds. But the bottom line is that oftentimes uh, things get in the, um, fall into the crack, uh, along with a lot of the programs, and they're still struggling to, to move ahead. Um, I believe, and I can safely say this on behalf of our, our colleagues, is that their primary goal right now is one, to prepare their team uh, to Paris, and at the same time carry on their responsibility and prioritize the reporting requirement as mandated by the IOC. So if there's some deadlines that are being crossed and not being met, I'm asking the IOC now that please take these matters into consideration and with that, President Mitchell, I close. And tonight's, uh, I'm sorry. tonight's dinner has now been moved uh, instead of uh, 6.30, it's 7.30. And then we'll see you here. No rush. And enjoy the evening. President, I turn it over to you for closing. Thank you very much, uh, Rick. Uh, it's been a long day, but there's always a lot to talk about. We have generated a lot of work 
uh, over the past year, not only on the Olympic family side, but in the uh, Paralympic side and with sport generally. Uh, it's been a busy year. We've had uh, very busy games in Solomons and as we mentioned before, uh, tremendous uh, support. The Prime Minister of Solomons uh, in his opening speech graded the, the most uh, useful country, but I won't repeat that uh, because it was essentially <coughs> our biggest neighbor that contributed the most to the, the games and the success of uh, Solomon's. And they continue to do so, as uh, Rick mentioned in his closing remarks. Uh, President, we're very happy that you came back this year, because when you come, we all have a good time and we work hard, and then we shall continue working in a different way this evening, apart from uh, eating and celebrating our uh, getting together. Um, we appreciate the this, this staff in, in what they do for us, and in uh, particular Forrest's Solidarity Department with James and his team uh, working uh, for you and with us. Uh, it's been a long week of work, and I think we've all gained a lot from it, but that also generates more work that we have to put in for our athletes and the entourage that uh, support them. So thank you all and thank ourselves for, for the work that's done. Uh, thanks to our colleagues from Paris who've been updating us. Uh, we'll keep you busy when we get to, uh, to Paris before the games. And if we do win medals, I know Australia and New Zealand probably will do, uh, but we'll try our best to also match it in the uh, Pacific uh, group. Uh, thanks to our executive, OSFO executive, Games Council, all our partners in the federations. It's been a good meeting, a long meeting. Thank you all. Thank, thank you all very much for the, your attendance and the work. And We've got a couple of hours and then we start working again on the dance floor. So thank you. I happily close the meeting. Naka. Trans transport is ready for those that are uh, want to get on the bus now. So, just please uh, please proceed out.